ARC 4 The Everlasting Covenant Chapter 66, A Crimson Snow Cape Seeing Subaru come out of the tomb alone, Garfield's hostility spiked as if stabbing into his skin. The cold was of a different level outside the tomb. Contrary to the somewhat insulated warmth inside, the extreme cold of the sanctuary sucked all the stamina and warmth out of one's body in a matter of seconds. An endless blizzard, and a blinding curtain of white. His exhaled breaths froze as they left his mouth, and the shivers driving into his core were almost unbearable. Hugging his own shoulders, Subaru shuddered in front of Garfield's glare. And, clicking his exposed fangs, Garfield's attention turned to the empty corridor behind Subaru. Garfield, doesn't look like anyone's behind you, oi. Subaru, yeah, she's not coming. Emilia is inside, sleeping right now. Garfield, sleeping? Huh? Subaru, she's exhausted. For two days straight, she's just been waking up to the trials, over and over. It's worn her down, both body and soul, and she hasn't been eating. It's just like her. To force herself like this. Again and again, forcing herself to challenge the trials only to fail regardless, Subaru could imagine Emilia's frustration and disappointment. Surely, it would be the same the sense of powerlessness that Subaru himself had felt on so many occasions. Subaru, dash dash. Deep inside the tomb, in her reprieve from the trials, Emilia was blissfully sleeping. The memory of Emilia's body heat and of the warmth of their long embrace as she whispered her blind love into his ear at once sent Subaru's blood boiling with love and longing and left him stricken with such regret that he wanted to die. He remembered Emilia's flushed cheeks, her voice trembling with passion as she said all the words he had wanted to hear, and the entirety of her emotion tempting him to drown inside it. Had a part of him considered just letting himself drown and sink into that tender depravity alongside Emilia? No one could possibly know. After rejecting Emilia's temptations that would have brought even gods to their knees, Subaru walked out of the tomb. Leaving Emilia as she slept, he had no intention of telling her about what was happening outside. And he was not about to bring her within reach of Garfield's malice. But, in contrast to Subaru's quiet determination, Garfield's rage showed no signs of dissipating. He kicked at the snow under his foot, and clicked his bleach white fangs. Garfield, you didn't drag out half which. The snow doesn't look like it's stopping. You didn't bring any souvenirs and came back with nothing but your stinking mug. Fup you think you're doing, ah? Subaru, Emilia, she. Told me she loves me. Garfield. Huh? Subaru's offbeat remark might have been too out of place here. For a moment, Garfield looked as if he couldn't understand what he had just heard. But his face quickly darkened as he decided that he was being played with. Garfield. Looks like the half which ain't only one who ain't seein' the situation here, huh? Take a look where we are, and you're still bullshitting with me, oi? Oi oi. Ah? The heat of Garfield's seething rage began evaporating the melted snow on his skin. And the sight of Garfield's body swelling was no optical illusion, but the start of his transformation from human to giant tiger. Subaru did not waver as he watched. With the same expression as when he uttered his previous words, Subaru went on staring at him with the same dry gaze. And repeated in front of the enraged Garfield. Subaru, Emilia, said that she loves me, and that all she needs is me. Garfield, you're fucking. Subaru, with her adorable face, her clinging voice, her tingling movements, at a distance so close that I could melt, almost touching, within range of each other's breathing. That was what she told me. Garfield, so fucking what? It was already obvious when you got here that half which is fucking glued to you. If you wanted congratulations for your two getting together, ripping your two to shreds would fucking do it. Bestial growls began mixing with his curses as Garfield's transformation accelerated with his wrath. Ready to pounce at any moment, Garfield jabbed his words into Subaru. And that was the last straw. Subaru how could it be? Garfield, ha? Huh? Didn't hear that, your mind repeating. Subaru, how could Emilia possibly tell me that she loves me? Garfield, dash hk. Subaru turned up his face and screamed. 
Even Garfield fell mute in front of this flood of emotions. Glaring at the flinching Garfield, bearing an expression of agony, Subaru allowed his heart to erupt. The words they shared in the tomb, the heat of their touch, and the certainty of their love, he threw them all away. Was it painful? Of course it was painful. But, within those inseverable memories, there existed not the slightest radiance of genuine meaning. How nice it would be, if Subaru could be foolish enough to be deceived by that counterfeit radiance. But it was Natsuki Subaru's misfortune to be incapable of being that foolish. Subaru, how could she say it? How could Amelia tell me that she loves me? Cling to me, offer up everything to me, and tell me she needs nothing but me. That could never happen. Garfield, the fuck you going on about, oi? Subaru, she would never lean on me this way, and tell me that her feelings for me are her everything. Never. If Puck was here, there's no way she could be so utterly engrossed with me. He couldn't say how desperately he wished he could be placed first in Amelia's heart. But Subaru wasn't so conceited as to believe that he was nearly enough to be worthy of that place in her heart, nor did he think so little of her. The one Amelia relied on the most, the one she would cling to till the very, very end, would always be Puck. Now that Puck would not appear before her, she was merely turning to Subaru as the secondary harbour of her reliance, nothing more. Her confessions of love, the warmth of her fingertips, and her trembling breaths, Subaru didn't want to believe that they had all been lies, he didn't want to, but he knew that, that they weren't real. Lifting his head, Subaru glared into Garfield. Garfield's anger seemed to have cooled, but this time, it was Subaru who bared his teeth. Subaru, who was it that drove her into a corner until she had no choice but to depend on a worthless guy like me? who made her think that she had to keep going. No matter how many times her heart had been broken, over and over. Who? Garfield, that's all necessary, ain't it? That's a choice you fucking made yourself. Fucker you try and pin this on me. And the others in the sanctuary, ha? Huh? Garfield shot back at Subaru's charges. But, listening to Garfield's barked retort, Subaru only shook his head. Who was it that drove Amelia into a corner? He already knew the answer without having to ask. Subaru, there's no question whose fault it is. It's my fault. Garfield, ha? Huh? Subaru, it's my fault. It's my fault that Amelia was driven into a corner. It's my fault. It's your fault. It's all of your faults. Garfield, cut it with that bullshit. If she can't stand Thwaite and Caves, ain't that just her caliber? If her heart's that weak and she goes set in a goal that high, ain't that just her making a fucking fool of herself? Subaru, yeah. You're right. Amelia's too gentle, so she only ever takes the pressure head on. So she never unloads her burdens on anyone else, until she crumbles. Even though that was what I was supposed to do. Receiving Garfield's rage, Subaru felt his heart growing cold just like the white snowscape around him. Even though that's what I have to do, he felt like clarifying. Subaru, yeah. That's what I have to do. That's why I'm here. And even though I'm the one saying this, what was I doing? Garfield, fuck are you agreeing with yourself, oi, no, never mind. Just, never mind. There's no end bullshit in with ya. Mordoba's thirst ain't never get quenched. If you can't do it, then. Subaru. You'll go in the tomb and bring Amelia out yourself? You think you can actually do it? Garfield, hell's that supposed to mean? Garfield muttered this quiet threat. Though it was meant to intimidate Subaru, it only served to confirm Subaru's baseless conjecture. Subaru, Garfield, I already know you're an apostle of greed. I know that's the only way you can be granted command authority over the Lewises. Garfield, dash dash. Subaru, so it's inevitable, that being an apostle of greed, you must have been inside the tomb, or, more accurately, that you've taken the trials. Garfield, you. Subaru, you've challenged the trials, haven't you? Though I don't know why you're so insistent on keeping it a secret. Is it because the sanctuary's residents are forbidden to enter the tomb? If not, then is it for Lewis, who entered the tomb to save you? Garfield, 
dash gh. Garfield's complexion turned, after all, family was Garfield's sore spot. Watching his expression shift to a color of agony, Subaru continued weaving his conjectures as he spoke. Subaru, Frederica told me about how you went inside the tomb. And I heard that Lewis went in as well. Garfield, that. Fucking snitch. Just leave an ain't enough for her, she had to pander to fuckers outside, tch. Subaru, what, would it be so bad if a certain someone caught wind of this? Come to think of it, who was it that made this contract with the residents, anyway? Was it the witch Akidona who, created this sanctuary? If so, then have the residents of the sanctuary been upholding a contract with the dead all this time? Garfield, don't you fucking. Go any further, Garfield kicked into the ground, becoming one with the wind as he flew towards Subaru. Aiming his claws that could shred through steel directly at Subaru's face. Subaru, the one making the snow fall is Roswell. Garfield, dash dash. Hearing Subaru strike the core of the matter, Garfield's claw stopped just inches from his face, watching a look of stupefaction rising onto Garfield's expression, Subaru nodded. Subaru, it's not Emilia. Without Puck here, Emilia couldn't do this by herself. Even if, on the million to one chance, that Emilia was the one who caused this, there's no way that girl could hide it from me so flawlessly. Garfield, that's just your wishful thinking. Subaru, you're right, but I can only believe. That girl, even if she's completely abandoned herself, she's not the kind of girl who'd throw a tantrum and hurt everyone around her. I just believe that. It may be a suspect he had arrived at through the process of elimination. But it was certainly not a baseless accusation. Subaru, the one binding you all to the sanctuary. Is Roswell, isn't it? Garfield, you heard that from Frederica too? Subaru, of course not. It was just me sorting out all the information and evidence, and having enough prejudice and bad impressions about that guy to not balk at making false accusations, but looks like I was right. Garfield, dash dash. As Garfield fell silent, Subaru exhaled a white sigh. It was just the exhaustion of finding out that the person he suspected of being the mastermind was really the mastermind. But, even if he knew that Roswell was the one conspiring behind the scenes, he still didn't know why he would oversee a contract that was trapping the sanctuary's residents here, and why he would be tormenting them with this snow. No matter how much Subaru thought, he couldn't find a plausible answer. In that case, Subaru, guess we'll just take a few shots at that smug face of his. Listening to Subaru mutter this full with resolve, Garfield dropped his arms. And Subaru could tell that Garfield's face was painted with the same emotions as his own. Roswell, we tilde LL now, you two see tilde utni look a tildengri. Laying on the bed in his allotted residence, Roswell greeted Subaru and Garfield with these words, cheerfully smiling in his usual clown makeup. Subaru, yeah. I'm super pissed right now. And this one over here wants to jump on you this minute, you know? So you might wanna be careful what you say. Standing there blocking the doorway, Subaru spread out his arms and nudged his chin at the person beside him. On the other end of his gesture was Garfield, who was quietly growling. The sound of his bestial breathing was proof that he was using the last of his rationality to maintain his human form. Although they were indoors, the coldness had penetrated the masonry of the walls and passed inside. Both Subaru and Roswell were breathing white, while only Garfield's were bordering on red from the sheer heat of his breaths. Roswell, this is an I tilled interesting pairing, no? I was sure I remember Garfield saying something about re tilding Subaru in two when he comes back. Garfield, things have changed a bit. I'll have to put off to Sidon who'd crush into pace till I figure out what's true or not. Subaru, don't say such scary things so naturally. Roswell too, you shouldn't accept that kind of scary statement like it's normal, you know. Subaru's exchange with Garfield as he left the sanctuary for the mansion had left him with a deep sense of self-loathing. Unable to forget that humiliation, Garfield's resentment towards Roswell and Emilia wasn't too difficult to understand. Seeing Subaru furrow his brows, Roswell shook his head with, no no tilde oh, as he turned his single yellow eye between Subaru and Garfield. 
Roswell, I was simply telling it as it I tilde s, Subaru kun. Subaru, sounds like I'm pretty despised. I'm hurt, Ros chi. Weren't you gonna do anything even if Garfield ate me up? Roswell, aya aya, now isn't that too hard on yourself? If Subaru kun went head to head with Garfield, I'm not so sure that Garfield would come out onto tilde p? Subaru, you think I have a chance? If you heard my combat record you'd be shaking in your boots, you know. Ever since being summoned to this parallel world, Subaru had just been constantly taking damage, with barely a single combat victory to his name. He did manage to beat up the weird trio in the alley, kill a few woolgarms, and finish off the dying petalgeurs, but that was about it. Subaru, actually, that's a lot better than I thought. But if I'm pitted against a pissed-off Garfield, I won't last two seconds before I get turned into meat cubes. I can at least see that much. Roswell, I wonder. Perhaps, under the right conditions, you could put up a good fight tilde GHT, I think. Narrowing his eye, Roswell looked Subaru up and down as he spoke. Unfortunately, no matter how Subaru tried to reflect on those words, he just couldn't seem to agree. Subaru shrugged and decided to set Roswell's statements aside for now, while almost simultaneously beside him, Garfield stomped down his foot, shattering the floorboard beneath it. Garfield, no near that crap matters right now. Ain't there something more important here, huh? Are your two assholes asleep? Leaving a deep footprint in the center of the floor, Garfield bared his fangs and shouted at Subaru and Roswell. He didn't seem too fond of their little sparring match before moving into the main topic. Then again, it didn't suit Subaru too well either. Following Garfield's prompt, Subaru gave a single nod, and... Subaru, you're the one making it snow outside, aren't you, Roswell? He cut straight to the chase. Roswell, dash dash. Hearing Subaru's question, Roswell closed his mouth. Subaru followed suit and quietly waited for Roswell's answer. Silence descended on the room, as the only sounds audible were the howls of the freezing wind outside the window, the rhythmic ticking of the clock hand, and the clicks of Garfield's gritting teeth. Roswell, Subaru Kun. Subaru, yeah? Roswell, did you hear that from me? Subaru, dash dash. What kind of question was that? Subaru had run multiple simulations in his head about what Roswell's response might be. Perhaps a bold-faced laugh like, Aha, you got me, or a pathetic, W what a ludicrous. Proof, where's your proof? Most likely, it would have been an evasive, I'm afraid I have no idea what you're tar tildulking about, or something along those lines. But Roswell's reply was completely different from anything Subaru had imagined. Subaru, what? We just got here, how are you supposed to have told us? You sure you're not confused? Roswell, hum, hum is that so? Is that so? I tilde s that so, unfortunate. Despite chewing over the meaning of his words, Subaru only looked at Roswell with an expression of non-understanding. After leaving him those words, Roswell cast down his gaze, and let out a feeble sigh. The side of his pallid face seemed even more devoid of strength than usual. And Subaru could see that it was not a result of his injuries, but a reflection of the state of his heart. Roswell, I tilde end that case. I misspoke, I misspoke. I said something strange just now. Lifting his face again, Roswell revealed a faint smile as if taking back what he had just said. Somehow, Subaru just felt like there was something off about that red-painted smile, but, paying no heed to Roswell's subtle change, Garfield stepped forward. Garfield, ya ain't denying it, oi? Roswell, don't you think that if I throw up a bunch of excuses when I'm already under suspicion, it'll just sound like I'm lying? But on the other hand, my Utilda Sual behavior hasn't earned me any trust from you two a tilde the. Garfield, so you're fucking noticed? Then you can probably guess what I'm about to next, yeah? Exhaling a sharp breath, Garfield instantly erased their distance from several steps to zero. Approaching the foot of the bed, Garfield reached out his hand to grasp Roswell by the throat. The split-second movement happened so fast that Subaru didn't even have the time to call out to stop him. But... 
Garfield, you. Question mark I will not permit such insolence in front of Roswell Summer, Garf. Flying out of the adjacent room, Ram caught Garfield by his torso and the wrist of his reaching hand. With his right arm restrained to his chest, Garfield leered at Ram with a growl. Subaru was surprised that he hadn't noticed Ram's presence in the house until now, but, with a sigh of relief, he was at least grateful that she had managed to avert needless bloodshed. Then. Roswell, Ram. You really are an excellent servant. Ram, yes, Roswell Summer. Subaru couldn't find anything strange about their exchange. Ram had placed herself in harm's way to protect her master, and Roswell praised her. There should be nothing wrong about this. Ram was simply carrying out her duty. So where was the problem? Subaru looked up, furrowing his brows, wondering. Standing near the door, Subaru could see Garfield's back in front of his eyes, and Ram's delicate figure opposite him. Beyond them, was the bed which Roswell had taken for his recuperation, but... Since when was Roswell standing? Subaru, dash dash. It must have happened in an instant. In the time it took Subaru to blink, Roswell had stood up from his bed, and walked up to the standoff between Ram and Garfield, and... Subaru, dash dash. What the hell is that? Protruding out of Garfield's back was what looked like a human arm. Penetrating from the front of his chest to the center of his back, it had five writhing fingers, and Subaru was certain that it was someone's right arm. Garfield, HHG, VH, H. Before his eyes, Garfield's body violently convulsed. Little by little, crimson blood stained into the back of his jacket as his legs dangled from his torso. With nothing to support his body, Garfield dropped to his knees as the arm disappeared into his back. And, having lost its plug, mass volumes of blood instantly spouted from the hole. Garfield, H.H. Garfield collapsed to the floor. Looking down at him, were Ram and Roswell. And sticking out of Ram's chest, was... Ram, Ros. Roswell, you truly were an excellent servant. Ram tried to call his name in a feeble voice, but Roswell gently interrupted her. He tenderly stroked his left hand on Ram's peach-colored hair, while Ram seemed to accept it with a soft blush on her intoxicated expression. From the corner of her smile, a belated trail of fresh blood leaked out. But of course, since her chest had been pierced through from behind, the arm was drawn out, and Ram's delicate body, unable to withstand even the slightest force, fell forwards onto the floor. But what caught her was the profusely bleeding Garfield. He took the collapsing Ram into his arms, and lifted her upright. Garfield, G.H., Ros, C.H. R, Am, Ram, 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 Ram. The instant of hatred dominating his heart was drowned to nothing by the sight of the one he loved. Again and again, Garfield screamed the name of the girl in his arms, roaring blood as he emitted pale blue light from his hands. Subaru knew that vivid glow was from the channeling of healing magic. While it wasn't Garfield's specialization, he was still capable of casting it. Right now, despite the fatal wound through his chest, Garfield was pouring his everything into healing ram in his arms. As he did so, with each beating of his heart, his body pulsed and transformed. Fur covered over his exposed skin, his fangs began to grow, and his pupils instantly narrowed into slits. His muscles swelled by magnitudes, as his clothes burst apart from the overwhelming mass of his body. He was transforming into that mindless tiger, and his bestial instinct to protect his body was furiously clashing with the rational human desire to save the life of the one he loved. But. Garfield, dash dash. Roswell, it would be troublesome if you were allowed to morph. Slightly tilting his head, with these words Roswell kicked his leg towards Garfield. His long, sweeping leg became wind, and smashed directly into Garfield's skull, with the sound of an eggshell cracking, like some slapstick prop, Garfield's head exploded into a spray of red. Garfield's body lost everything from the neck up. Blood spouted like a fountain from the severed stump of his neck, filling the room with its bloody stench as his corpse fell on top of Ram. Underneath, the faint smile on Ram's expression remained unchanged, 
Garfield's healing magic had no effect. Ram's pulse had already ceased the moment Roswell pulled his arm from the cavity of her destroyed heart. Garfield had simply failed to notice it as he wrenched out his life force to save her. Roswell, E. Tilda Venn, I have trouble casting magic while sustaining a weather interference spell of this magnitude. For a court wizard, it really is an unsightly display. Roughly scraping his blood-drenched leg on the nearby bed sheet, having murdered Ram and Garfield with his bare hands, Roswell turned to the immobilized Subaru. And, with a tone and bearing completely unchanged from usual, he spoke. Roswell, now, shall we begin our talk? Natsuki Subaru-kun. ARC 4. The Everlasting Covenant. Chapter 67, Warlock. Incomprehensible was the only feedback Subaru's mind could muster as he watched the scene unravel before his eyes. Ram lay in a pool of blood, and, on top of her, was Garfield's decapitated body. Standing beside their overlapping corpses, the one who had accomplished this with his bare hands, Roswell, was wiping blood off of the hems of his garment. Having witnessed this horrifying feat, for a moment, Subaru couldn't believe that it was Roswell who did this. Roswell L. Mathers was the representative court wizard of the Kingdom of Lugnica, one who could control extreme tier magic at will, and possessed combat power akin to a siege engine, or so Subaru was told. It was what he had heard. And precisely because he heard this, Subaru never imagined that Roswell could deal such destructive power without the use of his magic. Roswell, mages are weak in close quarters combat is such a pre tilda judist notion. Anyone who's ever taken up arms against me had that naturally stuck in their heads, as to what happened to those thick-headed fools, it's as you can clearly say tilda e. Subaru unwittingly swallowed his breath at Roswell's perfect reading of his unvoiced thoughts. While Roswell traced his finger over the specks of blood that had spattered onto his face, painting over his blue eyeliner with a shade of rouge as he smiled, demonic, in the truest sense of the word. Subaru, W.H., Y. Roswell, and Tildum? Subaru, why did you kill them? Kill Ram? Garfield was. Killing Garfield was. Necessary. But. Roswell, if we were to talk alone, Garfield would have go tilde T10 in the way. As for Ram, I admit that what I've done was inexcusable. But I am not so strong as to be able to fight Garfield he tilde add on. I was only able to kill him by catching him off guard just now. Even though catching him off guard meant piercing Ram along with Garfield. Somehow, as he listened to Roswell's casual explanation of why he killed them, Subaru's emotions shed away their rage, and his mind returned to its usual calm. It was a ludicrous answer to a ludicrous situation. And if Subaru allowed himself to be played in the palm of his hands, giving in to his passion would only be giving Roswell what he wanted. Subaru. Roswell, hum tilde, that's unexpected. And here I thought you'd be angry at what I said? Subaru, well, the anger's done a whole loop around and went back to where it started, not saying I'm not angry, though. Naturally I am. Naturally. Roswell, I tilde s that right. While that is an admirable attitude, the young Natsuki Subaru I know would be howling, mad with rage right now, if it were natural. Do tilde and you think, Natsuki Subaru-kun? Roswell's single yellow pupil locked onto Subaru's eyes. One would often find Roswell closing one eye and peering his gleaming yellow pupil into his targets, just like now and the mere thought of finding himself reflected in that blazing, yellow eye unsettled him to no end. Subaru, I realize how stupid I was before, but that doesn't mean I'll never grow up. This isn't a situation that could be fixed by throwing a tantrum, I know that much at least. Roswell, no tilde no, that's not what I'm tilde ant, Subaru-kun. Subaru-kun. Natsuki Subaru-ku tilde n. Roswell stroked his unbloodied left hand through his navy blue hair as he prodded Subaru with that infuriating address. But even as the repugnant intonation drove an indescribable sensation into his chest, Subaru did not back down. Instead, he took a step forward, glaring into the clown's face. Subaru, what are you trying to say? Roswell, what am I trying to say? If that's what you're asking, then this is how I'll answer, 
Congratulations, and welcome. I've been waiting for you to finally stand here before me. Subaru felt a chill like damp fingertips creeping down his spine. In front of him, true to his word, Roswell watched him with a look of sheer delight. That attitude, that delight, all gave Subaru an incomprehensible sense of disgust. Roswell didn't appear sarcastic at all, but seemed genuinely overjoyed for Subaru. The only problem was the inexplicable nature of his elation and of his words. Subaru, you've been waiting. For me to stand here? Roswell, not in this particular spot in this particular room. Thar Tilda T would be too literal of an interpreter Tilda T on. I'm sure you can understand how that is not what I meant. After all, you are the only one who should be capable of understood tildending. Subaru, I'm the only one. Who could understand? Little by little, it was as though the pieces were falling into place. Slowly but surely, though hesitating as he linked them, the final picture began to take shape. The moment he grasped its meaning, no way, the thought pierced through his mind. Roswell, do Tilda you understood Tilda N.D., Subaru Kun? Why is it that, when you've just witnessed two deaths before your eyes, you could remain so calm and keep yourself from falling into uncontrollable rage? In fact, I'm sure you know Tilda W.Y. Subaru, dash dash. Roswell, their deaths didn't hit you with any great impact. You were shocked to see them die. There might have even been some indigna Tilda T on. But, you felt no grief. And that is why you could not turn your anger against me, or STRI Tilda K me with your fists. Listening to Roswell reading him like a book, Subaru opened his mouth to object, but closed it again, unable to say a thing. What would you know? You think I don't care about their deaths? How could you murder Ram and Garfield, you monster? Countless rebukes came to mind. In truth, the impulse to let his emotions explode had surged up many times inside him, each threatening to fly out of his throat, only to dissipate and fade to nothing. He was enraged. He was shocked. He was in grief, or at least, he should be. But even so, Subaru had no words to refute Roswell, because... Roswell, because it can all be recovered. Isn't that what's going through your me till the end? Subaru, what d, you? An involuntary shiver froze up his throat, gripping his heart. Without resorting to metaphors, he really felt the illusion of something clutching at his heart, so great was the shock. Lifting his head, Subaru instinctively looked around the room, dreading that the black hand might appear to punish his trespass. This would be his first punishment since rejecting the Witch of Envy. What horror would that shadow bring at its return? Just the thought of it strangled his heart with such twisting pain that it felt like it might break. But... Subaru, it, didn't come. Roswell, I wouldn't know what you're so wary of, but... A.A. Tilda R., I'm sure it must have something to do with your co-Tilden tract. I Tilda C., that would explain the peculiarities of your words and actions up to now. I think I understand. Subaru, understand. No, before that. Watching Roswell hold his chin as he nodded, Subaru's face turned pale as his lips trembled. Roswell's statement just now had no doubt struck upon Subaru's core, and the fact that it struck meant that. Subaru, you. No. Know about me? Roswell, as far as it does not deviate from what is written, yes. You possess the power to start over. I tilde essent that right? Without a shadow of a doubt, Roswell confessed his knowledge of return by death. Subaru swallowed his breath and immediately noticed the danger of the situation. The conditions were now exactly the same as at Akidona's tea party. If he allowed Roswell to continue talking about return by death like this, the disaster where the sanctuary was engulfed by shadows would only be repeated. In fact, he wouldn't be surprised if the witch snatched him this very instant. Drawing the breath into his stomach and releasing it in a deep exhale, Subaru confirmed that time hadn't stopped. That is to say, the witch hadn't grasped his heart as punishment. This ruled out the possibility which, as unbearable as it may be, would also have been the safest. While the other possibility... Roswell, dash, silence is as good as proven admission, 
I wonder whoever Sai Tilda D that. Plunging his thoughts into risk aversion, Subaru forced his mind to turn at an incredible speed, but Roswell, apparently growing tired of waiting, interrupted with those words. This confession just now must have held some rather large significance to Roswell as well. Seeing Subaru ignore him without saying a word, Roswell furrowed his brows in a rare sign of displeasure. Roswell, we tilde LL, the fact that you're not de tilde kneeing it as some absurd assertion does say a lot about your ho tilde nesty. Subaru, I. Roswell, u tilde ho, that's fine. It is one thing for me say it, but there could be some unpleasant consequences if you were to confirm it. That was why you were never able to say it out loud, I tilde essent it. Although. Stopping Subaru at the first syllable, Roswell continued until his voice abruptly trailed off. Seeing Subaru biting his lip, Roswell cast him a glance with a revolting smile. Roswell, perhaps, you were also afraid of what they'd think of you if you to tilde ld them? Subaru, dash gh. Roswell, it is only na tilde churl. A tilde after all, the power to rewind the world is an outrageous and te tilde refying thing. Time interference is the absolute pinnacle of the pinnacle of dark magic. Even Beatrice, exhausting all her strength, could only bring it to a stall. But to reverse it would surely be a dream upon a Dre Tilda Am. Unable to refute a thing as he listened to Roswell read into his genuine repressed fears, Subaru's face stiffened as he suddenly heard Beatrice's name. With Elsa's blade plunged into her back, the final expression on her face as she vanished from existence was still vivid in his mind. Roswell, judging from your reaction, it would say Tilda M that Beatrice had fulfilled her role Tilda La. Subaru, her role. What would you? But, yes. As the conversation moved away from return by death, Subaru took the opportunity to rein in his unsettled thoughts and redirected his attention to take a bite out of Roswell's unruffled face. Did this man even know about Beatrice's lonely cries? Subaru, you knew how she's been suffering. Didn't you? Bound to that mansion, clinging to a promise made in some ancient contract. Letting herself be worn to the core, huddling in a corner, you knew all of this, didn't you? Roswell, oh Tilda F. Course I knew. Beatrice and I have no Tilda W. N. each other for a very long time. Since I was born, in fact. There is a loneliness in her heart, I've al Tilda ways known this. Subaru, then. Roswell, why didn't I do anything about it? I Tilda would rather you did not say that. There is no one who can relieve her of her sadness other than herself, I'm sure you understood Tilda N. D. this? Just as Subaru was on the verge of screaming, he was struck down by Roswell's irrefutable reasoning. Subaru could have screamed out his accusations at Roswell just so he could hear a fragment of Beatrice's sorrow. Although he could have, the fact was that it would have been meaningless. Beatrice was already dead, and no one could heal her of the sadness of her heart. Only Subaru, who possessed the means to rewind the world, could be there in her final moments as many times as it would take. But how was he supposed to heal four hundred years of sorrow? Four hundred years, not even Subaru could reach back that far. Watching Subaru fall silent, Roswell slightly shook his head. Then, he said. Roswell, how I e tilde navy her. Subaru, envy, her? Subaru repeated, pressing his voice low. But, paying it no mind, yes, Roswell went on, nodding. Roswell, how enviable it is. Beatrice fulfilled her long-cherished wish, and disappeared. The fact that you are here means exotildically that, no? Subaru, cherished. Wish? She. Died. Like that. And you're telling me that's her long-cherished wish? Are you seriously saying that? Roswell, it was nothing more than what Beatrice Daisy Tilda read, no? What right would we have to criticize what someone else holds dear? Neither you, no Tilda or I, have the right to sully Beatrice's death. Sensible words, and impeccable logic, it was true, that they had no right. Subaru and Beatrice may as well have been strangers. He had never understood her wish, and he never even once considered fulfilling it. But, even so, was that really what Beatrice wanted? 
If it was, then why did she protect Subaru at the very end? Roswell, Beatrice's long-cherished wish had been fulfilled. For that, I truly envy her. Since it seems that I would no longer be a Tilda Blay to fulfill mine. Subaru, dash dash. There was something strange about the way he phrased it. Subaru couldn't tell where, or why. But it was certainly there. Subaru, and what is? Your wish? Roswell, I cannot say. My contract forbids me from revealing it, and that is as new tilde ch as I can say. What I have told you is already pushing the limit of what I can compromise with the contract. Boo tilde t, I can tell you this. Subaru, dash dash. Roswell, to see that my wish is fulfilled, I have always, 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 always devoted my utmost. Not a single action I have taken was without purpose, and not a C tildingle one do I regret. Roswell shamelessly declared without the slightest hint of remorse. Stunned by his audacity, a black rage began boiling in Subaru's chest. It was a begrudging rage that was the accumulation of all the severed emotions that had built up inside him. But, although it was there, he did not lose himself in it. Subaru, necessary? Killing Ram and Garfield, burying the sanctuary and snow, everything. You're saying that it was necessary? Roswell, hum, as for the former. No, that would put a damper on this converser Tilda Tion. But as for the latter, yes, would be my A Tilden sir. Subaru, for what? Baring his teeth, Subaru swung his arms, shouting. Subaru, why the hell are you doing this? Making snow fall on the sanctuary, tormenting the residents like it's some sick joke. What are you trying to accomplish? What's the point in doing that? Why don't you come out and say it? Roswell. Roswell, that too, was necessary. To isolate Amelia Summer. Subaru, WH, at? Roswell, I will say it again. Snow falls and the residents suffer. Amelia Summer is isolated, and descends into an unsettled state of mind. Isn't that what happened? Roswell spoke as if he had seen it himself. Indeed, Amelia's condition inside the tomb was exactly as Roswell envisioned. But Subaru had no intention of admitting this. More importantly, Roswell's statement just now was by far the most senseless thing Subaru had heard to date. Roswell, the sanctuary is a land closely tied with the witch, and Amelia Summer is taking the trials to liberate it. A tilde t such a time, if a natural disaster were to befall the sanctuary. Just what would people think of Amelia Summer? Subaru, what? Roswell, here is where the impulsive Garfield comes into play. He, if anyone, would be the first to doubt Amelia Summer, and to loudly proclaim it. With the volume of his voice, anyone would begin to think the same. That Amelia Summer was the cause of this disaster. Roswell's analysis was spot on, and Garfield had just been dancing in the palms of his hands. From the moment Subaru returned to the sanctuary, it was already clear that Garfield was convinced that Amelia had caused the blizzard. Even though there was someone else who could have done it, this land, and this world, chose to direct all of its hostility towards Amelia. All thanks to the demon named Prejudice that had tormented Amelia from the start. Roswell, and what happens once Amelia Summer is isolated? Despite appearances, Amelia Summer is actually a terribly weak person. It'd be no wonder if she wished to entrust everything to a person who would be willing to give her approval. And if that person could support her with their entire heart and soul, then I would be satisfied. Subaru, wait, 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 why, T. Subaru held out his arms, calling for Roswell to stop. He got a feeling that he had heard something outrageous just now. Like he had just been told some absurd, impossible fact. Like something he mustn't hear was. Roswell, you cannot turn yourself away if Amelia Summer relies on you. Of course not, since you love her. If your beloved Amelia Summer were to entrust everything to you, there is no way you could push her aside. Subaru, that. Would never happen. At least it shouldn't. But the fact was that, in this very loop, Subaru had managed to keep himself from drowning within Amelia's clinging embrace. He had withstood it, 
and left her to come here. It wasn't that he rejected the temptation of Emilia's loving whispers. But it was because he knew that she didn't truly mean it, and that her fallen engrossment was only. Roswell, that wasn't the case this time. Is that how you wanted to answer? I can only say that is unfortunate. I suppose you just have a few too many superfluous things about you right now. Roswell took a single, silent step towards the confounded Subaru. Hearing the sound of a splash from his foot stepping into the pool of blood, Subaru's body inadvertently froze. A groan escaped his throat. Subaru, are you, going to kill me? Roswell, kill you, now Tha Tilda T would be a rather vitilda lent idea. I would be quite troubled if you died. Since, one way or another, I will need you to rewind the woe tilde RLD. Subaru, HH. For a moment, Roswell's words as he approached stunned Subaru into silence. But he immediately noticed the discrepancy in his understanding. Roswell knew that Subaru could rewind time, but he didn't know that it was through return by death with death acting as the trigger. Thus, his intention was to corner Subaru so that he would willingly choose to rewind. Although, that would likely involve far more agony than if he was instantly killed. If Roswell had no intention of killing Subaru, then there was still a chance. Subaru, everyone. Inside now. Raising his hand, Subaru shouted his command. The instant Roswell furrowed his brows, the room's doors and windows, as well as those of the adjacent living room, simultaneously shattered. And flying in alongside the frigid wind, were small, scrawny shadows, numbering twenty in all, each of them a little girl with light pink hair. Seeing the assembly of identical girls lined up in a row, Roswell turned his single eye towards Subaru. Roswell, and here I thought the command authority was transferred back to Garfield? Subaru, we were venturing into the maybe mastermind's den, after all. Of course we had to stack our hands first. The exchange took place after his argument with Garfield outside the tomb. After persuading Garfield to go on ahead, Subaru went to the crystal room and transferred the command authority back to himself. Then, he ordered the Lewis replicants to surround the building where Roswell was recuperating and to prepare to break inside in case of emergency. Rem, who had temporarily been Garfield's hostage, was entrusted to the current representative Lewis personality, who brought her to the cathedral, where the rest of the residents and Alam villagers had taken refuge. He had taken all these measures on the assumption that Roswell was the culprit. Although, naturally, Subaru never anticipated that Roswell would kill Garfield and Ram. Roswell, so, what do you wish to do, now that you hard tilde vay me surrounded? Subaru, the fact that you're that strong with your bare hands was a surprise, but you're outnumbered. If a single beastified Garfield could give you trouble, you'll probably have a hard time when you're swarmed. The reason Roswell skewered Ram along with Garfield was because he wasn't confident facing Garfield in direct combat. And although there was no question that Roswell was infinitely stronger than Subaru. Subaru, twenty of them should be about enough to overwhelm you. We'll beat you up, pin you down, and make sure you spit out everything that you're still hiding. Roswell, you should know how important it is to uphold the terms of one's contract, being bound by C. Tilda Miller ones yourself. Subaru, too bad, mine was kinda one-sided forced on me without me having any say in the matter and just punishes me whenever I violate it. This time it hasn't come though, so I'm still in the safe line. With over twenty people crammed inside, the small house was packed to the brim. Obeying Subaru's signal, the emotionless Lewis replicants surged towards Roswell as a sea of faces. Meeting their charge with his bare hands, Roswell could only handle two at a time. His manipulation of the weather outside had become his own downfall. Deprived of the use of his magic, Roswell would only be swarmed by sheer numbers. Subaru figured that while it would be close, victory was assured. However, Roswell, I may be outnumbered. Subaru, dash dash. Roswell, but when your opponent is a mage, trying to overpower him with sheer numbers is just an overly faux tilde oulish decision. At the fall of his voice, an infernal flame swept through the room, and every Lewis Meyer replicant caught in its path was scorched to their core. In the matter of an instant, their small, 
charging bodies were incinerated from head to toe by the wall of flames, reduced to ash and to the mana from whence they came. All this, in Subaru's eyes, was nothing more than a momentary wave of heat and light that had flashed across the room. Subaru, how are you? Still using magic? Roswell, I wouldn't have been able to if I was still controlling the weather. Unfo tilde originately, I have already lost any reason to sustain this snowfall. So it's been a while since I've stopped. Sorry, I suppose I should have told you EA tilde Ria. Subaru, WH, GH, car. In Subaru's moment of confusion, Roswell flashed forward and took him by the throat. He didn't know where those slender wrists had gotten that kind of strength, but he felt his legs leaving the ground as Roswell lifted him writhing into the air. Subaru, KGH. Crashing backwards through a half-shattered window pane and out of the building, Subaru landed in the snow, rolling until he was stopped by a wall. Spitting out the mixture of mud and snow in his mouth, he lifted up his face. The remaining Lewis replicants quietly followed Roswell out of the building. Since they were given no further orders, they appeared at a loss as to what to do. But Subaru was just as lost as to what to tell them. Roswell, even after all this, you still wouldn't ray we tilde nd. Oh tilde r, perhaps you already have? Come to think of it, what happens to my consciousness when the world has rewound is still a complete mystery to me. Now, this is coup tilde eater the predicament. Walking over to Subaru's side, Roswell tilted his head. Looking up at the clown's face amidst the suffocating pain, an abrupt question escaped Subaru's lips. Subaru, Roz. Val. You keep on asking me to rewind over and over, but... Roswell, hmm? You have something Impo Tilda wouldn't to say? Let's hear it, let's hear it. Subaru, you're the one I've got a problem with here. Doing all this on the assumption that someone else has the ability to rewind the world. You must be out of your mind. Unless, you actually have. A way to carry over your memories? Could Roswell also have the ability to read the memories of the previous worlds, just like a Kidona in her dream citadel? If not, then his blind desire to reset the world would just be far too incomprehensible. Subaru, if not. That's fine. But, if you do. Perhaps you and I. Could. Collaborate maybe. Roswell's goals were mysterious and unknown, and he had done many unforgivable things. Subaru would never forgive him for the murder of Ram and Garfield or the way he had cornered Amelia. But Subaru was in no position to discard Roswell's strength out of emotion. In fact, he needed it badly. If you're going to eat poison, or however that saying goes, assuming it applies here, Subaru was also prepared to lick the plate. Roswell, it seems, there is no tilde T to be. But Subaru's thin sliver of hope was severed by a shake of Roswell's head. Roswell turned away from Subaru's downcast eyes, and pointed towards the end of his gaze. Roswell, Goa. A small flame rose up, setting the corner of the forest where Roswell was looking at a light. Subaru blinked at the abrupt act of destruction, when he heard, amidst the noise of crackling wood, yet another sound. It was the sound of a small, small animal dying. Subaru, no, way. Roswell, I tilde C, so this is how the end comes. Springing to his feet, Subaru's face paled as he scanned his surroundings. Simultaneously, Roswell shifted his posture, and with several crisp snaps of his fingers, the scent of burning flesh and shrill, ear-splitting cries coursed throughout the sanctuary. Then, when a charred corpse landed in front of his eyes with a thud, Subaru clearly understood. Subaru, great. Rabbit. It was one of the great rabbits. As they began slowly trickling out of the forest, Roswell burned them one by one with his magic. And even as they came in droves, they remained Roswell's prey. No matter how great their numbers grew, they could gain no ground against Roswell. Witnessing this, a terror gripped Subaru's heart, and would not let go. Every time he closed his eyes, the memory of being eaten by razor-sharp teeth would be revived. The sense of loss, the experience of having his fingers, body, and organs ripped to shreds was beyond description. Subaru could hear his very soul shrieking at the sight of the Mabeast's approach. Subaru, 
But this is only the fifth day. There should still be half a day left. Roswell, it's the snow. Subaru, snow. Roswell, where there is magic powerful enough to manipulate the weather, naturally, the atmosphere would be oversaturated with mana. Not to mention that everyone in the sanctuary has gathered inside the cathedral thanks to the snow. For a nearby Mabiste, this is an all too enticing Fay Tilda eating ground. Then, Subaru shuddered at Roswell's quiet observation. Following his logic, the single most dangerous place in the sanctuary during the Great Rabbit's attack would be Subaru, th the cathedral. We have to hurry to the cathedral. Roswell, it's too late. The moment they came for the few of us here, it meant that the prey-less masses were already on the move. There is no tilde one left. Subaru, but... That's where... Rem is. Having entrusted her to Lewis, that was where Rem was taken. Alongside the sanctuary's residents and the refugees from Alam village, there would be over a hundred people in the cathedral. With everyone gathered there, he didn't even want to think about it. Subaru, Roswell. Truce. Anyway, let's get to the cathedral. We'll collect the survivors, just get them somewhere sa. Subaru rushed up to Roswell, grabbed him by the collar and screamed. But Roswell gently pushed Subaru arms away. Roswell, flee. Where, exactly? There is a barrier. The people of the sanctuary cannot flee. Subaru, th that's. Roswell, there wasn't enough time, Subaru kun. The residents of the sanctuary cannot leave unless the trials are overcome. That is to say, your wish will not be granted. Collapsing, Subaru fell rear first into the snow. Shuffling against themselves, the Lewises gathered around the fallen Subaru, waiting for their next instruction in a rather humorous scene. And only then, did Subaru notice it. That Roswell, who had been incinerating swathes of oncoming Mabeasts as they appeared up to now, had completely stopped doing so. Subaru, our Roswell. If you stop. Unless. You're out of mana. Roswell, no tilde no, it's no such thing. Since, in a sense, my mana is inexortildestable. It wouldn't run out so easily, what has run out is my reason to live. Little by little, white furballs began plodding out of the forest. Leaving small pawprints in the pristine snow that was as white as their fur, they were certainly drawing closer. Subaru, e even if I can rewind. This kind of, at least we should talk it through first. You might think you're okay with leaving it to the next try, but... Roswell, you say Tilda M to have misunderstood Tilda odd something, Subaru Kun. Subaru, huh? Roswell, even if you can rewind, I cannot. The me you meet, after your rewind will not be me. This is my end. But Tha Tilda T is fine. Subaru was struck dumb by Roswell's words. The rewind won't apply to me, Roswell admitted it himself. That is to say, Roswell only knew that Subaru was someone who could potentially return by death, and his death here would mean the end of this Roswell's consciousness. He had accepted it, and was nonetheless ordering Subaru to rewind, though he would no longer exist after Subaru returns. That way of thinking is just. Subaru, not, how humans think at all. Unlike Subaru, whose consciousness would continue, Roswell's would not, and his death would be the end. What kind of human would accept it without question, knowing that it would be the end? Roswell, the day will come when you will truly surpass me, Subaru Kun. Subaru, Ro, S. Roswell, Lee Tilda Stenwell, Subaru Kun. It is important. The one thing that is truly, truly important to you, cast away everything else except it. Let go of everything else except it, and think only of protecting your single most important thing to the end. Subaru, dash dash. Roswell, if you do that. Roswell raised a finger as if to lecture. A nearby rabbit immediately leapt up and chomped down on his lifted wrist. Blood scattered, and Roswell's right arm was gnashed to bits from the wrist, while other jaws sank their fangs into his elbows, shoulders, and all over his body with the dull creak of tearing flesh. Subaru, Roswell. Roswell, you too, can become like me. 
The body of a rabbit with its mouth wide open blotted out the clown's smile. The swarm of white rabbits completely covered over Roswell's body. He fell sideways, offering no resistance as the rabbits devoured his flesh. Devoured. Devoured. Blood sprayed, meat flung out, and the white snow was dyed crimson red. Then even the crimson snow was greedily slurped up by the rabbits without leaving a drop. Subaru watched in silence, as Roswell ceased to be Roswell. Watched, as Roswell's existence was eaten and wiped from this world. He went on watching. ARC 4 The Everlasting Covenant Chapter 68 The Taste of Death In a world where everything seemed twisted, Subaru was desperately running. Subaru, dash. He was insane. He was insane, 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 he was insane. The words repeated and repeated in his mind, beneath his eyelids as he repeated those words were Roswell's final moments, felled by the great rabbit's fangs. No resistance, so easily accepting his death, without even once crying out in pain for his ruptured flesh, Roswell allowed his own existence to end. Aberrant. What would you call this, if not aberrant and insane? As long as his goal would be accomplished in a parallel world, he was not bothered by his death, if this was a game, Subaru might have given the player character's death the same significance. But it was reality. Just how could a person, in reality, entrust his life to an alternate self? This Roswell was eaten by rabbits in front of Subaru's eyes. And his consciousness would not follow Subaru to the world beyond death. He may be staking his wishes on return by death, same as Subaru, but the weight of the toll was nowhere near the same. Because, unlike Subaru, Roswell could not reclaim the price he had paid. Subaru, uo, ogh. Recalling the macabre image of Roswell's death as he ran, Subaru was hounded by the urge to vomit. Bile surged up, burning his throat. But he couldn't spare even the time to puke as he wandered through the sanctuary in search of survivors. Hell unfolded before Subaru once again. Snow had stopped falling on the sanctuary, but the howling wind persisted. Lifting his face, grimacing at the skin shearing cold as he gazed about his surroundings, he could hear the animals' calls all around, intermixed with the wind. Grinding, grinding, the noise of serrated teeth grinding besieged the sanctuary as if voicing their threat to their prey. The great rabbit prowled through the sanctuary in search of their feed. Just how terrible was the hunger and famine that assaulted them? When they failed to find prey, as if not to waste time letting their teeth stand idle, they would stave off their hunger by biting into their companions. A true, abominable monster. Bit by bit, the grating noise of gnawing teeth and their cannibalistic shrieks of death and ecstasy chipped away at Subaru's sanity. Subaru, Ua. While trying to shake off that appalling cacophony, a rabbit with wide open jaws shot over Subaru's head. Teeth clicked viciously upon teeth as it tumbled into the snow. Having missed its prey, the rabbit flipped around with a threatening hiss. Immediately, a Lewis clone running alongside Subaru crushed her heel into the rabbit's torso. With the sound of meat squishing and bones cracking, the rabbit puked out its body's innards from its mouth, dead. Exhaling, paying no heed to the corpse, Subaru resumed his sprint as the Lewis clones moved out alongside him. Not far behind them, other rabbits arrived at the crushed corpse. Hearing the sound of the corpse devoured in an instant, the bells of doom inside Subaru rang ever louder. Six Lewis clones remained at Subaru's side. The eleven who had been present at Roswell's death had had their numbers cut by half. Having been ordered to protect Subaru, some had turned to face the charging rabbits, while some used their bodies to shield him before returning to Mana. As for why he ordered the clones to protect him with their lives, Subaru had already given up trying to explain it. Right now, the only thing on his mind was the safety of Rem in the cathedral and of Emilia inside the tomb, while all else was abandoned somewhere beyond his considerations. That was the only way to justify his present actions, and to safeguard his own sanity. Subaru, th. Cathedral. Avoiding the rabbit-infested roads with the snow pulling at his steps, 
Subaru took a large detour around the sanctuary to reach the village center and the cathedral. In a village devoid of any source of light, Subaru immediately spotted the cathedral. But, of course. Since amidst this world of white, only the cathedral was enveloped in pure red flames. Subaru, W.H., Y. Falling to his knees in the snow, Subaru muttered in a hoarse daze. The crackling of the sprawling blaze mixed with the sound of snapping wood as Subaru watched rabbits leaping into the flame like moths, intending to eat the prey inside only to be instantly burned to a crisp. The fact that they were so desperate to enter the cathedral meant that there was still something to sate their hunger inside. And the fact that there were those who remained inside the flames meant that. Subaru, dash. Deciding survival was hopeless, rather than be eaten by rabbits, they had chosen to commit suicide. Subaru wasn't incapable of understanding this feeling. He wasn't incapable, but... Subaru, even so. Old have resisted to the end. I wish you would have fought on to the very end without giving up on life. But perhaps, that was an all too heartless thought. Both Roswell and the people of the sanctuary had treated their lives with excessive neglect. Nearly forgetting that he himself was most guilty of that charge, Subaru covered his face as tears streamed from his eyes. Neither Roswell nor Subaru had inspired enough hope for the residents of the sanctuary and the refugees of Alam to resist until the very end. If Subaru had managed to build that kind of trust, surely, they wouldn't have given up until the last moment. Once again, everything was Subaru's fault, and Subaru's crime. Subaru, but even if. Only Rem. Survived? This ordering of the value of life was just the height of hubris and pride. Mentally, Subaru called out to the clone he had instructed to take Rem to the cathedral, the current Lewis personality. But, he could find no visible reaction indicating that she had heard it. Rem was inside that burning cathedral. Or, even if they escaped, Subaru was not nearly naive enough to think that Lewis could have single-handedly protected Rem from the great rabbit as they ran. He clenched down on his molars. There was the taste of blood. Biting into the bloody taste, into the surging bitterness, Subaru clenched onto his decision. He should have already realized that this world was lost, and that he only wound up here because of his repeated refusal to accept it. But now, it was truly about time to give up. Subaru, dash. He could hear the hunger-plagued monster approaching. That was because the rabbits, who had abandoned the prospect of devouring any prey in the burnt cathedral, had noticed the presence of the kneeling Subaru and the Lewis clones surrounding him. Standing up, brushing off the snow, Subaru spilled a deep exhale. He did not notice the sensation of the tears streaming down his cheeks. And so, he did not wipe them away. Subaru, Emilia. This world was ending. And even if it wasn't ending, Subaru would make sure that it ends. In a world in which everyone he wished to be with, to live with, and to save, was gone, at least, at the very end, he wanted to be at the side of the girl he loved. Subaru, use your lives. To protect me. Once I reach the tomb. You're free to do whatever you want. Subaru emotionlessly relayed to the six remaining clones. He took one step, and then another, away from the horde of rabbits, until he was running. Sensing their prey's intention to escape, the rabbits raised an inaudible cry as they hounded Subaru's trail, drooling from their mouths. Lewis, dash. Two Lewis clones dived into the great rabbit's mass just as it was poised to leap. It was followed by the sound of death and crushing flesh, until the two of them were surrounded by the ever-swelling swarm. In an instant, the two were completely coated in white fur and fell to their sides, fatally wounded, their small bodies transformed into streams of pale blue light. And, with their final attack, they caught the feeding rabbits in an explosion of mana, lighting up the sanctuary's night sky with its dancing radiance. Sensing the clone's final burst of brilliance on the skin of his back, Subaru shook his head to cast off the ones he had deserted, gritted his teeth, and ran for the tomb. And just went on running. By the time Subaru arrived at the tomb, his body could no longer feel the cold. The snow had clouded his vision, and it felt like his eyelashes were frozen, but, 
spilling a white breath from his shivering lips, Subaru didn't seem to care. The only thing his heavy, leaden thoughts could envision was a single, solitary girl. With his footsteps echoing upon the stone-tiled corridor, Subaru headed into the depths. At the trial room, there would be a girl whom he had put to sleep, waiting for him. Question mark Subaru? When he reached the open space, a voice like a silver chime called out his name. Letting his feet be lured in by that voice, he entered the room. And, upon seeing him, the one who called to him raised a voice full of delight. Amelia, so it is you, Subaru. Geez, where did you go? I was so worried. Amelia ran up to him with skipping steps and took him by the hand. Pouting, she pressed his hand against her chest, transferring over her tender warmth as she looked up. Amelia, are you tired? Subaru, yeah. Maybe, just a little. Tired. Amelia, a, eh, I see. In that case. In that case. Amelia giggled at Subaru's straightforward admission, her cheeks blushing red. Then, still holding onto Subaru's hand, she suddenly sat down on the spot, folding her legs and sitting on her side, she pulled the half-crouching Subaru closer. Amelia, here, go ahead, Subaru. Subaru, a lap. Pillow. Amelia, yep. Subaru, you like my lap pillows, don't you? That's what you told me. I do remember these things, you know. Here, go on. She gave her lap a pat, smiling as if both proud and embarrassed at the same time. Obediently, Subaru sat down and settled his head on her soft thighs. The moment his short hair brushed against her skin, Emilia let out an enticing, MN tilde, but soon proceeded to stroke his head with practiced form. Emilia, how many times is it now? that I've given Subaru a lap pillow? Subaru, not sure. This is the third, I guess. Somehow, it's always when I'm exhausted and broken. Emilia, you know, Subaru, it's fun to fiddle around with your hair and cheeks. ta k that, fiddle fiddle tilde. Pulling on his bangs and poking her finger into his cheeks, Emilia happily played with Subaru's head. Knowing that it was an expression of her affection, he didn't feel the slightest urge to push her fingers away. In a world that was ending, for now, he just wanted to drown in Amelia's love. Because he had already lost most of his blood and viscera. The goriness of Subaru's current state would make any normal person want to look away. His back had been scoured by fangs, and one could probably see the bones if he lifted up his clothes. Profuse blood was streaming from his demolished thighs, and on his right hand, which he used to swat away the incoming rabbits, only his thumb remained intact. Perhaps it was delusional tenacity that led his murky consciousness here. That, along with the freezing cold that had ironically dulled the sensations of his body. Emilia, Subaru, did you get a little lighter? Subaru, I'm trying out the blood loss diet. It's like dump the ballast, and get lighter and light, er, uh, something like that. Amelia, I don't understand what you're saying, but you did something crazy for someone else again, didn't you? That's the kind of person you are, Subaru. I know that, but... I still get really worried. Subaru. Amelia, the truth is, I only want you to do that. For me. But, I know that's being selfish, and I wouldn't want to see Subaru pretend not to care about anyone else because of me, even though that's me being selfish too. Sorry. Amelia's rapid-fire words grew distant. Unlike the frigid cold outside, the tomb's interior retained a certain level of warmth. This ironically restored Subaru's metabolism to its normal levels, and renewed his sedated blood flow. Fresh blood dyed the stone slabs red, as even more was coughed out of Subaru's mouth. Dots of splattered blood stained onto Amelia's white cheeks. But. Amelia, say, Subaru. Are you listening? There are so, so, so many things I want to tell you, and ask you. So, please, stay with me. Listen to my voice. And let me hear yours, okay? Amelia didn't seem to mind the touch of blood on her cheeks. Or rather, she never even noticed them. Her amethyst eyes were on Subaru, and were certainly seeing him, 
but they simply hadn't accepted the reality they reflected. From the moment Subaru set out from the mansion, he was already littered with the marks of Elsa's torture. Being dragged to the tomb by Garfield, must have only worsened his miserable appearance. But Emilia didn't make note of Subaru's wounds, or seemed at all worried. Even now, with various parts of his body missing, eaten by rabbits, she didn't react any differently. Right now, Emilia wasn't seeing reality. And perhaps, Subaru was just the same. Subaru, dash dash. He was supposed to warn Emilia of the danger and take her far away from here. The great rabbit had already overrun everything outside the tomb, and would probably rush inside at any moment. When they do, Emilia wouldn't stand a chance. Just like Roswell, and the villagers who chose to die in the fire, Emilia would not escape a cruel and gruesome death. But, even knowing this, Subaru didn't warn her, because, within moments of losing his life, he couldn't escape his selfish desire to face the end at Emilia's side. Roswell's words and grisly demise, the regret for Garfield and Ram's deaths, the devastation of losing Petra and Frederica, and the sense of powerlessness of his inability to save Rem and Emilia, all struck Subaru to the core. Pain, or even the terror of death, none of it mattered any more. Right now, all he wanted was to vanish from this world. Subaru's haphazard and selfish wish would be fulfilled. The world was clouding over, while little by little, his consciousness and his soul fell away from this place. Strength deserted his limbs, and the last of his sensations left his body. All that remained, all that stayed behind, was Amelia, seemingly unaware of Subaru's departure. Subaru, dash dash. So, was he going to leave Amelia behind? When he was the only one she could rely on, when she had lost everyone else she could depend on, was Subaru going to leave her too? Subaru, A. Eh? It was too late to regret it now, it was too late to do anything. Without uttering a sound, life faded from his eyes. Emilia didn't seem to notice it, but only adorably tilted her head at Subaru, who had gone quiet. Then, she smiled, and brought her face closer. Emilia, Subaru. Subaru, dash dash. She took the silent Subaru, and kissed him on the lips. His first kiss was of the cold taste of death. ARC 4 The Everlasting Covenant Chapter 69, Liar Feeling the touch of the hard ground, cold as always, Subaru's consciousness was pulled back to reality. Lying flat on his stomach, he opened his eyes and pushed himself up while spitting out the dirt and gravel in his mouth. He looked about his surroundings, and found himself in a murky darkness. It was the trial room inside the tomb. From the same spot as it ended, Subaru's world began anew. Although a part of him was relieved to have managed to come back, the suffocating prospect of repeating the same hell in this world clenched onto his heart and would not let go. Shaking his head, Subaru rejected those ominous portents of another dead end. Then, standing up and brushing the dirt off his clothes as he scanned around the area, he found Amelia, collapsed in a corner of the room. Subaru but, just before he could call out and run over to her side, Subaru hesitated. What scraped across his mind was the scene that immediately preceded his return, of Emilia with him dying in her lap, oblivious to his departure as she shared with him a kiss. Without meaning to, Subaru touched a finger to his lips and furrowed his brows at the dry sensation. In those last moments, Subaru's face must have been a mess from all the blood he had coughed up. He couldn't possibly understand what Emilia was thinking when she kissed him, but it was certainly not a memory which he would remember fondly. Just as it had been when he was on the verge of death, though he could remember it happening, no emotion or tactile sensation carried over to the present world. It was Subaru's first kiss, as well as the first kiss he shared with Emilia. But, having been obstructed by the unreasonable barrier of death, it had left him no notable impression. Subaru, dash dash. Yet, Subaru's hesitation was not the result of that regret. His reflection on that kiss was not for sentimentality's sake, but for the enormity of the danger surrounding Emilia. The way she had clung to Subaru, utterly detached from reality. With Puck refusing to show himself, she was crushed by the pressure from the villagers and the sanctuary's residents. And when even her last support, 
Subaru, left her, Emilia's heart was finally broken. If the result was her falling into that state, then what had happened to Emilia in all those loops up to now? Subaru. Subaru had left the sanctuary for the mansion four times now. Of all those times, the last was the only one where he had managed to come back to her, then what became of Emilia in those other three loops? In each of those loops, Rabbit would have attacked the sanctuary. Even if Emilia had managed to keep her sanity intact, it wouldn't be hard to imagine the outcome considering the Mabeast's ferocity. But, just what must have been going through her mind back then? Subaru, as if there's any point in asking. If it turns out like that every time I leave, I'll have no choice but to stay around. Nothing about their situation inspired optimism. He could leave everything to the future and distract himself from what was happening around him, but that would be pointless. In order to reach the perfect future, Subaru must constantly assume the worst possible continuation. Assume that the world would always prepare for him the cruelest, most unreasonable fate. In that case, the problems surrounding Amelia, Beatrice, Elsa, and Roswell would naturally always be arranged in the most difficult way possible. Subaru, what I'll have to do is save Amelia from being broken, save the people of the sanctuary from the great rabbit, and save his friends at the mansion from Elsa's violence. No doubt, it would be a perilous path. Can it really be done? Inside, the weak part of himself was asking, while preparing escape routes, excuses, and safeguards. It's not a matter of can or cannot, all there is is to do it. Subaru bared his teeth at that weakness inside himself, and declared his resolve not to betray his oath. All he had to do was to retry as many times as necessary to clear away the obstacles, confirm the victory conditions, sort out the chronology, and determine the best use of his time. Even if Subaru's heart would be worn down by every failure, even if it meant having to witness things he'd never want to witness, as long as it brought him closer to grasping that perfect future, then it'd suit him just fine. That was why. Subaru, Emilia. Are you all right? Reaching out, he shook the shoulder of the collapsed, lovely girl. Emilia's eyelids twitched at Subaru's touch, as her consciousness was brought out of the world of the trials and back to reality. Her eyes opened, reflecting Subaru inside their amethyst gleam. Within seconds, tears welled up, rejecting her past as she clung tightly onto Subaru. Accepting Emilia's reach for his support, Subaru returned her embrace as he silently reaffirmed the promise he had made. He would protect Emilia to the very end, as well as save everyone there is to save. Because there was no one except Natsuki Subaru who could do this. He began organizing the chaotic information from the end of the previous loop. Most important among them, was that concerning Roswell L. Mathers. The same Roswell who, right in front of his eyes, had lost his life, becoming the great rabbit's feed. Roswell knew about Subaru's return by death. Even if he didn't know that death was the trigger, he was aware of Subaru's ability to rewind. Though Subaru wasn't sure if Roswell had learned of this after his arrival at the sanctuary, or if he had known long before that, most likely, it was written in Roswell's gospel. Subaru hadn't been able to recover Roswell's gospel in the previous loop. If the gospel had been tucked in Roswell's robes, then it would have been swallowed by the rabbits alongside his flesh. But even if Roswell had left it in the residence, Subaru was in no state of mind to run inside to check. And so, Subaru never got to see what was recorded inside. Or just what Roswell's ultimate objective might be. If Roswell was only acting according to the Gospel's text, then what made him abandon his life in the end? Perhaps the answer lay in the Gospel itself. Most likely, Roswell would obey the Gospel even if it cost him his life. Subaru didn't know what format the entries in Roswell's Gospel would be written in, but they should be instructions, signposts towards its owner's desired future, just like in Petelgeuse's gospel. When something deviated from the witch cultist's gospel, Petelgeuse would use his own judgment to improvise within a reasonable range until the outcome matched the records. But it was very different for Roswell. Acting with the knowledge that it was possible to rewind the world, when the future differed from what was written, he would give up his own life just so he wouldn't have to endure the time that would pass in error. When reality differed from the text, 
Petelgeurs chose to improvise. Whereas, refusing to permit the slightest deviance, Roswell insisted that reality must follow the writ. Though they were both dangerous adversaries in possession of Gospels, and even if the contents of their Gospels were largely the same, their approaches were almost complete opposites. Considering the ways they relied on their Gospels, Subaru couldn't help but find Roswell's to be the more misguided of the two. The problem lay in the contents of Roswell's Gospel. If the outcomes of the attacks on the sanctuary and the mansion were all recorded in its pages, then the tragedy would only repeat over and over again until Roswell's wishes are fulfilled. Even the snowfall in the sanctuary could be attributed to Roswell's desire to match the Gospel's prophecies. Which means, the snow was probably a part of every loop. The only reason Subaru hadn't encountered it until now was because it always started after he had left for the mansion, and he never returned in time to see it. Roswell had induced the snowfall on the sanctuary in order to isolate Amelia. But just what was the point of doing that? Even without such roundabout methods, the unbearable pressure from all sides should have been enough to wear her down. With her sense of duty, and being acutely aware of the expectations of those around her, Amelia could only bite down on her unease and powerlessness and continue challenging the trials. The moment Subaru was no longer at her side, she would lose her way and descend into a state of self-abandon. Unless, that was Roswell's goal to begin with. But if Amelia stopped acting for everyone else's sake, the sanctuary would never be liberated, and without liberating the sanctuary, there would be no escape when the great rabbit attacked. There were too many places where Roswell's actions and attitude towards Amelia were at odds. More than anything, there were Roswell's final words, moments before he was devoured by the great rabbit. Cast away everything except the one most important to you. That was what Roswell had whispered. If you do that, you too, can become like me. Never mind whether Subaru wanted to become like Roswell, the underlying implication of those words was that Roswell had abandoned everything except what was most important to him, and that was how he wound up here. In fact, it was a resolve for which he could relinquish his life, there was no doubt in that regard. If everything followed the Gospel's writ, Emilia was driven into isolation, and events progressed exactly as Roswell intended, would he really obtain that thing for which he was willing to abandon all else? Or, perhaps a better question would be, why did Roswell tell Subaru all this? In any case. Subaru, if you're telling me to let go. There's no way I could do that. Emilia was important, but, it goes without saying, that there were people who Subaru wanted to protect and to keep at his side, far too many to count. In Subaru's narrow world, even the loss of a single fragment would forever render that world colorless. Greedy and selfish as he was, there was no way he could permit it. And so, he could never follow Roswell's advice. Subaru, Roswell. I, will never become like you. Subaru comforted the crying Emilia until she fell asleep, and brought her out of the tomb. As usual, while everyone was shocked to see Amelia in her state and to learn that she had failed the trial, Subaru carried her to Lewis' house to put her to bed. Along the way, Garfield's feigned cheerfulness out of consideration for the atmosphere was almost painful to watch, and Subaru could notice Lewis casting him a meaningful gaze, though he didn't mention anything. He overlooked the former on purpose because there was still something he had to confirm. As for the latter, it was because Subaru already somewhat understood the meaning behind her gaze. Garfield, oi, borrow your for a minute. After entrusting the sleeping Amelia to Ram, Garfield called out to Subaru while everyone was leaving for the night. Having been expecting this, Subaru answered with a, yeah, as he followed behind the slouching figure, heading into the forest surrounding the sanctuary. Subaru wasn't sure if Garfield was bringing him to the same spot as last time but he could tell that Garfield's expression was exactly the same as back then. With eyes blazing, Garfield locked his glare onto Subaru. In stark contrast to his attitude as they left the tomb, his hostility was now plain as day. Naturally, the first question to come out his mouth was, Garfield, what d? Subaru, what did your bastard see in the tomb? A blue vein was about to bulge from Garfield's forehead at Subaru's interruption when his eyes widened as he heard the exact words he was about to say. As if taken completely off guard,
Garfield's cutting impression fell away to an almost childish air. It was almost strange. Immediately shaking his head at the squinting Subaru, Garfield clicked his fangs as if to compose himself. Garfield, that's creepy as fuck, but if you already know, that'd speed things up. Don't try hiding anything, honest now. You don't want me third year, do ya? Subaru, right. But I'm a busy guy, there are loads of things I want to check as well. If I answer your questions. In exchange, will you answer some of mine? Garfield, you think you're in any position to negotiate? I'm in a position to eat your hole, and you're in the position keep tossing meat to stave off getting eaten. Miji gives up the big bro before the lil bro, as they say. Subaru, of all the references you made. That might be the darkest one, you know. Replying with a shrug, Subaru dropped his gaze and fell into silence. Garfield looked like he was growing impatient, but he didn't pressure Subaru to hurry. While Subaru took a deep breath, and decided how best to answer. Subaru, inside, I took the trial. I saw my past. Garfield, dash. So you did have qualifications, TCH. Then, year results. Subaru, failed. It's not so easy, accepting or denying your past, it's the same with Amelia, I'm afraid. Giving him half a truth and half a lie, Subaru tried to gauge Garfield's response. Garfield's face paled when he heard that Subaru had taken the trial, but once learned that Subaru didn't pass, his shoulders slumped in relief. Subaru, well you sure look pretty damn pleased about it. Garfield, what do I? Subaru, I was just thinking, you certainly look pretty happy to hear that Amelia failed, and the sanctuary won't be liberated. Listening to Subaru's words, Garfield furrowed his brows and snorted as if starting to catch on. Slightly lowering his stance, he glared up at Subaru. Garfield, you bastard, what in your past dot dot in your trial, what the hell did you hear? Subaru, about the creation of the sanctuary, and some background stuff as well. Also, about you and Louis San, I guess. Garfield, dash. You know. About, my. Past? Garfield was about to say, when Subaru cut him off with a shake of his head. Subaru, not sure what you saw in your past, but I don't know nearly that much. Although, I do have an idea why you're keeping quiet about having taken the trial. Garfield, you already know that much. Subaru, part of its speculation, too. You can reply with an outraged you're just imagining it, if you want. In this world, Subaru and Garfield have only known each other for a single day. Most of the information he had gathered from his interactions with Garfield were things he wasn't supposed to have heard yet. The same goes for information about the original Louis Meyer, sleeping in the experimental grounds. Thus, Subaru was trying bypass this by conveniently making use of the trials and Echidona's existence. For now, he figured that there was nothing else he could gain from this interaction with Garfield. So he really just wanted this conversation to be over. But. Subaru, say, why won't you retake the trials? Garfield, dash dash. In front of the silent Garfield, Subaru asked him this question. Hearing this, Garfield lowered his head so as not to let Subaru see his expression. His arms dangled at his sides, as his wary posture slackened and lost its strength. From that, Subaru judged that no sudden attack was coming. Subaru, you know, I can't help but feel that your actions lack consistency. First you push Emilia to liberate the sanctuary, and then you look all relieved when she fails. But then again, if you're really trying to block the sanctuary from being liberated, you're going about it way too half-heartedly. If he completely disregarded the consequences, Garfield could just transform into a beast and kill Subaru and Emilia. Naturally, his relationship with the refugees and Roswell's faction would plummet, but if Garfield's goal was truly to hinder the sanctuary's liberation, then this method would be both quick and reliable. And yet, Garfield didn't take any actions up until the very last moment, until Subaru crossed the line by having the refugees escape the sanctuary. There was still some threshold inside Garfield's mind that Subaru didn't know of. Subaru, I was hoping I could get your help. Garfield, do. That say such stupid crap. 
Hearing Subaru say this, Garfield paused a moment before turning him down. Looking up and shaking his head, Garfield's usual vigor was completely gone from his face. Garfield, like you said, our interests ain't aligned. I won't actively get in your way, but I ain't gonna help you, either. Neutral. Yeah, neutral's good. Subaru, you do realize that position doesn't suit you at all? Garfield, it ain't a matter of suiting or not. I'm just doing it cause it's what I have to. Annoyed at saying something he wouldn't usually say, Garfield kicked at the ground, sweeping up a cloud of dust as he turned his back to Subaru. Garfield, if that half which beats trials, that's fine by me. Once you're here, the only way you're getting out is by passing the trials. I'm aware of that. But whether I'm leaving the sanctuary once it's freed's another matter. Subaru. Garfield, if you're gonna leave, go ahead and get out. But don't try anything in here. Don't meddle in our shit any more and you already have. You stay by that, and I ain't gonna do anything. Subaru, even if I told you that we need your help outside? Garfield, things that I want, none of your lot can give me. This is as far as this conversation goes. Don't try pulling any unnecessary stunts now. Though he refused to listen to Subaru, Garfield left him with those still rational words. Garfield had shown his strong rejection in all their conversations up to now, but only this time, he didn't lose his composure. Just what was different, and what could it mean? Subaru, there's a mountain of things I have to think about. But. Inserting his fingers into his black hair, Subaru set aside his overcomplicated considerations for now, as much as he wanted to sort them, organize them, and arrange them to arrive at some kind of answer. Subaru, there's no way I could sort out all these things alone. Should he get lost inside his labyrinth of thoughts, Natsuki Subaru would only be caught in another downward spiral. To make sure that doesn't happen, what he needed to do now was. Subaru, guess it's time to rely on you again. Subaru's thoughts turned to the only person in the world to whom he could lay bare his worries. As if spurred on by some unbearable emotion, Subaru's steps hastened. After parting with Garfield, Subaru's walk turned into a sprint. With ragged breaths, sweating brows, and trembling eyes, Subaru ran. His sole destination, lit by the moonlight, was the interior of the tomb. This was after their previous conversation. Having stated that he would not interfere with Subaru's actions, Garfield did not stop him. There was no one left to rebuke him for venturing into the tomb once more. Arriving at the entryway, Subaru stopped to roughly wipe off the sweat with his sleeves. Drawing deep breaths to calm his winded lungs, Subaru pressed forward into the darkness of the tomb. Since there was something he must do, in the abyssal citadel of dreams that was Echidona's realm. Subaru, if you truly wish inside your heart, I want to know. Then you will be invited. That was what the white-haired witch had told him. Clinging to that hope and putting his faith in those words, Subaru came here. There was a mountain of things he wanted to ask, to talk about, to agonize over, and to search for the answer together with her. Things he could only reveal to the Witch of Greed, so that she might show him the way. What he needed to do, and what he wanted to do were now one and the same. All that was left was some way to make it reality, some way other than deliberating alone. Subaru, dash dash. It was not that he didn't feel ashamed about going to Echidona's citadel, dumping all his doubts and worries on her, and imposing on her goodwill, and it was not that he wasn't afraid that revealing everything to Echidona would violate the forbidden and once again drown the sanctuary in envy's shadows. Yet, even so, Subaru had hope. Hope that the witch's guidance might be the key to breaking through fate's dead end. Subaru, right now. I should meet all the requirements. He was so lost as to what to do. And so determined to use any means necessary. If the present Subaru wasn't a willing and eager apostle of greed, then what was he? Innumerable times would he freely surrender his life. And he would give up his pride too, if that was all it took to settle this. For that was all this pathetic, useless, and ignorant Natsuki Subaru could manage. Subaru, I'm counting on you, Ikidona. Subaru steadied his breaths, 
and silently gather the courage to step into the tomb. Making his way to the rectangular space that had already accepted him as a challenger once tonight, he scanned over the room, and proceeded towards its center. Subaru, gonna have to wing it with where and what rituals are required, but... The second time Subaru was invited into the dream, aside from the desperate desire for an answer, he should have been in the same position as he was immediately after returning by death. There didn't seem to be any special offering required. In any case, Subaru kneeled down on the spot, joined his hands, and closed his eyes. He envisioned the white witch in his mind, calling out to her with the enumerations of his emotions, as if telling of his impossible future and his despairing desire to reach her. Subaru, dash dash. Just like this, time passed as Subaru waited in silence. He could feel the tomb's cold air caressing his skin as cold sweat formed on his brows. He wanted it. Desperately. He yearned for it. Earnestly. If he wanted it this badly, yearned for it this badly, and still couldn't reach her. Then perhaps greed is far too immense and avarice for mere humans. Subaru, you? Just before this faint-heartedness could sink in, Subaru felt the illusion of a white light encroaching on the darkness behind his eyelids. Or perhaps, it was no illusion. Subaru, dash dash. White light invaded his vision, slowly, and slowly, eroding away the pitch-dark world. Before he knew it, his kneeling body had fallen to its side, and he could feel his consciousness detach from reality as it was pulled into another world. His summon to the Citadel of Dreams had begun. In the Citadel where Ikidona was waiting, this time, he was determined to hold the conversation that would let him truly grasp the future. That thought alone occupied his fading consciousness, as witness, a present that was not to be. The moment his awareness fell away, he thought he heard that voice. A sensation like a drunken stupor swayed Subaru's nerves. He didn't know what happened. His awakening came so suddenly that it was like when a channel was switched on a television. As if having jumped to a channel of a completely different genre, it felt like his entire consciousness was replaced. It was almost reminiscent of the sensation immediately following return by death. The discrepancy between the wretchedness of the world where he died, and the one after returning by death always carved a sense of incongruity into his mind, body, and soul. Dash dash. When he tried to speak, Subaru realized that he couldn't make a sound. He tried bringing a hand to his throat, but only then, he belatedly noticed that he could feel neither his hand nor his throat. Dash dash? Whether it was his limbs, his eyes, or his mouth, none of his body existed. There was only his consciousness, floating in space, watching the world from above as nothing more than a point of view. It was unnatural like the disembodied sensation of being inside a dream. But, he had a feeling that this wasn't the first time he felt this way. Could he be dreaming, after all? With those thoughts in the back of his mind, Natsuki Subaru tried to tear his consciousness away from the scene before his eyes. But it was impossible. For the disembodied Subaru, never mind turning his head away, even closing his eyes was forbidden. All he could do was watch as this scene before his eyes was forcibly burned into his mind. Question mark ear. The voice was quiet, and hoarse. And so weak that he could barely make out what it was saying. But. Dash dash. He intuitively understood it. With nothing but his consciousness, Subaru intuitively understood that this is bad. It was a voice that he mustn't hear. A voice he mustn't recognize proclaiming something he mustn't know. But, regardless of what his consciousness told him, the scene searing into his mind did not change. It would not disappear. But only went on pushing, carving the outcome into Subaru. Question mark liar. Liar, liar 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 liar, HK. Within that repeating whisper, the previously inaudible word began to take shape, as if forgetting to stop, and interspersed with sobs. A heart-rending sight. His ear were filled with despairing grief. To take this into his eyes and to receive this into his ears must have been the greatest suffering in this world. Dash dash. Why was he here? Why was he seeing this? His failure. His mistake. His error in judgment. 
He wasn't supposed to see it. He wasn't supposed to know. He was never supposed to know. If I didn't tell myself, it won't be like that, I. Amelia, liar. Liar. Subaru. You liar. You liar. Collapsed on the floor, with a flood of tears pouring from her amethyst eyes, Amelia cried out. Like an accusation of a betrayal, rejecting the nightmare before her eyes, disheveling her hair like a small child, Amelia screamed as if in a frenzy. While, at the sleeping Rem's bedside, Subaru's corpse with a small knife pierced into his throat lay in front of the wailing Amelia. ARC 4 The Everlasting Covenant Chapter 70 What Comes After Hell What on earth was he watching? Dash dash Expelling ear-splitting shrieks, Amelia was crying Subaru's name. Subaru's body was leaning limply against the bed, its wide-open eyes devoid of life. Well, naturally. With its throat pierced by a dagger, and with that much lost blood, it couldn't possibly be alive. It's not every day that you get a chance to look down at your own corpse. It was a twisted sensation, as if he had detached from his dead body as a ghost and was being made to watch the spectacle that followed. Even if the majority of that feeling was false, the fundamental part was not. What Subaru was being forced to watch was unmistakably the scene after his death. Dash dash. The room's furnishings, the people present here, and the wretched figure of his dead self. Putting these together, Subaru realized precisely what he was being shown here. It was the result of his thoughtless act after defeating the Sin Archbishop, Petalger's Roman A. Conti, and saving Emilia, when he first learned of the loss of Rem. Having felled the White Whale, repelled Sloth, and saved Emilia and the Alam villagers, Subaru was at the height of joy when he was sent plummeting to the pit of the abyss upon learning that Rem was lost. He had raced the carriage all the way to the capital, where he found the sleeping Rem in Crush Carsten's mansion, and, once he confirmed that her consciousness was gone and no one could remember her, Subaru immediately committed suicide by stabbing a knife through his own throat. It was almost a reflex, without a single moment of deeper consideration. He had merely done it to reject the scene before his eyes, to ask return by death for a chance to retry the past and retrieve what had been lost. But, this rash deed came to no success, and the place he returned to after his suicide was immediately before he stabbed his neck, after already having reunited with the sleeping Rem. Return by death's safe point had been updated. Its merciless timing had stolen away Subaru's only means of retrieving Rem, and once again plunged him into the depths of the abyss. It was after that, when he sealed his resolve and made his oath to restore her and to somehow keep standing up to now, but... Subaru, it's not... my fault. This... it's not my fault, I didn't know. I've never seen any of this. He had never seen this scene before. Well, of course. Subaru was already dead in this world. Though he had the means to return after losing his life, he never knew what happened to those worlds after he died. Or rather, there was no way for him to know. But still, it was not until this moment, that he had even considered it. Experiencing his own death, rewinding the world, then proceeding along a different path to bypass the dead end, the world in which he died gave him no information beyond how he died, and served as nothing more than a transit point. Judging these worlds to be mere checkpoints towards his ultimate, desired future, and having decided to make full use of return by death, he had regarded even this present world as no more than a waypoint. But now, that was crumbling. Subaru, stop. Stop 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 it please stop. Rejecting the scene before his eyes, Subaru shrieked a voiceless shriek, but, without a throat to raise a sound, no eyes to avert his gaze, and no ears he could cover, the world went on engraving its outcome into Subaru's consciousness. As punishment for the careless deed he committed. Question mark Amelia Summer, what? Overhearing Amelia's wails, a new character stepped into the horrendous scene. An old man, wearing a brand new butler's outfit over his muscular body, carried by strides that gave no indication of his injuries, it was Wilhelm. Skidding into the room, the old man unwittingly fell silent at the sight before him. So even the sword demon Wilhelm could make such a dumbfounded face. 
Subaru was hit with that out-of-place thought as he saw Wilhelm's face head-on. That was just how far Wilhelm's expression deviated from the usual, unable to hide his shock at the sight of Subaru's corpse. Wilhelm, what in the world has? No, now's not. Subaru Dono. But Wilhelm's bewilderment only lasted an instant. Shaking his head to promptly suppress his bafflement, he rushed to the collapsed Subaru's side. Emilia continued clinging to the lifeless body, oblivious to Wilhelm's approach. Emilia, Subaru. Subaru you. Liar. You said th. We'll be together. Wilhelm, Emilia Summer, I beg your forgiveness. While Emilia condemned Subaru's betrayal like a curse, Wilhelm pushed her aside to reach the corpse. Without any strength to support her own body, she fell to the floor, but Wilhelm immediately turned from his momentary attention towards Emilia back to resuscitating Subaru, who was still soaking in the fresh, profuse pool of his own blood. Wilhelm, dash dash. His expression grave, Wilhelm took off his jacket and used it to cover Subaru's throat as he unhesitatingly drew out the dagger. Blood sprayed out, staining Wilhelm's perilous visage, but without even blinking, he immediately plugged the wound. The bleeding stopped, while Wilhelm pumped on Subaru's unbeating chest, attempting to revive his heart. Wilhelm, Ferris. Felix. Come quickly. Emergency. Hurry. Aiming his shout outside the room, Wilhelm applied pressure to Subaru's wound as he continued the resuscitation effort. However, the volume of lost blood was far too great. His limbs and face were drained of color, and anyone could see that Natsuki Subaru's soul was no longer present. But still, Wilhelm had no intention to give up. Ferris, old Will, what are you yelling ab, HK? Wilhelm, Felix, quickly. The blades punctured his throat. There's not a second to lose. Ferris, dash dash. Rushing up at the call, Ferris immediately nodded at Wilhelm's command, cloaking his hands in a blue, undulating aura as he sent healing magic into Subaru's fallen body. Gazing down on his own soul-departed corpse, Subaru saw a seriousness on Ferris' always easy-going face that he had never seen before. Subaru, that's, enough, it's useless. It won't work. You can't save him anymore. Anything they do would be pointless now. In Subaru's memories, there was nothing about being saved after this attempted suicide. Natsuki Subaru had impulsively plunged a knife into his own throat in rejection of reality, leaving irreparable wounds in the hearts of those around him, while he himself disappeared without feeling the slightest pang on his conscience. Those were the facts. Those two's desperate efforts would come to nothing. Wilhelm, you mustn't die. I absolutely won't let you die. If I lost my benefactor in this way, I could not live with the shame. Ferris, why did he have to pull this stupid stunt now, TCH? Wilhelm shouted, pressing on the wound, and Ferris muttered this agitated complaint, while casting the gentlest magic in this world. This scene, and the ripples of their emotions, went on striking at Subaru's heart. But despite their hopeless efforts, Ferris dash dash. Wilhelm, Felix. Why? Why have you stopped healing? If this goes on. Ferris, it's over, old Will. His soul isn't here anymore. Wilhelm closed in, but Ferris pushed him away. Removing the sword demon's jacket, he took a handkerchief from his pocket and wiped off Subaru's wound. The gash had been perfectly closed, and it was impossible to tell that it had been a fatal injury. Subaru's body had been restored to the same state as several minutes ago, except, Neither the volumes of spilt blood nor his departed soul remained. Looking down at Subaru's pale, lifeless face with the wound wiped away, Wilhelm shook his head. Wilhelm, why? Why did you do this? Why would you? So lightly. Subaru Dono, you were. His fist struck the floor with the sound of a hard crack. Blood mixed into the fractured floorboard as Wilhelm's fist was cut along with it. His knuckles dripping with blood, Wilhelm bit into his lips as if enduring unbearable regret. Directly opposite the clearly emotional Wilhelm, Ferris only looked down at Subaru with a pained expression. 
His cat ears drooped as he gazed at Subaru's unpeaceful expression. Ferris, weakling, coward. You just abandoned everyone important to you, pushed all the pain and all the suffering onto everyone else. Are you satisfied now? It was too severe to be mocking, and too kind to be a condemnation. The complexities of the emotions hidden in Ferris' voice was too far beyond what Subaru's frozen thoughts could comprehend, but it was clear from Wilhelm and Ferris' reactions. That Subaru had done something irreversible to them both. Amelia, dash dash. His thoughts completely stopped. What was he seeing right now? He knew. He already knew what he was being made to see. He was being forced to bear witness to his own sins. Wilhelm, Amelia Summer? Wilhelm suddenly called her name. The astonishment in his voice was because Amelia had suddenly stopped crying, and her collapsed body was no longer trembling. Noticing this change, a touch of pain scraped across Wilhelm's expression. The loss he had just tasted, how much more strongly must it have struck Amelia? This expression was simply because he realized this. The old man firmly closed his eyes, and stood up. Then, he walked over to the fallen Amelia, and extended his hand to help her up. Wilhelm, I must apologize for my actions, Amelia Summer. But it would be harmful to your health to remain like this. Please, take care too. Amelia, he told me. Wilhelm, Amelia Summer? Amelia, even though he told me he loved me. Lying sideways on the floor, hugging her knees, Amelia curled into a ball and screamed. You're being like a child, there was no one here who could chide her for that. Wilhelm furrowed his brows as if enduring his pain, and even Ferris turned away, unable to bear watching Amelia's grief. Ferris, eh? Baffled, Ferris's eyes and mouth opened wide as a dumb noise escaped his throat. As if guided by that voice, Wilhelm followed Ferris' gaze, and was stunned. Wilhelm, dash dash. Before their eyes, Subaru's supposedly deceased body sat up. Subaru, dash dash. Faced with this incomprehensible sight, even Subaru's consciousness was aghast. The risen body stretched out its limbs with the choppy movement of a mechanical doll as it stood up with its head tilted ninety degrees sideways, its eyes slowly opening. Its unfocused gaze, its gleamless eyes, leered over the room. Wilhelm, Feli. Ferris, impossible. His body was definitely dead. The resuscitation failed. Wilhelm called to Ferris as if clinging to the last strand of hope, but Ferris cut him off, shouting back his thoughts. Hearing this, Wilhelm immediately decided on his next action. That is. Wilhelm, Subaru Dono, forgive me. Even the lack of a sword caused no detriment to the sword demon's kill. Wilhelm crouched down to pick up the jacket that was discarded on the floor, twisting it up along with Subaru's blood, and used his entire body to lunge it forward like a lance. Riding on its speed and the added weight of the blood, its tip pierced through the air as a spear of cloth. With what might be called the cloth spear technique, Wilhelm preemptively struck at the rising Subaru. His aim was true, and the point of his jacket seemed about to pierce straight into Subaru's face. Wilhelm, N. When a cascade of shadows surged up from Subaru's feet and swallowed the pointed cloth hole, nullifying Wilhelm's attack. Sighting the shadow that appeared without warning, Wilhelm instantly drew back his arm, but could not completely avoid the damage. Three fingers on his right hand were severed at the joints, taken along with the jacket, flying backwards, dripping with blood, Wilhelm clicked his tongue as he kept his distance from the now standing Subaru. Wilhelm, Felix. Take Amelia Summer away from here, now. I will try to delay it. Ferris, don't even have a sword. All I've got is a dagger. Rolling into a corner of the room, Ferris tossed the dagger at his hips to Wilhelm. Catching it in his left hand, Wilhelm drew it from its sheath with a turn of his wrist and muttered, feels off with short weapons. Wilhelm, get out of the mansion, follow Crush Summer's instructions, no, that won't work now. Felix, use your own judgment. Bring the knights here. Felix, won't it be a bit hard on your own, old Will? Wilhelm, it's something on the level of the white whale, or even. What in the world, 
has been living inside Subaru Dono. Measuring his opponent's strength, Wilhelm held his breath as beads of sweat emerged on his skin. In front of the wary sword demon, Subaru's arms remained dangling at his sides as his gaze swept aimlessly to and fro while his upper body swayed side to side. It was without rational thought. And perhaps, it wasn't even conscious. The question was that despite being in this state, did it have enough awareness to defend itself? Warily, Wilhelm went on glaring at the transformed Subaru. Meanwhile, watching all of this, Subaru's consciousness was caught in a storm of question marks. The situation had clearly changed from what it was before. Being forced to witness his sin while his heart was torn and shattered, Subaru was now watching the absurd progression of the world after his death. What the hell was this supposed to be? Could it have really happened? If not, then what was it supposed to mean? Why was his consciousness here, now? He couldn't understand any of it. None of it made any sense at all, but... Wilhelm, Felix. Take Emilia Summer. Ferris, I got it already. Emilia Summer, come with? Answering Wilhelm's urgings for him hurry, Ferris crossed the room and roughly pulled up the fallen Amelia. But a tremor instantly shook Ferris' expression. The reason, was. Question mark you dare make Leah cry. Birthing a white haze, a small figure descended on the center of the room. With gray fur, and a tail as long as its body, despite being of the size that could fit in one's hand, the pressure it exerted could easily make one mistake it for some great, ferocious beast. Making his long overdue appearance, the tiny great spirit floated in the center of the room, gazing down on Subaru. On his expression was unfathomable severity, and his words were rife with contempt. Puck, as accomplice to the crimes of that body's owner, you are deserving of ten thousand deaths, which... The narrow room was flooded with cold, murderous intent. Exhaling white breaths, Wilhelm's face stiffened as he watched Puck turn that intent into icy spearheads. Wilhelm, spirit. Unless, Emilia Summers. Puck, Leah is unconscious right now. In accordance with the contract, I will act on my own judgment. The witch shall not be forgiven. I shall protect Leah. As for the one who made Leah cry, I shall not forgive this man. Wilhelm, wait. Fighting here now will only. Puck, the oath is broken, and my Leah's heart is frozen. Now, it's time I bring it to an end. Ignoring Wilhelm's protests, Puck's cold intent was steadily rising. White mist filled the room, all was starting to freeze, marking the beginning of the deaths of all things. In a world where even breaths would be frozen, Puck's hostility was directed at Subaru alone. That Subaru's head tilted upwards, looking at Puck for the first time. Its void, blank eyes gazed at the floating Puck, when suddenly, its eyelids twitched. Then. Puck, dash dash. It snickered. Subaru's corpse twisted its face, and snickered at the sight of Puck. Full of malice, contorted beyond recognition, a mocking grin. Subaru, dash do. Watching this unfold, Subaru's consciousness called for its stop before the destined catastrophe. But his call reached nothing. Puck raised his little paw, and when he brought it down, it birthed a small glacier inside the room, its absolute zero threatening to consume Subaru's corpse. Shadows surged up from below to beat back the attack, as a maelstrom of mana ravaged the narrow room, sweeping Wilhelm and Ferris into its nexus before exploding, to screams and wails from frozen, tearing voices, as the world-ending white and blackness of despair intermingled before Subaru's eyes, burying everything. Subaru, dash dash. Abruptly, like the power had been cut, the world lost all color. Subaru, dash poo. The pain of his face smashing into the ground prompted Subaru's consciousness to wake. His jaw crashing against the damp floor, Subaru's eyes teared up at the stinging pain as he shook his head. And, immediately lifting his face, he quickly scanned over his surroundings. Nothing was off. Subaru, Eam. Inside the tomb. Cold air and dark space, the dampness of the floor and the scent of mold and decay, he was definitely inside the tomb. Having confirmed this, 
Subaru opened and closed his hands to check that there was nothing wrong with his limbs. His ragged breathing began to settle, as he exhaled a deep breath from his lungs to force himself to calm. But the tremors of his very organs refused to be chased away. Subaru, a daydream. That'd be too much of a coincidence. But, otherwise. What the hell was that? After being forced to witness that spectacle, Subaru began to assess the situation he had been placed in. First of all, without a doubt, that was a scene after Subaru's death. Amelia's shrieks at the sight of Subaru's corpse, Wilhelm and Ferris' desperate attempts to save him, and the final, nightmarish clash at the end. The first part carved scarring gashes into his heart, while the second part plunged his soul into incomprehensible, uncontrollable bewilderment. Subaru, you, goo. The moment he remembered it, Subaru bent over, holding the wrenching pain in his waist, while the expelled contents of his stomach splashed onto the floor. It would be called vomit, but he hadn't really eaten dinner. All that came out was yellow bile and some tea he had drunk an hour earlier. He could only repeat this vomiting motion to constrict his stomach in answer to his body's demands. It was while repeating this, over and over, that Subaru began to realize the circumstances of his situation. Inside the tomb, if he was not summoned to Ikidona's dream citadel, then there was only one other place his detached consciousness could have been taken. Subaru, unless. That was a trial? Not the past. But the second one? No longer the first trial, where he had to face his past, the second trial had begun. Noticing this possibility, Subaru stood there, stupefied. Indeed, to Subaru, it had been several days since he passed the first trial. But that only applied to his soul, while for this body and for this world, it had only been several hours. In other words, he shouldn't have met the requirements for the next stage of the trials. If the trial had started regardless, then it could only be an irregularity, and more importantly, according to Ikidona. Subaru, she said it wouldn't be as painful as the trial to face my past. If what Subaru saw really was a part of the trial, then even in scratching the surface, he already felt like he was facing the worst possible continuation. That scene, to Subaru, went even further than hell. Subaru had seen hell many times before. He was aware of that. If it meant reaching for the best possible future, then he was prepared to witness as many hells as necessary. But, to go deeper than hell, to know of a world even worse than hell, was. Witness, a present that was not to be. Subaru, dash wh. In the face of that terrifying experience, at a loss as to stay or to retreat, Subaru heard a whisper scraping across his ear. Just as his body tensed from the shock, the sensation of his consciousness slipping once again came visiting. Bracing the fall with his arms, but unable to support himself, he collapsed shoulder first onto the floor. He tried lifting his face in an effort to stay conscious, but neither his eyelids nor his neck could resist that invisible force as he was instantly dragged into the depths of the abyss. The trial, the deepest pit of hell, once again welcomed Subaru. Dash dash. When he opened his eyes, Subaru found himself on a field of grass, at the scene where Julia's sword had cut open his throat, as he was forced to bear witness to his sins once more. ARC 4 The Everlasting Covenant Chapter 71 Ending List From the slit where the blade entered his skin, shallow and sharp, life was leaking out. Fresh, gushing blood dotted the green grass, while Subaru's body reflexively convulsed under the watching, purple-haired youth. Turning up the whites of his eyes, foaming at the mouth, mass volumes of blood spouted from his mouth and neck. Gradually, the intensity of the bleeding waned, until, hearing a sound like a sigh. Dash dash. Subaru clearly understood that his past self had died. It wasn't because his present and past selves shared the same senses. But still, the vivid sensation of his neck being sliced open resounded without end within Subaru's disembodied consciousness, and soul. Julius, Emilia Summer, if you would wipe his. Subaru's face clean. Emilia, dash dash. Julius, he would have wanted you, rather than me, to do this. To have it be your hands. Wiping off his bloodied knight's sword and returning it to its scabbard, 
Julius muttered to the stupefied Emilia. At the feet of the fallen Subaru, lying face up on the ground, the silver-haired girl fell hard onto her knees. Her amethyst eyes were devoid of emotion, refusing to accept reality. Nor did she wipe away the tear trails on her cheeks, glistening in the light. Seeing Amelia like this sent sharp pain gouging into Subaru's non-existent chest. Her grieving expression brought out the punishment Subaru had refused to see, made it bare its fangs, and scoured away the callous approach he had taken up to now. Amelia, Suba, Ru. Her hand slowly crept onto his face, wiping off the blood and spewed contents with her palm. Bare-handed, she did not mind the filth as she did her best to turn Subaru's expression that was twisted in agony into something presentable. And once she finished wiping off the blood. Emilia, why? Why, Subaru? Why did you? A question? Emilia asked this empty question to someone who could never respond. He had neither ears to listen, nor a mouth to answer. Nothing Emilia could say would ever reach the lifeless Subaru again. Dash dash. Watching this from above, Subaru searched his memories for the context of this new scene. It was the second time he battled Petelgeurs, when, unable to resist possession, Subaru's body was destroyed along with that madman. Ferris magic had sent the mana of his body into a frenzy, overloading his vessels and organs, so his death couldn't have been called pretty. Blistering rashes covered his exposed skin, and broken blood vessels had dyed his half-open eyes red. Before being wiped away, the blood from his nose had painted the lower half of his face, and if it weren't for Julius' timely coup de grace, his death would have been even more grotesque. But no matter how neat his death might have been, it would have been no consolation for the ones who remained. Especially those who survived the battle against the White Whale and the final showdown with Sloth, about to set off on their triumphant return to the capital the dejection and regret on all their faces wrenched at his heart. Wilhelm, Subaru Dono. I must beg your forgiveness. Dropping to his knees, Wilhelm lowered his head in front of the lifeless Subaru. Having slain all the witch cultists under Petelgeur's command, Wilhelm's expression took on a bitter taste at the outcome of their battle. Of the old knights of the expedition, some joined in their lamentations with Wilhelm's, while others punched their fists into the ground. There were even some who teared up from their emotions. Subaru fell speechless to see his death so mourned. That was perhaps even more overwhelming than being shown the events after his own death. Amelia, why? Would you go to such lengths to help me? Say, Subaru. Why did you? Setting her hand on the silent Subaru's cheeks, Amelia went on calling with words that would not reach him. Witnessing her grief, it was only now that Subaru realized. In this world, Subaru had never answered Emilia's question. He had never given her his honest answer to the question she asked in the capital, why do you want to help me? And so, Emilia still didn't know the reason behind Subaru's selfless devotion. Though decisively different from the scene he was shown before, both were the results of his irrevocable sins. Julius, the world has long suffered from the witch cult, and we have slain its vanguard. Sloth. To the world, this is a momentous accomplishment. However. Looking down at Subaru's corpse, Julius tapped his finger on the hilt of his sheathed sword, over and over, as the intervals between the taps gradually shortened. Julius, that could not make up for all the sacrifices made to achieve this. I would have liked to speak more with you. Natsuki Subaru. With that pained mutter, Julius turned away from Subaru's lifeless face. The knight looked up to the sky, his eyes harboring a melancholy gloom. Julius, I would have liked to call you friend. By the sound of Julius' exhausted whisper, the world of the grass fields was brought to an end. Again, all fell to black, as the returning Subaru woke with a jolt. Subaru, DGH, Hua, Ah, Ah, Ha, Ha? He found himself writhing on the cold, hard floor. The stench of moss invaded his nostrils as he rolled on the ground, immersed in that senseless act as if to escape from the emotions threatening to sweep up a storm inside him. What on earth is happening? Was not the question on his mind. Tumbling, rolling, his inner ear aching, 
he was straining his lungs gasping for air just so he could divert a little of his awareness away from his thoughts, even if so only a sliver could be plunged into unconsciousness. Subaru, ugh, gah. But even that demeaning attempt to distract himself failed the moment he bounced off a wall. The collision drove pain into his spine, and he could feel blood seeping from his grazed forehead. Drawing gasp after gasp with his face against the floor, before he realized it, tears were streaming from his eyes. Pathetic. Stupid. Hopeless. Just how many times, and to what extent, would Natsuki Subaru have to crumble under his own weakness? And just what would he need to do to acquire that heart of steel that could remain unshaken no matter what transpired, and no matter what pain he would have to endure? He was so weak, so brittle, and that was why Subaru had always. Subaru, pretended not to see it, and averted my gaze. So is this my punishment? There was no way he had never thought of it. In some corner of Subaru's consciousness, more than once, the possibility must have occurred to him. But even so, the thought never rose to the surface, because he was subconsciously refusing to seek and verify the truth. For Subaru, who could return by death, the moment he begins to consider the existence of worlds after his death, his entire strategy would crumble beneath his feet. Everything Natsuki Subaru had hoped to save had left him behind. Or rather, it was Natsuki Subaru who had left them behind. Pathetically and selfishly choosing to embrace death, Subaru had abandoned those worlds in order to escape to new ones. If the worlds left behind by Natsuki Subaru's thoughtless decisions still existed, it would be exactly what he had just been shown. Through death, Subaru had sought relief from hell, and those scenes were what followed. Subaru, can't. B. Before he knew it, his consciousness began to grow distant once more. Unlike sleepiness, here, his consciousness was rapidly turning white as if forcibly being severed from reality. Witness, a present that was not to be. Again, the unrecognizable voice whispered in his ear. Whose voice was it? His fading consciousness was desperately asking, until he realized it. Without the slightest doubt, that voice was his own. In front of the corpse's shattered skull, a young girl was kneeling. Having fallen from such heights, no human flesh could survive the impact without shattering. His black hair, along with the contents of his scalp, were splattered over the ground, blooming into a crimson flower of death. Dash dash. The sensation of his consciousness being switched wasn't surprising any more. He had expected this the moment his awareness was forcibly cut. But what he did not expect was the sight he would be presented with when his consciousness awoke. Question mark spewing nonsense until the very end. When nothing. Can. Fallen to his death, Subaru's body was sprawled out over the ground. Standing beside him, spitting this out, was a girl with peach-colored hair, Ram. Her usually impeccable grooming had been flustered, and visible rips and tears riddled the ends of her maid's uniform. On her face, which she had always consciously kept expressionless, was some unbearably complex and enraged emotion. Rather than regret for Subaru's death, it was closer to fury at this outcome. Ram violently scratched her head, and turned around. Ram, so, was this all according to your designs, Beatrice Summer? You stood in my path just so he could. Beatrice, dash dash. Just as she was setting off her accusation, Ram's face stiffened as she stopped mid-sentence. For reflected in her light pink irises, was Beatrice, kneeling beside Subaru's corpse. Unworried about dirtying her dress, the girl just sat there on the ground, while Ram's gaze wavered, seeing her like this. Ram, Beatrice Summer. Beatrice, why? She softly murmured. Paying no mind to Ram's existence, Beatrice single-mindedly kept her eyes on the dead Subaru. Tears were trailing from the corners of her blue eyes, even Subaru could see it. Beatrice was crying. At Subaru's death. The fact plunged a knife of guilt into Subaru's heart. Feeling the depths of his non-existent eyes heat up from the heart-gouging pain, he wanted to run up to that small, little girl, and say something, anything to her. Yet he lacked the legs, arms, and mouth to do so. Beatrice, you. Aunt, that person. 
I know that. At least. But. Her face devoid of expression, Beatrice whispered as if in a daze while the teardrops continued to fall. Before that heartrending figure, Ram gave up trying to say anything further. She exhaled a sigh, and turned her scornful eyes towards Subaru's corpse, and its neck, bent upwards at an outrageous angle. Ram, what nonsense. Love us, you're truly beyond saving. Witness, a present that was not to be. As if the very air was being frozen, a white, misty cold presided over the world, the frozen forest broke apart at every gust of wind, and, unable to maintain their existence in this mana-starved environment, all was returning to dust. The trees, the streets, the creatures, and the world all fell to white, crystalline particles in the sweeping gale, as the white end slowly consumed the earth. Dash dash. This time, Subaru was witnessing the ending of the world. Mirroring the white void that was his consciousness, the world awaited its cold and merciful end. Except. Question mark so, you've come. The somber voice, quaking the atmosphere as it bellowed, was one of agreement. Immediately, followed the deafening boom of earth-shaking tremor as the impact of the behemoth's fall reshaped the landscape. Trees snapped and toppled, shattering upon each other like icicles as the forest was wiped into flat, barren land. The one that flattened the frozen forest was an enormous, four-legged, almost feline creature coated in grey fur. Half of the beast's overflowing teeth were broken, while white mists escaped the gaps between its sword-like fangs, collapsed onto its side, its radiant, golden irises turned to look at something in front of it. And, with trembling, almost convulsing motions. Beast, a shame. I knew this would happen, and yet I couldn't change a thing. Question mark I've more or less grasped what had transpired. Indeed, it is regrettable. The beast spoke, not to lament its defeat, but simply in knowing acceptance of the truth. And, it was a strikingly clear and elegant voice that replied. In a world that was ending, that voice did not suffer the slightest loss of vitality or strength. Standing tall and straight, with red hair fluttering in the ivory wind, was a blue-eyed youth. Youth, Emilia Summer and Subaru are no longer in this world, I take it? Beast, Leah is sleeping, eternally. A world without that child has no reason to exist. And I, having failed to protect that child, am just as guilty as that man. Youth, so for that reason, you would destroy the world? Beast, I knew that I would be obstructed, but doing so was my oath. Unsheathed from its dragon talon scabbard, the glinting steel was pointed at the beast's snout, at Puck, in his true form, while, wielding it, the sword Saint Reinhard quietly shook his head. Harbored within his sapphire eyes, was a deep, and compassionate sorrow. Reinhard, I understand your regret. And I feel the same. But that does not mean you may ruthlessly vent that regret upon this land. Your actions, and your oath would bring chaos to this world. And I shall never permit it. Puck, because that would be unjust? Reinhard, yes, because that would be unjust. I am the exemplar of justice. The sword to rectify error. And thus, I shall slay you here. Great Spirit Summer. Despite their overwhelming disparity in mass, which side the balance of power favored was too plain to see. Even Puck, in his true form, failing to mar Reinhard's unfazed expression, was on his dying breaths. By simply drawing a silver arc with the point of his outstretched sword, Reinhard's blade would carve the spirit's existence in two, expelling an outward surge of his swordmanship aura. Reinhard was loudly proclaiming this fact. Puck, K.H. The sound led Reinhard to furrow his brows. Even Subaru's disembodied consciousness felt something akin to confusion in his scant emotions. Brief and intermittent, it was difficult to make out what that sound may be. Difficult, simply because it was so hard to believe that it was precisely what it sounded like. Puck, K.H., care, ha ha, ha ha ha. Reinhard, what's so funny? With his throat trembling, and on the verge of death, Puck's face twisted as he burst into laughter. Even with his life and death in another's hands, and having had his actions impeded, Puck was laughing. 
Unable to fathom his meaning, Reinhard asked this question. But Puck only seemed to find his reaction even more hilarious. Puck, what's so funny? It's funny, of course it's funny. Reinhard, you. No, what would this upstart possibly know? Reinhard. Puck, I remember now, how it was meant to be. It took me long enough to understand it. And, having understood, when I saw how you still don't know, it's so funny I couldn't help myself. There was something different about the tone and volume of that statement that was completely unlike Puck. For Subaru, who had plenty of memories of seeing Puck in his cat form, this was the first time he had heard such malice in his words. This was different from his loathing towards Subaru and Petal Jers after Emilia was killed. At that time, Puck was still Puck. This time, the laughter directed at Reinhard was nothing like what he had ever seen from Puck before, but something else entirely. Reinhard, I will make sure that there are no more casualties. If you want someone to hate, then hate me. Puck, I don't hate you, Reinhard. You are a hero. And a hero has a hero's role to fill. I don't resent or fault you for following your creed. Reinhard, dash dash. Puck, you are a hero, Reinhard. A hero is all you will ever be. At the end of the end, he uttered the most spiteful remark of them all. With the fall of the last syllable, Reinhard lifted his sword over his head, and in a single flash of his swordsmanship, from the glint of his blade's edge an intense heat shot out. Cleaving through the air, piercing the atmosphere and shattering the earth, the maelstrom of upswept mana severed everything along the line of the swung-out blade, and, as the light settled, the world parted before Subaru's disembodied eyes. Reinhard, dash dash. At the close of the torrential sword's slash, the world that was covered in the white, encompassing cold was born anew. The parted world was mended, as the spiral of mana faded into a ring, returning to the atmosphere. From the shattered earth, flowers budded and bloomed. The pierced through air was imbued with warmth, as sunlight peered from the severed sky. The sword saints strike simultaneously brought about the world's end as well as its rebirth. While the colossal beast that was rent by that strike vanished without a trace, indisputably present only moments ago, the enormous body was gone, and no indication of its destruction remained. Dash dash. With a shrill ring, Reinhard returned his knight's sword to its scabbard. The wind caressing the bangs of his red hair, Reinhard squinted his eyes as he looked up to the sky while spilling an all but inaudible sigh. Reinhard, felt summer will surely be saddened. He whispered, closing his eyes. Witness, a present that was not to be. Witness, a present that was not to be. ARC 4 The Everlasting Covenant Interlude I, Tea Party Question mark Parallel Universes that's one school of thought. It states that, separate from the universe we are living in now, there exists many alternate universes following along a similar path. The person speaking was trying her best to suppress the waves of excitement in her voice. Accompanying that lecture-like statement, she was lightly tapping her fingers on the table in a pleasant and even rhythm. Question mark that sounds, who? Like it's, ha. Kind of complicated. Question mark it's not that hard to wrap your head around. Imagine infinite parallel worlds, each being generated by just one difference in choice. For example, say there is a split in the road on your way home. Both paths ultimately lead to your house, and there is a you who went right and a you who went left, that possibility would already constitute an extremely small-scale parallel universe. Question mark what? So you're saying that there are so many worlds out there that we can't even count them? That's just stupid. Hearing the response to the lethargic voice, a spirited voice butted in. The lecturing speaker returned a wry smile, and raised a finger in front of her impatient companion. Question mark it's not nearly so ridiculous. Indeed, that last example may have been too narrow to convey the sheer scope of the variations. But you can definitely apply it to a grander scale as well. Question mark grander scale. Like what? Question mark let's see, right. Imagine if you had abandoned the isolated elven vanguard on Boroid Plains, what would have happened then? 
Question mark dash dash. Question mark him. I was expecting you to be more infuriated by that. Question mark it's simple why I'm not angry. Even if you repeat that situation tens, hundreds, or thousands of times, I would always have chosen to throw my fists into the fray. So your parallel universe or whatever would never have come to be. With that forceful proclamation, the speaker threw her foot right onto the table. Seeing her literally putting her foot down on the matter, the lecturer let slip a small smile. Noticing this, the spirited one angrily scowled up her pretty face. Question mark what's so funny? Question mark no, I mean that was very manly of you, but your panties are showing, Minerva. Minerva, a.a., Kea. What, you dumbass? Unbelievable. Idiot. Dumbass. Dumbass. Blockhead. Stupid. So stupid. You stupid, dumbass. Shouting curses that exposed the limits of her vocabulary, the blonde-haired girl, which of wrath, Minerva, pulled her foot off the table with tears in her eyes, quickly closing her legs and holding down her skirt with her hands. She looked up furiously, at the white-haired witch sitting opposite her. But. Question mark ha. Leaving aside who's right or wrong here, who. Your panties. Ha. You kind of did that to yourself, Minerva, always so unladylike, who. No point blaming anyone else for it. Ha. Minerva, unladylike. Like you're one to say that, Sekhmet. As if you ever wear anything other than that. Actually, when's the last time you changed your robes? Minerva swiped her harsh glare onto the Witch of Sloth, Sekhmet, plopped on the table, completely buried in her long, magenta hair. Under that sea of hair, a head moved and peeked out between the gaps, looking back at Minerva. Sekhmet, you just throw it over your head, who, it's the most convenient, ha. Typhon wipes my body for me, who, so it's not like I get filthy or anything, ha. Minerva, you go criticizing other people's behavior when you. Or, 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 what do you want? So I'm to blame? It's all my fault? You want me to beat you clean here? Minerva angrily waved her fist about, while Sekhmet turned her head away without saying a word. Seeing Sekhmet lose even the energy to speak, a blue vein popped up on Minerva's forehead, but, as if having grown used to her temper, Sekhmet already completely lost interest. Taking over for the spent Witch of Sloth, the first witch, the Witch of Greed, Echidona, clapped her hands together and carried on the conversation. Echidona, I do understand your anger, but as much as I find it delightful, I would like to continue on our topic now. Minerva, HRRMPH. You're the one provoking me with all that parallel world's rubbish, Echidona. I'm angry. I'm enraged. I'm furious. Echidona, right right. Now, on with parallel universes. If that last example didn't stick. Let's see. What do you think would have happened if Flugel never sealed the pact with Volcanica? Holding a finger to her lips, Echidona mischievously smiled, as she raised this question to Minerva. Minerva swallowed her breath and narrowed her blue eyes. Minerva, if Volcanica and Flugel never sealed their pact, Reed couldn't have stopped her by himself. And the world would have been swallowed. Echidona, if it had been swallowed, what then, I wonder, of all the world, only the Witch of Envy would remain. Perhaps, a parallel universe in which this is the case even exists. And, if it does, won't you find it incredibly interesting? Minerva, your eyes always get so gross whenever you talk about her, Echidona. I'm really not that mad at her. I just can't share your wrath on that one. Echidona, well, that's one way to approach it, I suppose. Your wrath is the delightful kind. That's why you were the most lovable of all the witches. Echidona said in past tense, while Minerva looked away with a small snort and crossed her arms, emphasizing her abundant breasts with a jolt of her back. Minerva, I'm not looking to be loved. All I want is for conflict to be wiped from this world, for all the suffering, grief, and cries and wails of pain to be exterminated by my fists. I don't need anything else on my path. My rage, my wrath, and my healing fists, are my everything. 
Minerva proclaimed her life's purpose without a shadow of a doubt, without reserve or hesitation, it was conviction from which nothing could lead her astray. Truly, this was wrath, directed at the world, an inexhaustible fury forming the roots of her existence from which all else was built. Question mark well, you're free to say, that as you want Tilda. But you get so happy when people praise you you can't help but grin so big Tilda, that's what's so cute about you, Neru Neru. Dragging the ends of her sentences, a rather dopey voice cut into the conversation. It came from opposite Sekhmet, and from Minerva's left. Question mark Neru Neru Tilda, you really are witch tear when it comes to not being honest with your feelings Tilda. I like that about you so much I just want to eat it. Minerva, shut up, Daphne. You were sleeping until now, why did you have to wake up all of a sudden? Daphne, but I've been awake ever since Nero Nero made a ruckus and started flashing your undies. You go around wearing a tiny skirt that flies up whenever you move, and still you wear those flashy undies Tilda, TSK TSK Tilda, Nero Nero. Minerva, why you're one to talk? You're younger than me, and yours are simply obscene. The hell is that? That's not underwear, that's a string, dumbass. What are you, a dumbass? Stupid dumbass. Seriously, you're just a hopeless dumbass, you know that? Dumbass dumbass. Red in the face and teary-eyed from emotion, Minerva squeaked back, while the one happily ignoring her would be the witch of gluttony, Daphne. With her body completely restrained and her eyes covered by criss-crossing blindfolds, her small body was settled inside a strange black coffin. Though this thing was just casually hanging out at the table like it was natural, to an outsider, this tea party must have seemed utterly surreal. Running out of insults to throw at Daphne, though it was just saying dumbass over and over, Minerva plopped back into her chair, buried her face in her palms, and slumped over the table. Minerva, what's the what's the what's these? Like, is this supposed to be my fault? It's not like I'm doing it to get praised, but of course you're gonna be happy when someone praises you. When someone says thank you, of course you're gonna think I'm so glad I did that. Is that so wrong? Am I in the wrong here? I want to heal everyone but I want to be healed too. Echidona the fact that you didn't explode into a state of self-abandon just now is just a part of your charm, I suppose, now. Leaving aside Minerva, who had checked out of the conversation by sinking into a sea of her own brooding, Echidona set her sights on Daphne. With both eyes covered, Daphne shouldn't have been able to sense Echidona's gaze, but her small nose nonetheless twitched adorably with a few little sniffs. Daphne, Donia Donia, what are you staring at Daphne for Tilda? Unlike Nero Nero and Met Met Tilda, Daphne can't stand a whole conversation with you, you know Tilda. Besides, ha! Ha Tilda! I'm already running out of calories. Echidona, there's nothing more foolish than asking cooperation from a witch. I've already learned that far too well while I was alive. But I never thought this conversation would go this badly, you've all outdone yourselves, I almost want to congratulate you. Mumbling this, Echidona lifted her right hand and gave her fingers a snap. Instantly, a steaming cup of tea, and a plate full of cookies appeared in front of Daphne. Her blindfolded eyes widening, Daphne immediately lit up at the appearance of food. Echidona, of course, I don't intend to keep you waiting, so if you want to eat before. Daphne, gafugafu omu omu machamachu. Echidona, forget I said anything. Though I'd rather hoped you would practice better table manners. Echidona shrugged, while in front of her, Daphne threw her whole upper body onto the table as she ate. Quite literally, she was putting her whole body into it. Even though she was making eating noises with her mouth, the tea and pastries were sucked in directly upon contact with her skin. The offered tea and pastries, along with the pottery ware, all disappeared inside Daphne, instantly becoming gluttony's feed. Daphne, triple underscore A tilde, so tasty tilde, so sweet tilde, oh tilde, sorry tilde. I went a little overboard and gobbled the table too. Echidona, don't worry about it, or well, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, but I more or less realized this would happen the moment I invited you. Other than please be more careful, I've nothing more to ask of you. Daphne, Donia Donia Tilda, 
Would you tell birds not to fly and fishes not to swim too tilde? Hearing Daphne's roundabout refusal, Ikidona sighed, while, having finished her treat, Daphne wriggled her body and continued with, All right tilde. Daphne, my tummy's got food in it tilde, so I'll keep Donia Donia company a bit longer tilde. You were saying something about parallel universes tilde? Ikidona, that's right. Daphne, do you have any thoughts on it? Daphne, I don't really think anything tilde. What if this and this tilde, then maybe that and that tilde, my tummy won't be filled even if I think about it tilde. Ha, huh, but if it's a split about whether I'll eat meat tonight or fish tonight tilde, then maybe it won't be so silly to think about. Echidona, in your case, Daphne, there's nothing to complain about in terms of comprehension. Looks like it's just a matter of capturing your interest. That's also to be expected, I guess. Out of all the witches, Daphne's temperament could be considered mild. The problem was that her very existence was a calamity to other living things, and, regardless of temperament, this vicious constitution made her hopelessly unsuited for coexistence with others. Sekhmet, so in the end. Ha! Even if we speculate about parallel worlds, who? It's completely useless, ha! Isn't it? Who? The one inserting this unprogressive comment into the conversation was the Witch of Sloth, still entirely slumped over the table, blanketed in her own long hair, she looked at the onlooking Ikidona, and then at the onsmelling Daphne. Sekhmet, even if you accept this school of thought and the existence of these branching worlds, ha! There's no way to really know or experience it for yourself, who? So then, they'll only be bubbles of unreachable possibilities, ha! Ones that'll pop and vanish the moment you touch them, who? Echidona, indeed, from a realistic perspective, it is as you say. Even if we are aware of the existence of parallel worlds, they could not be observed. Parallel, is truly an apt description. Two lines, never to meet, parallel worlds, would mean different worlds extending in parallel. Minerva, dash, but, that's not the case for the second trial, right? As Ikidona summarized Sekhmet's argument, her conclusion was finished off by Minerva's thorny interruption. Minerva's lovely face was dyed red with fury. Minerva, if Ikidona's going out of her way to talk about it, it must be heading somewhere mean, right? Caught you out, didn't I must feel like I jabbed you where it hurts, doesn't it? If you don't want to be found out, then don't do something that you'd want to hide. Ikidona, I didn't even say it and you're already mad at me. I'd feel troubled too, you know. But well, it's true that I can't deny it. After all, that's how the second trial was supposed to work. Watching Minerva punch a dent into the table, Ikidona lightly reached out, as a book with black binding appeared in her hand. This was Ikidona's book of forbidden knowledge which held the world's past, present, and future, the memories of the world. If the incarnation of the thirst for knowledge, Ikidona, ever felt like it, she could access any information, knowledge, or history within this world. But, out of personal preference, she seemed to feel an aversion to using the power of this forbidden tome. Echidona, the second trial reads into the challenger's heart, and finds every crossroad he had passed, one could also call it regret. The memories of the world recreates the different choices he might have made, as presents that were not to be. In its very nature, Compared to the first trial of facing one's past, and the third trial of overcoming one's future, the second trial is somewhat easier to pass. Minerva, easier to pass, what do you mean? Echidona, it's a question of whether one could see the world as Daphne does. As Sekhmet said, so-called parallel worlds would ultimately remain separated, untouchable lines never to meet. Regardless of regret, or longing, they could never be reached. Minerva, and here your trial is shoving those lines right in people's faces. Seeing Minerva turn up the ends of her eyes in annoyance, Ikidona lightly shrugged. She brushed her hand through her own white hair, and said, as if to calm the now standing Minerva. Ikidona, to the common person, the second trial is indeed easier to pass. Compared to having to overcome a past that actually happened, the second trial merely touches on possibilities of what could be. It is each person's freedom to accept or deny it. And all one has to do is to accept the present, 
actual world. Minerva, the actual world. Echidona, and we are back to the question of perspective. Sekhmet, Daphne, or even you could easily find the solution. If you could do that, then you would pass the trial. Listening to Echidona's explanation, Minerva gave a begrudgingly nod. Indeed, if it was as Echidona said, then the trial isn't as harsh as she thought. For all the witches present, or even just for anyone with a clear sense of self-identity, it should be easy to pass that trial. Daphne, if so Tilda, then why Tilda, is Saberun having such a hard time with it Tilda? Saberun doesn't look like a child with no sense of identity. Echidona, in his case. Hmm. Recalling Subaru in her memories, for some reason, Daphne started making a chewing motion with her mouth. Overlooking this behavior, Echidona closed her eyes to ponder on her words. Echidona, the second trial is an observation of parallel worlds. In a sense, it is an act of witnessing the implications of one's regrets. Like I said, it is easy to accept or deny it. In fact, one would only have to rationalize it by noting that reality never progressed this way. But, Echidona continued. Echidona, only in his case, this wouldn't apply. It was even a surprise to me that the second trial hit him this hard. Truly, unexpected. Daphne, sniff sniff Tilda. I could smell you grinning with joy, Donia Donia. Minerva, she gets happy whenever she sees something she couldn't predict, I bet. Nasty pervert. Just hopeless. Echidona, birds of a feather. Since you are all my friends, you aren't exempt from that, either. Daphne chuckled while Minerva puffed with rage, and, if one listened carefully, one could hear snoring coming from Sekhmet's general direction. Taking each of these witches' reactions into her eyes, Echidona rocked in her chair, when... Question mark Donia Tilda, Typhon's hungry too. Running up from the meadow with little steps was a little girl, as if to leap onto the table on the hill, she called out to Echidona. With green hair and auburn skin, and her white teeth beaming in her smile, it was the Witch of Pride, Typhon. Seeing the girl who had avoided getting involved in the tricky conversation and had instead passed her time playing in the meadow, Echidona smiled back. Echidona, sorry for boring you. Now for Typhon's tea. Should I make it extra sweet? And do you want your regular treats? Typhon, anything's good Tilda. Running around a lot took up all my strength, I want drink and eat and rest now. Saying this with incredible energy, Typhon pulled out an empty chair next to Sekhmet and hopped onto it. Then, with one hand playing with Sekhmet's long hair, she used the other to stuff her face with treats Echidona had made appear with a snap of her fingers, spraying crumbs all over the table. This scene might just bring out a smile onto the face of someone who was ignorant of Typhon's nature. Echidona, you must be tired too, from looking after Typhon? Question mark th. That's not, true, though. T. Typhon's a good girl, and, her powers. Also, wouldn't, work. On, me, you know. S. So, it's fine. I'm, doing just fine. Looking up at Echidona from her side, the one who arrived at the tea party one step behind Typhon gave this stuttering reply with a weak smile rising on her face. With her pink hair reaching down to her waists, the girl gave off a shockingly ephemeral vibe. Though there was nothing outstanding about her features, for some reason, she just naturally attracted one's gaze. More than anything, like a small animal, the impressions of her expressions and bearing tugged powerfully on one's heartstrings. Echidona, take a seat, Camilla. I've called you here for a reason. Camilla, I is, something, street, starting? It, whoa, won't be scary. Echidona, it won't scare you or hurt you. I just, need your help to get the pieces moving. Sitting down next to her, Camilla, the Witch of Lust, timidly looked back at Echidona. Echidona gave her a smile, and lively flung out her arms. Echidona, with your love, I wish to rescue a poor lost lamb. Echidona said in the trembling voice of a witch, and offered her her outstretched arms. ARC 4 The Everlasting Covenant Chapter 72, Bad End 1, 5, 
11. How many times does my heart have to break before I can be forgiven? Question mark and it's already over. This job really wasn't worth taking. In a dark warehouse, gazing down on the three corpses submerged in an ocean of blood, a black-robed beauty slightly tilted her head. Even in this blood-suffused scene, the absurdity of her skill ensured that she wasn't touched by a single drop, while the abnormality of her mind was such that she remained utterly unfazed by this carnage. Without a doubt, this was what they'd call a monster in human skin. Stepping across the floor soaked in blood, the monster looked over the fallen corpses with interest. A giant old man with one arm severed at the shoulder and profuse blood draining down his head. A black-haired youth with a perfect line sliced across his stomach, having died writhing as his intestines spilled out. And, a silver-haired girl, slashed in two from her left shoulder to her right waist. How many times had he struggled and fought just so he wouldn't have to witness this scene? Question mark in terms of the outcome of the assignment, this is as bad as it gets. Now just what is all this, I wonder. Holding a finger to her red lips, the monster casually made this awfully out of place mutter. Dangling in her other hand, was a sinister, bloody, crooked blade, her cookery knife, swaying the weapon that had just stolen three, no, four separate lives in this loot house, the monster named Elsa let out a splendid smile. Elsa, Aya. Elsa tilted her head, and lightly leapt backward. Immediately, a blade of ice stabbed into the floor where Elsa had been standing. A sequence of icy spears followed, pursuing Elsa's steps with shearing, biting fangs. Elsa, now this is. Question mark how, dare you? Before the evading Elsa, dim specks of light gathered in the empty space as the figure of a small spirit took shape. The floating cat spirit, Puck's expression was perilous, while his androgynous voice was trembling with rage. Puck, you shall regret taking Leah's life. Elsa, ah, so the girl. Was a spirit's arts user. Marvelous. I've never opened a spirit's stomach before. Though. Facing the battle-ready Puck surrounded by floating ice lances, Elsa's expression reveled in the premonition of battle. But, before raising her guard, she squinted a single eye. Elsa, why didn't you show up before that child died? Spirits and spirit arts users should be teams of two, it's a shame if I can't enjoy the full experience. Puck, shut it with your drivel, murderer. If I weren't bound by my contract, I... Puck shook his head with an expression twisted in vexation. He bared his fang, pointing his little arm at Elsa. Puck, I have no intention to chat. I will freeze you, and lay Leah's soul to rest. After you, the kingdom, the world, then the dragon and the witch. Everything. Elsa, Hartilda, marvelous, I'll be enjoying this. Elsa leapt, crawling along the walls and ceiling like a spider. With her slender frame as the target, icicles shot forth in quick succession, piercing the walls of the loot house and freezing the atmosphere, as its shrill shrieks rang through the air. All vision clouded over with white, until nothing could be seen. Not the incidentally intertwined fingers on the floor, nor Subaru and Emilia's corpses. Nothing. How many times do I have to be betrayed by this world before I can be rewarded? Rem, I was merely preventing the situation from getting any worse. By the time I found him, Subaru Kun's state was already beyond saving. He would have wished to be put down immediately. Emilia, and, so. That's what that. Horrible end, was. Is that what you are saying? Rem? Subaru was my benefactor, and there was so much we would have liked to talk about. And you? He heard the quarreling words of his two beloved girls. One voice called out within Subaru both immense adoration and insurmountable grief. And the other voice, when he stood in the face of adversity, how many times, how clingingly, how imploringly, and how sweetly, had he wished to be touched by that voice. The blue-haired girl and the silver-haired girl faced each other, as a turbulent atmosphere flowed throughout the room. The place was the lounge in the mansion, the two were seated on either side of the table, and the situation was set to explode. Roswell, we tilde LL now, Emilia Summer mustn't get carried away, either. Phi tilde ISD of all, 
we should he tilde our what rems har tilde s to say, no? Amelia, Roswell. Do you understand what has happened here? Rem. Your servant, has caused the. D. Death. Of my benefactor. And your guest. Subaru. Roswell, O oh, tilde f course I understand. Thar tilde t is why I'm. Making sure we keep the conversation in line. We mustn't let any misunderstandings get in the way of our mutual fey eelings. Roswell narrowed his yellow eye as he replied. Then, the clown turned his gaze towards Rem, seated beside him. Sensing his gaze, Rem nodded. Rem, late last night in the east wing. There was an intruder on Emilia Summer's level. Alerted to this by the alarm gems, Rem immediately went to the scene, and that's when I found Subaru Kun crawling on the floor. Ram, Barusu was already under the curse's effects by then. Rem, yes, it is as Big Sister Summer said. Subaru Kun was weakened to the verge of death. The curse's effects had sapped his life force to its absolute limit, and I determined that saving him was impossible. Emilia, and so you crushed him to death with your flail. That only added to his suffering. Ram, Emilia Summer. Holding Rem's hand at her side, Ram shot a harsh glare towards Emilia, but Emilia's sharp, unrelenting gaze remained locked onto Rem. Emilia, the facts are facts, Subaru's body, his arm, and his head. If you wanted to put him out of his misery, there should have been a gentler way. Instead, why did you? Rem, that's, because. Emilia. Rem couldn't answer Emilia's question. She did not say anything further, perhaps because her personality was not one for telling lies, and Emilia's words had struck the core of her true motives. Rem had harbored intense distrust towards Subaru back then. After the second round of the loops in the mansion, having failed to conceal Subaru's corpse after crushing him to death in the hallway, events led to this current discussion here. Subaru's friendly interaction with Ram must have only further inflamed her hostility, to the point where she could no longer resist her murderous intent. Just what was she thinking when she swung her iron flail towards Subaru in the upper floors of the mansion? Perhaps even Rem didn't know this herself. Emilia, it was a slip of the hand. Or because you hesitated. Those were the answers I wanted to hear. Rem, dash HG. With closed eyes, Emilia sadly murmured as Rem's face shot up. It was unclear how much of Rem's true feelings Emilia had grasped when she said those words. And it would always, forever remain unclear. Roswell, Emilia Summer, where are you going? Seeing Emilia stand up, patting off the hems of her skirt, Roswell's expression vanished as he asked her this question. Hearing it, Emilia brushed her hand over her long, silver hair. Emilia, I'm leaving. It has only been a short while, but thank you for your hospitality. Without your backing, I would not have been able to participate in the royal selection. But. I cannot trust you any more. Roswell, even if you don't trust us, surely our relationship of mutual utilization would still be beneficial, don't you think? Forfeiting your place for the sake of a tantrum couldn't be called a wise decision. Emilia, tantrum? Hearing Roswell's remark, Amelia stopped in place as her expression stiffened in shock. Then, she promptly turned her steps towards Roswell, and... Roswell, dash dash. No one could have stopped the crisp sound from ringing out. Her white fingers slapped hard across Roswell's blue-white cheek. In front of the reddened, swelling cheek, the single slap already left Amelia out of breath. The one who had been slapped made no reaction but instead held Ram back as she was about to stand with her changed complexion. Roswell, Ram. Ram, but, Roswell Summer. Roswell, it's fine. You can stay seated. Emilia Summer, my apologies for Ram. Emilia, you're always like this with me. But when it's Subaru, you won't even say a thing. Biting her lip, Emilia glared at the collected Roswell. But despite the furious rage churning in her amethyst eyes, Roswell never lost his composure for an instant. This was only a testament to their irreconcilable standpoints. Roswell, once you leave the mansion, and return to the forest, what will you have left? 
Amelia, I was wrong to have been taken along by your beguiling words. My atonement. My penance will come in many other forms. It was because of my mistake. That Subaru died. Amelia closed her eyes, and quietly answered Roswell's question. Then, with a slight shake of her head. Amelia, I will bring his soul with me, and lay him to rest in the forest. For Subaru, and the others, for as long it takes, I will devote my time to tend to their souls. That is all I will say. With this, Amelia backed away from Roswell, indicating that she had no intention to continue the conversation. Her silver hair swayed as she turned her back, while Roswell watched on with his mismatched eyes. Still seated in his chair, he reached out his hand towards the leaving figure, but put it down again. Roswell, if it has deviated from the writ, then. This is where my pa th ends. Ram, Roswell Summer. Hearing Roswell's powerless whisper, Ram spilled a voice of concern as she took his hand. The clown glanced back at the girl's worried gaze, while a weak smile rose onto his face. Roswell, Ram, it seems you've won the wager. Here is where my purpose reaches a standstill. That is to say, the contract can now be fulfilled. Ram, yes. Yes, Roswell Summer. Leaving the two to their quiet exchange, Amelia proceeded toward Rem, who had stood up to open the door. Before passing her by, she looked to her solemnly bowed head. Amelia, take me to where Subaru is. Rem, Amelia Summer, that would be. Amelia, he's in an awful state, I know. I will restore him as much as I can. And take him with me. To the forest. Watching the side of Amelia's grief-stricken face, Rem's expression stiffened as she lowered her head. Within that expression was something like regret, as well as something like anger. Why did it have to turn out like this, she must have been wondering. Why did it turn out like this? No one knew the answer. Amelia, I'm sorry, Subaru, I couldn't do anything at all. Amelia whispered at the very end. How many times do I have to be hit with my own stupidity before I can understand? Question mark desu, desu. Desu 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 desu, desu. The shrill, deafening cackle echoed on, chest pumped, mouth stretched wide, drooling from the lips and mussing her long, red hair, a young woman was howling. This woman's abhorrent behavior, her bloodshot, gawking eyes, and the deranged posture she had taken were nothing like those of a human. Woman for love. To love. In love. By love. The repayment of love is. Everything. Desu. Ah. O oh witch. O oh beloved witch. Destined harbor of my love. Falling to her knees, with both hands stretched to the sky and tears streaming from her eyes, the woman extolled her love. All around the crazed woman, were submerged corpses scattered in an ocean of blood. Limbs torn apart, heads gouged open, lay countless cadavers stripped of human dignity. In their midst, was the body of a black-haired youth, his throat pierced by his own sword. Blood drowned every corner of our lamb village, as every member of the expedition lay upon the ground, deprived of the last sign of life. The moment their most powerful asset, the sword demon, fell in the ambush, the tide was already set, the rest was a massacre by the unseen hands, an uninterrupted chain of death wails until the last of them met their end. Woman, behold my diligence. What could this cleansing of sloth be called, if not a testament of my love? Desu. Ah. My adoration, my faith, my unshakable love. Receive it. Accept it. May it nestle within your embrace, Desu. Decrying her love, tears pouring, the woman barked amid the sea of blood, her flesh stolen, her mind invaded by the monster, Petelger's Roman A. Conti. After wiping out Subaru's rescue party in one fell swoop, despite the loss of his cultists, the madman went on proclaiming his love. When? Question mark what? Happened? A winded girl muttered as she ran down the path trailing from the village. Impatiently wiping aside the silver hair sticking to her forehead, she scanned her amethyst eyes over the carnage. Amelia's eyes widened at the villagers submerged in the ocean of blood, and noticed it. Amelia, Suba. Rue? 
Lying in the center of the carnage, was a youth she had known well. Just what emotion flashed through her mind in that instant? The feelings in those widened eyes were far too complex, such that no one, not even herself, could have understood it. Only, Emilia's lips trembled, as she. Emilia, why, is. Subaru, sleeping th. Huh? Puck, Leah. This is bad, it's the witch cult. A sin arch. Why, why now? Emilia's expression was stunned, and one not accepting reality. In her stead, Puck flew out in a terribly panicked state. Flying circles around Emilia while fixing his glare on Petelgeurs, standing alone in that carnage, his black round eyes were rife with alarm and hostility. Puck, Leah. Now, right now. Get away from here now. That thing. You mustn't meet with the Sin Archbishop. The trial will begin. If it gets imposed on you, it will be horrible. Emilia, Puck. Puck, I just remembered, I finally remembered. That bastard. Meeting that bastard finally made me remember. Why did I forget? And there are so many things I still can't recall. Unless, I can't remember until things become like this. But if so, then. Facing towards the sky, Puck stretched out his little body as far as it would go, and screamed, Puck, that's not what you said, Ikidona. Loaded with frustration and loathing, the shout echoed out as Puck panted, shaking his head. All the while, Emilia fell speechless in front of her utterly changed companion. Having heard the scream, the madman slowly stood upright. Petelgeurs, well well. How pleased to meet you. Desu. Slanting his upper body, Petelgeurs violently yanked at his long red hair, mercilessly pulling as blood began seeping out of his scalp. Watching this act of self-injury, horror and disgust flickered across Emilia's eyes. Petelgeurs, I am which cult sin archbishop, sloth, Petelgeurs Romane Conti. Desu. The madman cackled, his voice quaking the atmosphere. Just like this, the howling madman slanted his body as he observed the petrified Emilia from head to toe then to her upper body, practically licking her all over with his gaze. Petelgeurs, in, credible, Desu. He spilled this sigh of wonder. A crisp peal of a clap. Petelgeurs was clapping, directing his applause at Emilia. Petelgeurs, incredible, Desu. A figure so perfect for a vessel. A visage so reminiscent of the witch in life. Since you've prepared such a magnificent vessel, there is no more need for debate. Desu. The trial. The trial to determine whether the witch gene shall take root. Puck, silence, madman. You take one step towards that child. And I will make you regret ever being born. Utterly. Petelgeurs, in the face of love, pain and fear are all offerings for the sacrifice. Nothing you say would give me reason to stop, Desu. Puck met Petelgeurs's raving with a threat, but the madman didn't seem to mind. Dragging its steps along the ground, it slowly approached, while Puck only seemed to tremble, unable to do a thing. Puck, W-H, why, why, does this have to be the moment when I... No, that's wrong. I remember now. That's wrong. Yes, that's wrong, that's wrong. That's wrong. I'm. I. Am. Amelia. Puck. W.H. What should I. What should I do? Eam. And Subaru. Over there he's. Petelgeurs. The trial. The terminus of this diligent soul is selected Desu. An occupied vessel would interfere with the injected soul Desu. The contents are unneeded Desu. Amelia desperately called to Puck who was hugging his head, while Petelgeurs went on towards the bewildered pair without stopping. Watching Petelgeurs making strange motions with his fingers and licking his lips, blaring alarms sounded inside Emilia without end. At the sight of his deranged eyes, Emilia gasped, and, in a choking voice, Emilia, no, I'm scared, Daddy, H. She whimpered, pleading for someone to rely on. Seeking help in a voice of quiet that no one could have heard it. Petelgeurs completely ignored this as he extended his hand towards Amelia. Surely, beyond that hand, 
would be the invisible authority of Sloth, the unseen hand. It would be reaching to bind Amelia's petrified body, to enact its evil designs. Puck, get your filthy hands away from my daughter. The next moment, a wall of ice of incredible density and height emerged in front of Amelia. Dividing the space between her and Petelgeuse, the wall continued to expand, bursting from the ground. In the matter of an instant, even Petelgeuse, with his unseen hands outspread, was forced to leap backwards. Petelgeuse, that's... Puck, I finally remembered the most important thing of all. In order to protect it, contracts and constraints can go to hell for all I care. What a worthless thing I've been bound to. Now, I finally remember. Hearing this rare sign of hesitation in Petelgeur's voice, the little cat floating in space quietly proclaimed. The aura of bewilderment had vanished, as the spirit glared at the madman with a liberated air. Puck, I remember now, why I've become like this. It was to protect my daughter, at last, if the price to do so was such a constraint. That vile wretch. Amelia, Puck, A. Eh? Amelia extended her fingers towards the rueful Puck, when her throat froze. At her breast, was a crystal glowing with green light. It was Puck's spiritual residence, the vital stone tying him and Amelia together. But suddenly, without the slightest touch, the stone shattered into dust. Amelia, what? W-H-Y? Puck, I. I have broken the constraint, and the consequences have begun. Perhaps even this was foreseen from the start. But still. Turning around, Puck floated down to the level of Amelia's eyes. A flicker of doubt flashed through Amelia's pupils at Puck's gesture. But, gazing into her, Puck's expression was that of someone gazing at something precious and beloved. Puck, Leah, this is goodbye. Amelia, W.H. Puck, the constraint has been broken. I cannot be tied to this body any more. As much as I wish to stay by your side, that too is part of the price. I'm sorry. Amelia, no, don't, Puck. Everyone. Everyone's gone. Subaru is. He's. Everyone's. Gone. Puck. If you leave me too. I. I'll be all alone. I don't. Want. To. Like a whimpering child, Amelia pleaded as tears poured from her eyes. Puck used his long tail to wipe away her tears, and gently touched his lips to the tip of the crying girl's nose. Puck, don't say such things, and listen well. There's still Ram in the mansion, Betty is also around. If you ever need to, you can rely on Betty. That child. Would never refuse you. Though, knowing this, it is rather mean of me to ask this of her. Amelia, I. Puck, other than you, I have no one. Puck, go now. My most cherished in this world, my loveliest, most beloved Amelia. Amelia, why? Before Amelia could say a thing, Puck's little body pushed hard against her forehead. Unable to withstand the unexpected force, Amelia's body was sent swimming backwards, when instantly, a tear in space swallowed up her slender frame. Amelia, W.H. In a blink, Amelia's figure vanished from the village. Watching this to the end, Puck spilled a long, drawn-out sigh. Puck, sorry for forcing you to do this, Beatrice. Puck thanked his accomplice in the abrupt disappearance. Then, he turned around, and looked to Petelgeurs, who had been staring at him. Puck, you just sat there quietly watching. Pretty good manners for a religious fanatic. Petelgeurs, it looked like if I did anything, you'd have crushed me in an instant, Desu. Either way, it'll be all the same once I make my way to the mansion, Desu. No point stepping on the tiger's tail. Desu. Puck, I see. You may look deranged, but you're surprisingly thoughtful. Scum. Spitting this out, Puck flew over the wall of ice into Petelgeur's side. Not even Petelgeur's did anything as foolish as using his unseen hands to stall the approach. Then, they faced each other with a certain distance between them. Puck, there is no time. Hurry up and start, so we can get this over with. The rest. I will leave to my trusty little sister. 
Petaljers, something's changed about you, Desu. For a spirit, you stink of human. Puck, yeah, I guess I do. Puck rubbed his little hand against his pink nose with a cynical smile. Puck, I may look like this now, but my limbs used to be a little longer, and my face would have been rather handsome, too. When my daughter is that cute, isn't that only natural? Petaljers, I'm having trouble understanding you, Desu. Puck, well, never mind, I wasn't expecting you to understand. Since you are about to die here, anyway. Saying this, Puck pointed his arms towards Petaljers as his body began to turn white. He was running out of mana, and losing his ability to keep hold of this body. Perhaps, this was partly because his bond with Amelia was severed, and partly because he had broken the constraint he had mentioned earlier. Either way, the contours of his form began to fade. Puck, before I am extinguished, I will extinguish you first. Who would have thought my companion in death would be a religious fanatic? Gross. Petaljers, sorry to tell you this, Desu, but even if you destroy this body, that won't SD. Puck, I will freeze your soul alongside it. If I do that, what would happen, I wonder? The dauntless grin on Petaljers' face up to now abruptly froze. Watching the madman's eyes widen, Puck smiled an utterly delighted smile. Puck, ah, now there's the face I wanted to see, fool. In an instant, simultaneous with the unraveling of the spirit's contours, a white radiance blasted forth, and... Forced to witness the endings of worlds one after another, Subaru lay collapsed upon the ground. He could not tell where he was any more. Was this reality, or was he inside a dream? Could it be one of those cycling nightmares? And if it was a nightmare, would he be absolved so simply? Were they really just possibilities? Or were they worlds that actually existed? Could they merely have been convenient fancies that Subaru's mind had invented? If so, then how does he explain the previously unknown information contained within them? Were they worlds born out of delusion? Were they alternate realities feeding on each other? Whichever it may be, the torment to Subaru's heart was colossal. So much so, that he could not stand, or raise his head, or do anything at all. And so. Rem, are you no longer able to stand? Subaru-kun? He heard someone at his side, gently uplifting his heart with those words. He thought it was the voice of someone he loved. Subaru dash dash. The hot streaks of tears that should no longer be spilling drew their trails down Subaru's cheeks. ARC 4. The Everlasting Covenant. Chapter 73, Where Weakness Resides. How long had it been since he last heard that voice? In reality, she hadn't been sleeping for all that long. At most a week, a conceivable time span for going without seeing one's friends or family. But Subaru could not think that way. For Subaru, who was constantly shedding off his life and time, actual time span meant nothing. According to his soul's internal clock, a far longer span had passed since that voice had last struck upon his eardrums, and his heart. Rem, wake up, Subaru-kun, I'd be happier if I could see your face. The words rained down from above as he lay face down on the ground. The tender compassion and the heated affection contained within that voice swiftly filled Subaru's chest with warmth, and instilled the parched, empty vessel of his heart with searing heat. All this, from a single sentence whispered by that gentle voice. Just how much strength had she given him? Subaru, you're kidding. Rem, no, this is not a joke. Subaru, you can't be here. Rem, if you want, Subaru-kun, I will always be at your side. Subaru, whenever there's something important I must do. Whenever I feel this way. It's like you'd always come to me. But how could? Something that convenient. Rem, well, I've always wanted to be the girl who just so conveniently happened to be at Subaru-kun's side. With his sobbing voice, he spilled the pathetic whimper but the voice that answered did not look down on him, nor think any less of him. She knew. Knew, that Subaru was weak, helpless, so brittle that he could not live without something to cling to, always lacking confidence, and perpetually in doubt. 
Nevertheless, this girl told this hopelessly weak Subaru that she loved him. Subaru, Rem. Rem, yes. It's Subaru Kun's Rem. He lifted his head. Obscured by tears, the color blue filled into his eyes. Roughly wiping his eyes with his dirtied sleeve, banishing his tears, he saw. The form of the girl standing before him. The form of his beloved Rem. Subaru, Rem. Rem, yes, Rem. The maid who's always within arm's reach when Subaru Kun wants her there. Subaru, why, ooh. Slightly tilting her head, Rem replied in a playful tone. Just before he could say something about her attitude, he felt the air calmly seep out of his lungs. With a thump, the heavy burden in his chest dropped to the ground. His breathing eased, and the tiny self screaming in his skull disappeared. Being so easily, so easily saved, Subaru was struck dumb. He had thought himself hopeless and stuck, and yet, upon seeing this single girl standing before his eyes, he was so easily released. Subaru, you're incredible, Rem. Rem, why thank you. Subaru Khan is amazing too. Smiling as she spoke, their exchange was just as perfectly offbeat as it always was. Feeling such happiness at this back and forth, everything he had tried to endure up to now suddenly turned to tears on the verge of falling. While he was pinned to the ground, casting down his eyes, Rem kneeled down before him. Rem, are you all right? Are you feeling worn out? Subaru, who? Knows. Maybe I am. Worn out. But nothing. Is finished yet. In these never-ending, looping worlds, Subaru had been battered and torn without reaching a single answer. He was in no position to say he was worn out. Not while everyone else suffered more. Not while everyone else was enduring more. Just why did everyone else have to suffer along with him? The answer was obvious, Subaru, it's because I'm too weak. Rem, dash dash. Subaru, because I'm always lacking. Rem, dash dash. Subaru, if only I'm stronger, smarter, and a less useless guy. They wouldn't have to suffer, grieve, or hurt like this. If Subaru was strong enough to do everything on his own, then the task of consoling Emilia's broken heart in the face of her past, easing the sorrow of Beatrice's four hundred years of solitude, saving Petra and Frederica from the murderer's blade, defending the people of the sanctuary from the great rabbit's threat, and reaching an understanding with Garfield, who sought to expel the outsiders, would all have fallen to him. Everything, all of it, every last aspect, was Subaru's fault. And so, in order to overcome this balance sheet of his own weakness, Subaru had to scour his soul and start anew. Or so he thought, and yet. Subaru, I didn't save anyone. In the end. Did I? Rem, Subaru Kun. Subaru, if the worlds continued after my death, then how many? How many times? How many people? Have I left to die? Rem, Subaru Kun. Subaru, how many times did I let you die? How many times do I need to kill you before it's enough? Rem, Subaru Kun. Shuddering from a dread surging from the depths of his body, Subaru ravingly confessed his sins, expelling them from his lips, he only wanted instant sentencing for his crimes. Before he could crush his own heart to dust, he wanted someone, anyone, to carry out his punishment for him. He wanted someone to yell at this colossal idiot who pledged not to make another mistake yet stumbled on his very first step while heading the wrong way, to smack this irredeemable fool flying. Subaru, dash dash. But Subaru's plea for punishment was answered by a gentle, enveloping embrace. Subaru, re, m. Rem, it's all right. Everything is all right, Subaru kun. Subaru, but, noth. Nothing is. All right. Is it? Nothing. Subaru hadn't succeeded in anything. If Subaru slackened now, absolutely no one would be saved. Countless people would meet their end. Rem too, was someone Subaru absolutely must save. Because only she had the right to chastise this inadequate, insufficient, hopelessly weak Natsuki Subaru. 
Subaru, you should be. At me. Rem, I love you. She pressed her forehead against his, and whispered those loving words, Subaru, dash dash. No words escaped him. There was nothing he could say. So near, her light blue eyes were looking directly into his. He could drown in the depths of the compassion in those eyes. Rem, I love you, Subaru-kun. And so, everything is all right. Subaru, th, ats. Not an answer. Rem, yes, it is. It's the reason I'm here. The reason I forgive Subaru-kun. The reason I'm holding you now, all of it is because of that. Close enough to feel each other's breaths, Rem's smile softly grasped Subaru's heart like an invisible hand. He couldn't move. Not even a twitch. Reaching around his back, her delicate hand clasped onto the hems of his clothes, tightly, tightly, so tightly as if to merge into one, she held him in her embrace. Rem, it must have been tough, Subaru-kun. Subaru, dash dash. Rem, all alone, taking all the pain onto yourself. It must have been hard, Subaru-kun. Subaru, dash hg. Rem, you don't have to bear all that sadness anymore, it's all right. With no words to answer her, Subaru desperately tried to keep everything from flooding out, while Rem's sweet whispers went on, gently unraveling his heart, melting away his obstinance. Rem, all of Subaru-kun's pain, grief, and weakness, all of it, Rem will bear it for you. Subaru. Rem, everything Subaru-kun wants to protect, to fight for, to accomplish. Leave them all to me. Subaru. Rem, there's no need for you to carry every single burden. You can leave them all to me. For now, just rest, and go to sleep. Subaru, I, I. Rem, and let me see the Subaru-kun that I love once again. Rem set her hand against Subaru's cheek and raised up his face, gazing directly into him. Her lips tightened, as if with some hesitation, as she drew her face closer. What was she doing? What would happen next? Even his lagging consciousness could understand. So close, near enough to feel her breaths, the lovely girl's lips were approaching. It'd be fine if they overlapped, intertwined, drowned, melted, and merged with his, wouldn't it? Regardless of right and wrong, she would forgive him, wouldn't she? Just how deeply had Rem's gentle words seeped into Subaru's heart? His indeterminate emotions, his soul, agonizing over whether or not to reach for the helping hand, along with the entirety of this Subaru's existence was once again saved by the girl who knew everything about him. To this powerless Subaru, Rem extended her hand. Against this fragile Subaru's back, Rem added her support. On this foolish Subaru's path, Rem took his hand and offered to show him the way. Why so shamelessly, clingingly, relying on her so entirely, would he be led to the answer at last? What point is there, in struggling on alone? Worn to the core, lost without a footing, no longer sure where to turn his steps, perhaps he should, just, give up, everything, and leave it t. Giving up is easy. Subaru, dash dash. But. Subaru, dash dash. It doesn't suit you, Subaru-kun. He heard a voice saying. Rem, Subaru-kun? Puzzled, Rem asked in front of his eyes. It was only natural, since just before their lips could meet, a hand was placed between them. The sweet sensation of entwining tongues that was supposed to have come grew distant, while a wavering, wounded glimmer flickered in Rem's eyes. Watching this wavering glint through the gaps between his fingers, Subaru spoke, Subaru, who, are you? Rem, huh? Subaru, I just asked you. Who are you? Rem, Subaru-kun, why are why? Asking who, I. In front of Subaru's quiet question, Rem's throat seemed to choke up, unable to speak. The faint, wounded color in her eyes deepened, as her expression became marked by grief. No matter what, it tore at Subaru's heart to see this. To distract himself from this feeling, he pressed his hand to his chest and bared his teeth. Subaru, when I was despairing and at the end of my rope, I genuinely wished that someone, anyone, 
could help me. And when I felt like it was impossible, and was about to give up. I really wished, that you would come to me. Rem, dash dash. Subaru, if you were there, you would console me, comfort me, while I sat there stuck hugging my knees. I believed that. Rem, dash dash. Subaru, just like this, you'd listen to my whining, let me spew out all my whimpers, watch me cry until I wring my tears dry. Rem, dash dash. Subaru, and then, you'd tell me to stand up. The delicate touch of her fingers, the up-close warmth of her skin, and the immensity of her love, Natsuki Subaru remembered with all his body and soul, and so, he could tell, without a doubt, that this Rem before his eyes was an imposter. Subaru, she would never say rest for now. Rem dash dash. Subaru, she would never say give up, and leave it all to me. Rem, dash dash. Subaru, a girl who loves me, who's loved by me, who's kind to me, who's head over heels for me, who's more strict and uncompromising with me than anyone else in this world, that is Rem. Springing to his feet, Subaru barked as he backed away from the Rem before his eyes. Still on her knees, Rem looked up to Subaru, without a word. Even now, he felt like he could drown in the sadness of her expression that was brought about by his rejection. Rem, no you're wrong. Subaru-kun, listen to me. I, that's not what I meant. It was just, I couldn't stand seeing Subaru-kun suffering like this. That's why. I just wanted you to forget the pain and get some rest, that's all. Subaru, I'd let you see my weakness. I'd let you see my frailty. I'd let you see what a hopeless, worthless bastard I am. But I would never let you see me giving up. Subaru is a hero, that was what Rem had told him. And so, Natsuki Subaru had resolved to become Rem's hero. Ever since they exchanged that promise, Subaru had decided, that in this life, in this world, the only place where Natsuki Subaru would show his weakness, was in front of Rem. Only in front of Rem, who despite knowing Subaru's weakness still expected him to be strong, would he expose his own frailty. Not Emilia, not Beatrice, he would let no one see it except Rem. Subaru, my weakness belongs to Rem. She accepts and shields my weakness, and in exchange, I will hold down any thoughts of giving up, and never let it out. Rem, dash dash. Subaru, so fuck off, you fake. And don't fucking coddle me wearing my Rem's face and voice. Firmly declaring this, Subaru jabbed out his fist at Rem, at the imposter. In front of Subaru's pronouncement, the listener was at a loss for words. Keeping her face downcast, softly, and quietly, she stood up. Question mark B but that's, not, what, she, told. Me? Subaru, ah? Slanting her head and swaying her blue hair, the imposter stuttered out her words. Hearing this, Subaru let out a voice of doubt. Subaru, dash dash. Before his eyes, the girl's image seemed to blur as Rem's figure turned vague. A storm of midnight television haze drowned out his vision, and, following the momentary hijacking of the world, there was now another person standing in that same spot. Someone he had never seen before. Her pink hair stretching halfway down her back, her bearing was gentle, or rather, timid. The girl's features were attractive, but nothing about it came across as outstandingly beautiful. It was more of an ordinary, commonplace kind of cuteness. Wearing a white, long-sleeved robe, her hands were hiding inside her sleeves as she held them against her cheeks, watching Subaru nervously. Subaru, who are? You? Camilla, Eam the Witch of Lust. Camilla. You know? N nice to meet. You. Hearing the girl, Camilla's reply, Subaru inadvertently swallowed his breath. She just called herself the Witch of Lust. Which means? Subaru, so this strange, inexplicable space. Is inside a Kidona's dream? Camilla, yes. And no. I guess. A Kidona Chan is, watching, the trial. And the trial itself is, kind of, like, a dream, um. Yeah. Subaru, that's kind of missing the point, but no, even before that. 
Camilla's manner of speech was getting on Subaru's nerves. Naturally, seeing Subaru's gaze grow harsh, Camilla immediately started shivering and hugging her head. Camilla, P please don't high. Hit me. Subaru, I won't do anything like that. I won't, but. What were you trying to do earlier? Camilla, early, ah? Uh? Subaru, appearing in front of me, pretending to be Rem. Is that what your power is supposed to be? All the witches bearing the name of a sin seem to possess some sort of special authority. Assuming the Witch of Lust was no exception, she should have an authority as well. If her transformation earlier was her authority, then... Subaru, well, I guess compared to what the other witches can do, transformation is a pretty orthodox ability. Camilla, I I didn't, T.R. transform. Though? I I, just, looked, to you, like someone, else. Be because. That's, who, you wanted, to see. That's all? Subaru, what? Camilla, I, mean. I, didn't, even, want to, meet you. Iyakidona Chan, asked me, too. And lied, to me, too. Camilla's mutters were exacerbating Subaru's annoyance. The way she spoke, the way she shifted her glances, and the way she looked down whenever she sensed his gaze, all irritated him to no end. That whimpering tone, and those sulking complaints, the hell is her problem? Not only was nothing she tried to say getting through, she didn't even appear to realize how cherish a thing to Subaru she had just trampled over. Irritated. Aggravated. He wanted to scream at her just so she'd understand. Subaru, you. Do you even know what you just did? Camilla, Ikidona Chan, she. S said, I just had to spoil, you. A little, and it'll all be, fine. Even, though? I I didn't want to, I told her. Subaru, listen to me. Camilla, e everyone. Is ganging up, on, me, pick, picking on me. Like, this. Ikidona Chan is. D doing it, too. You're all, so. So mean. Subaru, don't you understand what listen to me means? Screaming, Subaru felt all the air being wrenched from his lungs as he expelled that scraping shout. He felt it, but the incinerating rage burning through his body erased that thought from his mind. Suffocation was nothing compared to this irritation clawing at his chest. He wanted to jam her sniveling, stuttering, whimpering mouth shut, and blast her with all the rage and agony inside him so she'd understand what she had j. Question mark any more of that, your life would be in danger. Subaru, dash gh. That instant, Subaru heard a voice whispering into his ear, pulling him back to his senses. The very same moment, the pain of being deprived of oxygen up to the point of asphyxiation struck him, along with the dry soreness of his continually wide-open eyes. Subaru, A-A dash, A-R? Question mark they were drastic measures, but I'm glad to see you back. When facing Camilla, the faceless goddess of lust, people tend to forget to breathe. Ultimately, even their hearts stop beating. Subaru, Ega, G-H-P-T. Ha, ha. Spitting out the choking saliva, having fallen to his hands and knees, Subaru's consciousness was strobing. But the voice had entered his ears, and its meaning delivered to his brain. And so, Subaru wiped off his lips with his sleeve as he looked up at the most probable culprit behind this prank, and, baring his teeth. Subaru, just what, what were you plotting, Ikidona? At the receiving end of Subaru's hateful gaze, the white haired which softly stroked her hair, and also naturally rested her elbows on the table. Ikidona, isn't it obvious? I am a witch. I'm plotting something nefarious, of course. She said, smiling. ARC 4. The Everlasting Covenant. Chapter 74, The Witch's Plan and Proposal. Panting from asphyxiation, Subaru belatedly noticed that his hands were on a green grass field. From the ground where his limbs landed rose the thick scent of grass scraping across his nostrils. Like that of a meadow bathed in sunlight after the rain, the choking fragrance of nature gently wrapped all around him. He turned his head, 
and saw Ikidona straight before him. She was, as always, on the small hillock in the middle of the plains, seated in a chair at the table, awaiting her tea party's guest, for Subaru, as always. Yes, just as always. Ikidona, I'm sure there are all sorts things you want to say and ask me. But first, how about taking a seat and having a cup of tea? Subaru, if you, consider what you just did to me, do you think I'd just cordially sit in that chair? And go along with your tea party? Echidona, I do. Compared to losing yourself to instinct and senseless rage, you are the kind who's more likely to dress yourself in rational, cold calculation. Now, rather than distancing yourself from me, there are far more benefits in holding a profitable conversation. Isn't that what you've concluded in your heart? Subaru, dash dash. Faced with Subaru's suppressed fury, Echidona's carefree bearing remained unfazed. Calling down to him from above, as if mocking Subaru's all too obvious bluff, the words struck true while Subaru could neither affirm nor deny them. Except, the thing that she had trampled over was not so cheap that he'd concede so easily. Subaru, Ikidona. Just tell me you didn't mean to. Ikidona, hm? Subaru, just now. That trick with the Witch of Lust, tell me you didn't mean for it to happen. Tell me, that you made a mistake, go on say it. Ikidona. Subaru, say it was unavoidable. Say you didn't anticipate it, that it shouldn't have gone down that way. Say it. If you just tell me that. I won't blame you for it. What Ikidona said was right. If Subaru wanted to proceed, he would need her knowledge and help. But, the unforgivable was still unforgivable. Echidona had used the Witch of Lust to trespass into a precious and inviolable place inside Subaru, his sanctuary. That much was certain. And so, for Subaru, this was the necessary requirement before he could forgive Echidona and hold a meaningful conversation with her. Echidona, and I was wondering what you'd say. In that moment, she must have understood Subaru's inner weakness and obstinance. Spilling that inadvertent mutter, Ikidona turned her gaze towards Subaru, who was biting his lips, waiting for her reply. She leisurely fiddled her white hair, and... Ikidona, then, as you wish, that was just the witch of lust running amok. I tried to stop her, but she wouldn't listen. Taking advantage of the trial, she tried to seduce you by unveiling the part of you that you least wanted to be touched, and with it, drown you. Subaru, dash dash. Ikidona, it came close, but you still managed to escape her spell through your own strength. Then, having failed her seduction, when Camilla let down her guard I took back control and summoned you to my citadel. You could say that it was by a stroke of luck that we could now meet here, face to face. Subaru, dash dash. Ikidona, now, suppose I told you all that, would you be satisfied? Swiftly, Ikidona lined up everything Subaru had wanted to hear, only to betray her own words in the end. Without saying a thing, Subaru looked upwards, as if to put Ikidona out of his gaze. Subaru, what were you trying to do, goading on a witch like that? Ikidona, Camilla didn't tell you? What she did was to save you, after the trial had all but abraded away your heart. Subaru, that... That couldn't have been the witch of lust's intention. If what she said was true, then that was only my selfish weakness wanting to hear Rem say those things to me. The witch of lust had no reason to be kind to me, those were your instructions, weren't they? Ikidona, so you've already deduced this much even when so little was said. In that case, I suppose there's no point making excuses. Casually, Ikidona discarded the act with a shrug. Then, she brought her tea cup to her lips, and tiled it with a sip. Ikidona, it's as you suspected, sending Camilla to you, and having her pretend to be the girl in your heart were all by my instructions. Though, the imperfect outcome and the fact that it was seen through is more of a problem on Camilla end than mine. Subaru, why? Would you do that? Ikidona, hearing it straight out is probably going to make you angry. It was the most efficient method, and the one most likely to succeed. Without apology, Ikidona went on as Subaru's expression vanished. Ikidona, 
Even I didn't expect you to get so hung up on the second trial. Above all, the fact that its contents hit you this hard was, in all honesty, something I couldn't have imagined until I saw it with my own eyes. Subaru, dash dash. Ikidona, oh my, I do wish you'd overlook me peeping in on your trial. I'm sure I've already told you after the first trial, that these are trials set up by a witch. Even if the product is a bit mean-spirited, I still wouldn't like to have this and that said about me. Subaru, get on with it. Ikidona, anyway, while watching you face the trial from the sidelines, I had a thought. If you went on challenging the trial like this, you'd be worn to the core before long. That wasn't an exaggeration. In fact, it wasn't far from the truth. Subaru wasn't so aloof to what was happening to him that he'd try to refute her here. The second trial, the presents that were not to be, and the scenes, events, and tragedies he was forced to witness were more than enough to shatter his hubris, stubbornness, and delusions. Ikidona, and so I intervened. Even though, being worn to the core is also a result in itself, I like to experiment with everything through trial and error. My curiosity is insatiable, and strives endlessly to produce conclusions. To satisfy my insatiable greed, I seek out any and all outcomes. The one in which challenging the trial breaks you is no exception. Subaru, so then why did you intervene? If me breaking is just another outcome you seek, you could have just left me there. If the result was that was all I amounted to after all. You would have been satisfied too, wouldn't you? Echidona, I did have a mind to just accept it as another result. I did, but that doesn't mean I shouldn't do something to produce the result I wanted. Subaru, what? Hounded by Subaru's questioning, Echidona dropped her tone as she replied. Hearing this, for the first time today, Subaru furrowed his brows for a reason other than rage. Carefully scrutinizing her words and forming the semblance of a meaning, if he wasn't mistaken, then. Subaru, it was to reject the outcome where I'd be worn to nothing. That's why you set up that situation, is that what you're saying? Echidona, and as a result, I trespassed onto a territory that was precious to you, I have no excuses for that. So if you want to shower me with insults, I will resignedly accept them. Your anger is justified, and it was wrong of me to be so inconsiderate. That's all there is to it. Setting her cup on the table, Ikidona gazed straight down towards Subaru at the foot of the hill. Completely devoid of the playful caprice of before, the Witch of Greed now faced him with the entirety of her sincerity. Her attitude, her stance, and her words all overwhelmed him. All of a sudden, the rage and distrust towards Echidona that were occupying his chest only moments ago now seemed horrifically egotistical and selfish. The truth is, unable to forget her hand in what happened earlier, Subaru was still reluctant to accept Echidona's help, but then, what would his heart become without it? Laying on the cold floor of the tomb, his heart, shattered, crushed to dust, left in a darkness without the faintest light, and there, erased to nothing. It wasn't hard to imagine. He couldn't go as far as to thank her. But nor did he feel that she deserved his rage and abuse. That much, was his emotional compromise. Subaru, dash dash. Standing up without a word, Subaru patted off the grass on his clothing and made his way up the hill. Seated in her chair, a flicker of pain flashed through Ikidona's eyes as she watched Subaru's approach. What would he say to her once he got here? It seemed that not even this century's old witch could tell. The incarnation of the thirst for knowledge. The witch of greed. To see such an adversary's expression twinge at his approach still gave Subaru's heart some small relief. Echidona, ah. In front of Echidona's soft cry of surprise, Subaru pulled out a chair and sat down opposite her. Though he had no intention of bringing that teacup to his lips, this was his way of show his willingness to talk. While Echidona looked on with a hint of unease, Subaru rested his cheek in his hand and turned his face away. Subaru, I'm not in the mood for tea, but I would like to have that profitable conversation with you. Swallowing down his unbearable emotions, Subaru summoned up the magnanimity to reply. Subaru, so in the end, what is the second trial? Keeping his cheek rested against his palm, Subaru asked without looking at Echidona. On the other end, 
Ikidona shifted her chair forward in order to enter Subaru's field of view. Ikidona, well, what do you think it was? Subaru, you're not trying to confuse me, are you? Is that your way of telling me I'm asking too much? Putting me on the spot like that? Ikidona, I'm not half so mean as that. I did do something to upset you, after all. I just wanted to check if we can still speak on friendly terms, and also to hear your opinion while we're at it. Those words would have made anyone feel embarrassed. If Subaru had come into this conversation in a normal state of mind, he certainly would have been discomposed and gotten stuck on his words. But, in his current state of mind, there was no way he would give her the reaction she wanted. Instead, Subaru spilled a small sigh as his reply. Subaru, the trial's topic was to witness a present that was not to be. That was the premise, as well the subject of the scenes it showed me, I'm guessing a present that was not to be would be a present that would have existed if I had made a different choice along the way, right? One way to think about it is like what happens in visual novels. It is a game in which the player makes decisions in key points of the story, causing the paths to diverge. On a grander scale, one could even say that life itself is kind of unfolding like one gigantic game. People must constantly face choices, and make decisions based on their individual will, all the while trying to aim for a certain potential thread in the world, that would be precisely what life is. Echidona, by definition, they are worlds which you should never have been able to witness. Who knows? You might find that you are happier in that world than in the actual present, then you might come to regret, why didn't I do that back then? Or otherwise, that world might be more wretched than the actual present, and then, perhaps you'd say to yourself, thank God I didn't do that. Ultimately, the second trial is to witness presence other than the present you have chosen, and to determine whether or not you could correctly affirm the only genuine present. Following on Subaru's words, Ikidona succinctly summed up the second trial. It wasn't too far from what Subaru had imagined. Except for the part where Subaru had to go through that deeply penetrating ordeal. Subaru, so, those alternate presents I saw, do they really exist? Ikidona. Subaru, every time I die, I'd return by death. So I've never seen what happens after I die. Until now I've never even considered the possibility of the world continuing after my death, no, actually, it's that I've been trying not to. Well, of course. Subaru only returns by death because the world was already beyond saving. In order to break through the deadlock and save everyone he held dear, Subaru had believed that by returning by death he could reach the perfect future, or so he told himself so he could endure the sensation of constantly spending his life. The existence of worlds beyond his death would upturn that premise from its roots. If only to set his mind at ease, he must convince himself that there were no worlds he left behind, and that the people in those lost worlds had in fact been saved. And so, Subaru, after my deaths, do the worlds continue on? When my choices caused the world to diverge, when I left those unsalvageable worlds behind, was everyone I failed to protect still inside them? Ikidona, dash dash. Subaru, what is it, Ikidona, please, answer me. Having lost the option of avoiding looking at her with his eyes, Subaru leaned forward in his seat and turned a pleading gaze towards Ikidona. Ikidona didn't say a word, but, bathed in Subaru's gaze, she touched her chin as if in thought, and then closed her eyes. Ikidona, there is, one thing I should clear up about the trials. Subaru. Echidona, the present in the second trial is no more than a phenomenon, which allows you to witness an imagined world, the challenger taking the trial. That's you, in this case. By projecting off of the details of your memories, the memories of the world draws on everything that makes up your surroundings, the people, the world, the atmosphere, and even the mana, and, assembling them with necessary information from the past, present, and future, a new present is created. Subaru. Echidona, that is to say, no matter how flawless, it is no more than a well-made unreality. Several tiers above self-absorbed delusions, it is a false reality that might also have actually happened. As for whether or not it is real, I cannot answer in the affirmative. Subaru, th that means. Echidona, however. 
Seeing hope in Akidona's explanation, Subaru lifted his head. But just as he thought he saw the light, Ikidona held up her palm and stopped him. Ikidona, the precise mechanisms of your return by death are unclear. It's almost certain that the one facilitating your return by death is the Witch of Envy, but the issue of how the Witch of Envy causes you to return by death leaves questions unending. Perhaps, it is a power that rewinds the world upon your death. Or perhaps, each time, it is achieved by reaching into another, parallel world and pulling out another you, and with it, overwrites your existence. Subaru, AA. Ikidona, if we assume it to be the latter, then parallel worlds do indeed exist, and, after your death, those worlds would continue on even without you. Subaru, S. So how do we know for sure? Ikidona, we don't. With a shake of her head, Ikidona mercilessly cut off Subaru's trembling words. Subaru's eyes opened wide while his mouth hung open without making a sound. Ikidona turned him a sympathizing gaze as she tapped her finger on the edge of the table. Ikidona, if there is one way to confirm it, it would be to ask the Witch of Envy herself. But I'm sure you know from experience how difficult that would be. Ikidona must be referring to Subaru's memories of the first time he truly faced the Witch of Envy. Leaving the tomb after the end of the tea party, there, he found the Witch of Envy, stealing Emilia's body, tearing Garfield to shreds, and engulfing the sanctuary in shadow, it was a monster in the truest sense. Suddenly, he remembered the doubts surrounding that thing's appearance. Subaru, Re, G.H.T. Ikidona. Before, after the tea party ended. Outside, I saw the witch in the sanctuary. What was? That? Just what was that? Ikidona, I thought it'd be obvious. That was the witch of envy. Though, that imitation is nothing compared to the real thing. The fleshly vessel it had chosen was immature, and more importantly, not a single one of its seals had been broken. With the deficiency of witch genes, there was no way it could have acted with the same power it had in its heyday. Subaru, that was still nothing compared to its heyday? Disposing of the beastified Garfield like he was nothing and slaughtering everyone without receiving a scratch, that monster was still nothing compared the true Witch of Envy. Four hundred years ago, in the age when the actual witch ran rampant, what hell must it have been? Ikidona, just as you imagined, the trigger for her appearance was the tea party, not even that thing could prevent you from violating the taboo in here. And so, driven mad with envy yet unable to vent it inside, it took out its rage on the external world, exploding into a rampage wreaking havoc in its wake. Subaru, and you knew that it'd fucking happen? Ikidona, not exactly. It was the first time, after all. Being the first time, it was only after it actually happened that I could come up with my hypothesis. I can't derive conclusions without first seeing it happen, in that sense, as the Witch of Greed, I'm not that different from you all. Subaru, dash dash. Subaru was at loss for words to see that Ikidona's spectator's stance showing no signs of collapsing. There was no point in reproaching her for it. But even though he knew this, he still couldn't quite shake the vexation. If only she had felt like it, if she had felt like helping Subaru, then maybe. Ikidona, I doubt there was any great reason why the one you loved was chosen as the vessel. Although there would be a certain affinity when it's another half-elf, I think the biggest reason could only be envy. Subaru, envy? Ikidona, for a witch who wants to be the sole subject of your thoughts, is it really so hard to believe that she'd hate and seek to destroy the recipient of your impassioned affections? Loving someone to the point of madness also meant demanding that person to love her back in return. As long as that love wasn't directed at her, she'd go to insane lengths to make sure that it was. Such was the volatile lunacy known as love. Perhaps the Witch of Envy was precisely the incarnation of that behavior. Ikidona, all the questions plaguing your mind, are ones which only the Witch of Envy could answer. Subaru, dash dash. Ikidona, you can mull over them endlessly, but, in all honesty, I doubt you will ever reach an answer. Not about why she pursued you back then, nor about the presence that may or may not exist. Subaru, th. Dot ats. To Subaru, that would be far too cruel a reality. He wanted to hear it clearly refuted. 
to be told that the worlds beyond his death never existed. Or if not, then at least he wanted to hear it outright. That so many had been sacrificed for your conceit. Whichever the answer, Subaru would have taken it as his admonition, his creed, his reminder to never forget, and though he'd grit his teeth, shed tears of blood and cry out from his very soul, he would turn his steps forward. But for the answer to be there is no answer, isn't that just far too cruel? Was he to live, without confirmation or denial, leaving the fate of worlds in this indeterminate limbo? To go on without knowing whether his steps were his own. Whether he had abandoned what he had abandoned. Whether his sins were sins. Was this to be his punishment? Were Natsuki Subaru's crimes so great that no one could ever forgive him? No one was capable of passing judgment on Subaru. No one could condemn him, either. He already understood this. But was even Subaru himself to be denied that right? Ikidona, I do think it's harsh. But I also think that the only thing to do is to decide. As Subaru was stricken into speechlessness, Ikidona addressed him with these words. He slowly shifted his head, and turned his vacant gaze onto Ikidona. Taking in Subaru's gaze, Ikidona swallowed a breath, and, with a serious expression. Ikidona, in more extreme terms, the second trial is to accept the true present as the only present that is, while separating out all the others as utterly unreachable worlds. Subaru, dash dash. Ikidona, I'm sure it must be hard, since, compared to other challenges, you have far more reason to believe that these realities truly exist. But still, it's time that you switched over. Subaru, switched over? Ikidona, your choices may have indeed left many sacrifices in their wake. And among those you left behind, there must be plenty that are beyond retrieval. But to spend your life counting those you have lost and left behind, would be pitiful, futile, and painful, don't you think? Subaru, if I wanted empty idealism I wouldn't have come to you, don't know why I have to say this, but did you actually think some run-of-the-mill counseling advice was going to help me get through this? Ikidona's words were pleasant, and comforting. If the wound was shallow, or the crime light, or if it had just been the matter of some causal occurrence, then maybe it would have helped. Or perhaps, if he had merely wanted to feel saved, he may have made that switch. But. Subaru, it still doesn't change the fact that everything I've done and everything I couldn't do hadn't changed reality by one bit. That everyone I sacrificed believing that those worlds would cease to exist could have been a mistake. Ikidona, that's true. Subaru, then how am I supposed to be okay with this? How am I supposed to forgive myself? When you tried offering me a hand I slapped it away. That's because I didn't want to be saved by a counterfeit rem. I will definitely retrieve the real rem in the end, one way or another, but. Pausing for a breath, Subaru's face twisted in anguish. Subaru, when I do, would she really be the same rem I had set out to save? Echidona, dash dash. Subaru, without an answer my heart has nowhere to turn, and here you are telling me that I don't have to be like this, that all I have to do is decide? Echidona, dash dash. Subaru, rather than count those I couldn't save, I should live, counting the ones I did save. Is that what you're telling me? What Ikidona tried to tell him was that there was hope if he only looked ahead. For Subaru, those words may have become a beacon. But the darkness into which he had fallen was not so shallow that he could consider it as such. Subaru, with this run-of-the-mill idealism. You're telling me? To just fight it? Ikidona, I am. Subaru, dash dash. Ikidona, that is what I am telling you. While he was shoving aside all words of comfort and crying from the depths of despair, Ikidona said this to Subaru. Speaking slowly, pronouncing each syllable, Ikidona looked Subaru straight in the eyes and told him. Ikidona, rather than count the multitudes you might not have saved, you should count all those you have saved. I have seen the roads you've taken to get here. Subaru, I, what? What would why? About me. Ikidona, I have seen you doing your utmost, striving with all of your soul to forge your own path up to now. And so, I can say this. Indeed, I can. Subaru, 
dash dash. Echidona, of all the paths you have taken until now, not a single one had been wasted. No one has the right to tell you that your utmost was not enough. It was only by throwing in everything you had that you have reached this moment. That is something to be proud of. Echidona's sincere words struck at Subaru's emptied chest. Something resounded in its hollow interior, but it was not enough. Those words could not compel him to stand. Even if he was told that he should be proud, the fact remained that he had abandoned and lost too much, things he should have been able to change. Things that would have gone differently if it had been anyone else besides Subaru. But, because that person was Subaru, there were so many that could not be saved. That was Subaru's crime. Subaru's transgression. The sin which Subaru must accept and atone for. Subaru, there's no one who can forgive me. Ikidona, that I will forgive you. I, who know everything about you. Subaru, there's no one who can judge me. Ikidona, then I will judge you. I, who know all of your sins. Subaru, there's no one who can accept me. Ikidona, if you cannot accept yourself, then allow me to deny the self that you cannot forgive. Subaru, dash dash. Echidona, if you cannot accept your sins, then leave it to me to deny them. For each of Subaru's words, Echidona had one to strike it down. Why was this witch so insistent on denying Subaru's sins? Why was this witch so unrelenting about wiping that darkness from Subaru's heart? Subaru, why? Are you? Trying so hard to help me? Echidona, Asking a girl to say this kind of thing is just plain mean, you know. Ikidona, who had not faltered once until now, was, for the first time, stuttering her words. Then, with a slight blush on her cheeks, Ikidona cleared her throat, and... Ikidona, will you forge a contract with me, Natsuki Subaru? Her voice was quiet, yet suggestive of her strong volition. Subaru blinked letting the words seep into his brain but still needing more time to comprehend them. Subaru, con. Tract? Ikidona, yes, a contract. A formal contract with the Witch of Greed, are you interested in sealing one? Subaru, if we forged. Forged this contract, what happens then? Ikidona, it's simple. From now on, whenever you meet an obstacle you cannot surmount, I will face the wall and ponder with you. Whenever you wish to hear someone's words, I will endeavor to give you the testimony you desire. Whenever you feel close to being crushed by the weight of your sins, I will clear those crushing sins together with you. Saying this in a single breath, a bashful smile rose on Ikidona's face. Ikidona, will you forge this contract with me? Subaru, but you're dead. So you can't influence reality anymore, right? Ikidona, I believe my reach has already far exceeded that of the dead. I suppose it's a bit late for me to admit this, but better late than never, that is, if you can forgive me. Holding her hand to her chest, inclining her head as she spoke, Ikidona's words reverberated upon Subaru's eardrums. The vibration passed into his body, bringing a gradual warmth that followed his coursing blood and pervaded throughout his body. Sensation returned to his numbing fingers. His parched tongue regained some of its moisture and mobility, and he could feel his thirsting eyes that had forgotten to blink being quenched by something wet and hot. Her offered hand, her proposition, her proposal, her pledge of assistance left him at a loss as to how to answer. Just when his oath to go on struggling seemed to have all but lost its meaning, the witch pledged to be there to support him. Ikidona, I don't mean to brag, but I am rather confident in the volume of my knowledge. I can prepare countermeasures for just about any problem you might encounter, and no matter how absurd a situation threatens to befall you, unlike your peers, there is no need to go to such pains to persuade me. And, most of all, I can comprehend your return by death. Subaru, are you trying to hit me with a fast-lipped sales pitch? Echidona, as the requesting party, I do think it's only natural for me to lay out all the benefits of sealing this contract with me. And if it has managed to put some ease into your heart, then all the better, don't you think? Making use of Subaru's words, Ikidona took even those as a part of her pitch. Seeing the witch this way, Subaru couldn't help but loosen his cheeks into a smile. 
suddenly feeling the air peacefully flowing out of his lungs, ah, Subaru sighed. Bathed in the meadow's gentle wind, he leaned his back into the chair and looked up to the sky. In the blue, artificial sky, he could see white clouds floating. Whenever he gets stuck, whenever he is lost without an answer, whenever he is facing against impossible odds. If he could sit here under this azure sky, and trade words with her in search of a solution. Subaru, maybe, it wouldn't be so bad. Echidona, you mean? Creaking her chair as she stood, inadvertently clenching her hands into fists, Echidona looked down at Subaru, but, noticing Subaru's gaze looking back at her with his back still inclined against his chair, Echidona's face suddenly changed color as if embarrassed by her own actions. Echidona, ah, no. Mn, but, if you absolutely must insist, then I guess sealing such a contract isn't entirely out of the... Subaru, it's a bit too late to cover it up, isn't it? I mean, you were the one who asked if... Uck never mind, saying it just feels incredibly crude at this point. Echidona was the one proposing it, but she had done so to save Subaru's heart. To put it plainly, it was a witch's kindness. The fact that she didn't make him cling and beg must have simply been the witch's consideration for Subaru. No matter where he was, no matter who it was, was he always going to wind up being saved like this? Bouncing off the back of his chair to jolt himself forward, Subaru stood up. Standing close enough to touch if he only reached out his hand, Ikidona looked into Subaru's eyes that were now level with her own, a tinge of unease in her expression. Even the witch's minutest actions are cunning he thought. But since he was the one being saved, he was surely in no position to complain. Subaru, so. How does one seal a contract? Ikidona, to seal a formal contract, you and I must be connected by a path between us. I will take care of the details. But for now, your palm. Ikidona held up her right hand with her white palm facing towards Subaru. Here, put your palm against mine was probably what it meant. Feeling somewhat dumbstruck, watching the witch across from him failing to keep the glee from escaping onto her lips, ha, he spilled a quiet sigh. Subaru, now, hopefully things'll finally start turning. Filled with great expectations of the future, he placed his palm onto hers, and... Impact. A crashing boom rang out as the cup-bearing table beside him burst into a thousand pieces. The impact that shattered the table passed into the ground, birthing a crater in its wake as the rumble of the quaking earth jolted Subaru into squawking in shock. Question mark I'm putting a stop to this contract. Striking her fist into the ground, proclaiming this in her magnificent voice, was a blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl. The Witch of Wrath, peering her eyes over the two, smoldering with furious rage, ARC 4 The Everlasting Covenant Chapter 75, that person. Stumbling back from the impact as if he had a rug pulled from under him, Subaru widened his eyes at the blonde-haired girl glaring back at him. Her blue eyes teeming with exorbitant rage and her beautiful face colored with a crimson hue, it was the witch, Minerva. Taking her sharp gaze off the petrified Subaru, she turned to the entirely unfazed Ikidona, standing opposite him. Minerva, I'll say it again, this stops now. I will not allow this kind of contract. Ikidona, hum. Now isn't this quite an unexpected development? It was a sentiment too familiar to be hostility, and too violent to be called rage. Standing in the crater she had made, single-mindedly directing this at Ikidona, Minerva folded her arms, hoisting up her ample breasts while biting her lip. Ikidona, surely, you should understand the significance of a contract with a witch. The fact that you chose to interfere anyway. Could it be, that you also wish to seal a contract with him yourself? This wouldn't be a case of sour grapes, now would it? Minerva, can't you tell from my fury that it's nothing so placid? I'm furious, I'm incensed. I'm so upset I'm ready to explode. In front of Echidona's dodging jests, Minerva shot back with a shade of red deepening on her cheeks. Tears pooled in her eyes from the intensity of her emotions, while her face pouted like a sulking child. Her childish face entirely at odds with her voluptuous figure, Subaru couldn't help but be intrigued to see such a character in the flesh. 
After all, Subaru, what are you doing here? Minerva, what am I not allowed to be here? Subaru, well, no, that's not. But, I mean, Ikidona's right here. Saying this, Subaru pointed at Ikidona as Minerva puffed up her cheeks in displeasure. Not seeing his point, Minerva tilted her head, while Ikidona, apparently catching on, lightly clasped her hands together and nodded. Ikidona, ah, I think I know why you're confused. You're surprised to see another witch manifesting while I am still here, correct? Subaru, why yeah. I mean, since I've always met the witches one on one. I thought they kinda had to take your place when they appear, but. Minerva, and she never said we can't appear at the same time, I bet. That just sounds like the kind of prank this mean spirited witch would pull. Huffing in rage, Minerva easily smacked down Subaru's protests. Muttering, seriously? Under his breath, Subaru looked at Ikidona. But, in front of Subaru's gaze and Minerva's address, Ikidona made no effort to deny it. Ikidona, I wouldn't want you to misunderstand. Calling the other witches here is quite a taxing and risky thing to do. There's a chance they might even wrest away my control over this place, or, even if they don't, it is still incredibly exhausting to manifest beings as powerful as them. Subaru, that's, why? No, but, you. Ikidona, I've never once lied about this. I can assure you that much. With that single incisive statement, Ikidona sliced through Subaru's faltering words. It was true. Searching through his memories, Ikidona had never said anything about this present situation that would constitute a lie. It was only Subaru's imagination going off on its own, when he was presented with this phenomenon. So, in the end, technically Ikidona hadn't actually deceived him, but... Ikidona, I just didn't want you to know that other witches can manifest as they wish, and have them take you from me. Subaru, H, R? Huh? Ikidona, to me, you are the first guest I've had in a very long time. Conversing with you had thrilled me in ways I've rarely ever been thrilled, whether it be before or after my death. If I told you I simply wanted to have you here, all to myself, would you berate me for my shallowness? Subaru, dash dash. Ikidona, I know I keep on saying this, but I am rather fond of you. And so, I didn't want your interest to shift onto other witches more charming and more helpful than myself. Go on, you can laugh at me if you wish. So this extreme, hideous desire to possess, was her reason for hiding it from him. Quietly listening to Ikidona's excuse without saying a word, Subaru wondered why she would have this obsession towards him, just what about him warranted this kind of fixation. It was the same with the Witch of Envy, and now Ikidona, too, just why would they? Minerva, you're way too easy to dupe, you know that? Subaru, ja? Just as his mind was sinking into thought, Subaru's head was bumped by a soft fist from behind. He turned around holding his head, and found Minerva right behind him. She took the hand he was holding against his head, and, in one fluid motion, she twisted his arm and flipped him onto the ground. Subaru, oa, uh, ah. Uh. Why, hurts hurts hurts. Or. Not. Minerva, when I directly touch anything living, no matter what action I take, it would be transformed into healing. I could punch with all my strength and it would close wounds, I could rest you to the ground and it would cure you of your diseases, I could place you in a lock and it would fix of your shoulder pains. Subaru, that. Explains why my body is not aching all over, but. While his body was savoring the full power of the Witch of Wrath, Subaru frantically twisted his neck to look at Minerva as she locked him in a hold, despite the creaking of his bones and the horribly unnatural looking directions his joints were being twisted in, instead of pain, all he felt was an incongruous warmth spreading throughout his body. This witch, with the strange authority to instill every action with restorative powers, come to think of it, Subaru hadn't had a single bad impression about her up to now, but. Subaru, what the hell are you trying to do? Minerva, if I didn't do this, you would have been happily cajoled into getting all ready to sign a contract with Ikidona. This careless, brain-dead attitude of yours is really pissing me off. 
Ikidona, cajole, makes it sound bad. I only remember explaining the benefits of sealing a contract with me and working to reach a mutual understanding. Minerva, it's the way you make it sound like you fulfilled your responsibility to explain that's getting to me. You explained the benefits all right. You did. Then when it's about the inconvenient details that come with the contract you didn't say a thing. In a fit of rage, Minerva angrily stomped down her foot. The place where her heel landed was exactly on Subaru's butt, as he felt the inexplicable sensation of a heel driving into his rear while its force passed through him, crushing an indentation into the ground. While feeling his bowel functions being somehow improved by this strike to his behind, to Subaru's shock, he began to realize the meaning of Minerva's words. It was true, that his conversation with Ikidona hadn't touched on the detriments of the contract at all. Just how was it that it took him so long notice it? Subaru, no, but... Calling them detriments. It's not actually that serious, is it? Minerva, it won't be that bad, is that what you're thinking? You are taking contracts way too lightly. Especially when the other person is a witch, the one who, out of the seven witches bearing the names of sins, has forged the most contracts, interacted the most with humans, and meddled the most with the course of history, the witch of greed. Echidona, all those were my laurels in life. Though it's true not every one of them would be what you'd call honorable. And, it is also true that sealing a contract with me did not necessarily save all of them. What Minerva put forth was something Subaru never knew about. Following on Minerva's words, Ikidona insisted on her lack of any ill will towards Subaru. Stuck between the two as they asserted their stances, Subaru's head was at the peak of disarray. He didn't know whose words to believe. Ever since Subaru got involved in the trials inside the tomb, his multiple meetings with Ikidona and all the time they spent together deliberating over his worries had led him to consider her a sort of comrade in arms. And so, when she proposed to forge a contract to formally seal their cooperation, a part of Subaru even felt relieved. On the other hand, compared to the time he had spent with Ikidona, he had had very few opportunities to speak with Minerva. Yet each time, it was when he was on the brink of collapse that she mercifully saved him with her mighty arms before exiting like a hurricane without demanding even a thank you in return. Minerva had no reason to deceive Subaru, so if it was a matter important enough for her to manifest herself to intercede, then there might be reason for him to carefully reconsider. Or, actually, rather than pondering like this, he should first be asking this question. That is. Subaru, Ikidona. If we seal this contract, you'll have to get something in return, right? Echidona, MN, that's correct. Contracts require compensation. Just as I will offer you the knowledge you seek, you will present me with the compensation I desire. Subaru, of course. Right. So, what do you want from me? If I contract with you, what will I need to give you? From here on, Whenever he gets stuck in a hopeless deadlock and needs Echidona's help, what will he need to pay? To his question, Echidona's cheeks softened into a smile. Echidona, nothing you need to be so wary about. What I want from you is not so hard to give. In fact, since the compensation I seek is neither material, nor immaterially precious, you could say that mine is more than a fair offer. Subaru, and what is it? That you want? Echidona, it's simple, what you feel, what you think, what lingers within your heart, what you know, what you do, what you create, and all of the fruits called the unknown born from your very existence, I want to savor. Always. Echidona's face blushed, like that of a young maiden with a crush. The fruits called the unknown dash, that poetic phrasing made Subaru furrow his brows. Subaru, the hells. That? You want me to hand over my feelings, my memories, my recollections, is that what you mean? In that case. Echidona, didn't I tell you? It's nothing so troubling. I just want to witness the sights you see, the melodies you hear, the stories you weave, all from a special box seat. All I want is to experience it. To be in a position to know the the unknowns you create. With that, and that alone, I will be satisfied. To dispel Subaru's concerns, Ikidona clearly stated her demands. 
It was simply to watch Subaru walk his path. To see the same sights he sees. To know feel he feels, know he knows, and witness the results of his actions. The incarnation of the thirst for knowledge, the witch bearing the crown of greed, wanted only that. Subaru, you aren't, lying to me, are you? Ikidona, lying about the terms of a contract would be absurd. As for myself, I pledge that I will never do anything to betray those words. I swear this on my life. Placing her hand on her chest, though, I am already dead, Ikidona concluded with a quip. Subaru could sense no deception in her words or behavior. Or perhaps, it was because he wanted to believe her. Subaru, Minerva. Since Ikidona's already said that. I think I'll. Question mark I it's all. True, but. She hasn't, told you every, thing, has she? Just as Subaru asked Minerva to release him from her hold, this time, he heard another person's voice addressing him. It was a voice he had heard only ten odd minutes ago, a voice for which Subaru had absolutely no positive feelings for. Subaru, Camilla. Witch of lust. Camilla, do. D look at me. With those scary eyes. I, I'm. Not even, doing any, thing. Or, awful. Subaru, the scary eyes are inborn. I'm not trying to make an especially intense expression or anything. With Subaru still held against the ground, in front of him stood Ikidona and behind him was Minerva, the three of them forming a straight line, while, sitting on the grass a short distance away, was a pink-haired girl, Camilla. She timidly hid her face from Subaru's gaze, and only now and then peeked over. Her attitude was irritating as always, but by consciously keeping his attention off of her, he managed to avoid being captivated to a life-threatening degree. Then, he asked again. Subaru, but anyway, what were you talking about? I won't complain about more witches showing up at this point, but if there's anyth. Camilla, Iikidona Chan is. Hiding lots and lots of things, you know? She, isn't lying, but. She's hiding lots, and lots. Subaru, hiding. What? Pondering over Camilla's words, Subaru imploringly looked towards Ikidona, while Ikidona turned to the suddenly appeared Camilla and narrowed one of her eyes. Ikidona, and I was wondering why you came out all of a sudden, so it's to badmouth me is it? Actually, how is it that he's caught your eye? Unlike Minerva, I don't see a reason why you'd get all cozy with him. I thought you didn't like him. Camilla, eh, a reason, like. Minerva-chan? No, I don't have, any. Thing like, that. But, Ikidona-chan, you. T.R. tricked, me. Didn't you? Speaking in a frail and stuttering voice, Camilla looked down as she responded to Ikidona's methodical statements. However, unlike the frailty of her voice, the actual contents of her words implied no weakness or compromise. Camilla puttered her fidgety gaze around, glancing several times at Ikidona. Camilla, I I don't like, him, but, you tr tricked, me. E Ikidona chan, so I'm, not, on your side any, any more, you know? People, who trick, me, hate, me. Do, mean things to me, I. I will never forgive. Those last words alone were spoken with incredible clarity. It was such that, for a moment, Subaru couldn't process the fact that those words had come from the girl beside him. So utterly detached that voice was from his impression of this girl up to now. Except. Camilla, dash dash. Wordlessly, yet determined and unwaveringly, Camilla stared at Ikidona. In her eyes there churned an indescribable emotion, a whirlpool of something dark and grudging, unforgiving of the one who had offended her with their transgression. A pure mass of narcissism, the description suddenly scraped across Subaru's mind. Ikidona, while it may have been a necessary measure, doing something contrary to Camilla's desires was a mistake on my part. There is nothing more unenviable than making an enemy of you, Camilla. Camilla, e everyone, is, on my side. So, it, won't be pleasant, to have me, hate, you, you know. You can, a apologize, but, I won't, forgive, you. 
Camilla wasn't just an equal balance of timidness and rebellion. Her personality was so introverted that she was too timid to even properly communicate with others, but that had very little to do with the intensity of her retribution against those who wronged her. Subaru, what have you all been? What have you all been talking about? Finally disrupting the perilous atmosphere between the witches, Subaru broke his silence and blurted out. Feeling the gazes of all three witches falling on him, Subaru frantically turned his neck, and... Subaru, how long are you gonna leave me out of the conversation? I, I'm the one who has to choose here. Say it in a way I can understand. Ikidona, what are you hiding? And you too, what is it you know that's making you want to stop me? Minerva, putting you in this mentally feeble state so that you'd grab onto any offered hand without thinking. It's all her careful planning that's lured you here. Ikidona, you make me sound like a villain. Won't that make him misunderstand? If we seal this contract, I will certainly help him, and guide him to the optimal destination he desires. My only request is to see what he sees, hear what he hears, and learn what he learns in the process. Not a single one of the things I said was false. Minerva blasted back at the protesting Subaru, her voice trembling in rage. All the while, Ikidona remained calm as always. Listening to the pristine clarity of Akidona's voice, Subaru began sensing that something was awry. Having overcome the state of heated delirium up to now, he once again scrutinized over Akidona's words. Over her attitude, and why the other two witches tried to stop him. What was out of place? She didn't say anything strange. Both of the other two witches acknowledged that she wasn't lying. So then, where was the problem? Akidona, I will repeat, Natsuki Subaru. If you choose me, choose to seal this contract with me, I will without fail lead you to the place you desire. Question mark dash, in the end, would be the necessary disclaimer to this promise, right? Ha! Just as Ikidona reached out her hand to Subaru, a listless voice covered over her words. Looking up, he saw a monster made of magenta hair who had appeared opposite Camilla, sitting on the ground, buried in her own long hair, it was the Witch of Sloth. The increasing number of witches didn't surprise Subaru any more. But, what Subaru did pick up was. Subaru, in the, end? Sekhmet, I'm sure a Kidona, who? Is certain to fulfill the contract, ha. Huh? But, so long as she maintains the fact, Hayu. That she intends to fulfill the contract, ha. Huh? She can probably do whatever she likes in the process, who? Subaru, do, whatever she. Tying together Sekhmet's intermittent, huffing words with the sense of oriness he had felt earlier, a single explanation emerged in Subaru's mind. But that explanation was simply too hard to accept. His face stiffening in shock, Subaru looked towards Ikidona, who had closed her eyes, and. Subaru, Ikidona, if I contract with you. You will definitely lead me to the optimal future, that's what you're saying? Ikidona, yes, it is. That is a fact. Without a doubt, I will carry out this contract to the end. With my knowledge and your ability, we will certainly be able to achieve it. Yes, surely, the contract will be properly fulfilled. There were no lies in Ikidona's words. If Subaru cooperates with her, they will certainly be able to save everyone and reach that perfect future. However, Subaru, as you guide me towards the optimal future, will we be taking the optimal path? Ikidona, dash dash. Subaru, will you truly be doing everything in your power to bring me to the place I desire? Ikidona, dash dash. Subaru, why are you saying nothing? Answer me, Ikidona. No. Witch of greed. Lifting his head, Subaru screamed at the top of his lungs. Though still held against the ground with his joints locked in place, Subaru paid it no heed as he single-mindedly glared at Ikidona. On the other end of his razor-sharp gaze, Ikidona let out a small sigh. Ikidona, if you wish to reach the optimal future, you would have to permit certain sacrifices along the way. Could it be that you lack even that resolve, Natsuki Subaru? Subaru, dash gh. Her response neither affirmed nor denied what Subaru had asked her. But, 
Subaru had realized it. Ikidona's words just now weren't meant to dispel his doubts. Instead, as if intending to make her thoughts known to him, she spread out her arms. Ikidona, this extraordinary ability you possess, the authority of return by death, its utility is something you don't yet truly comprehend. By refusing to allow endings that are contrary to your desires, you repeatedly retry, and repeatedly reach for the future, that is the near-perfect ideal of an inquirer. But of course. In the first place, once an event has reached its outcome, it would mean that no other outcome could take its place. While in the process of reaching an outcome, it is possible to hypothesize on various possibilities of what that outcome may be. Such an approach under such conditions can serve to verify such various hypotheses, but when there is an actual result you want to reach, the outcome of each experiment and the hypothesis it verifies must forever remain singular. All the while, to truly reproduce the exact same conditions is impossible. No matter how meticulous the preparation, deviation from the conditions of that particular point in time is inevitable. And so too, is the question, what would the results have been if I had done things differently? Dash, forever out of the reach of an inquirer such as myself, instead being what you'd call a dream beyond a dream. Possessing the memories of the world, there are indeed ways in which I could come to know the answers. But while they exist, I have no desire to use or rely on such methods. My desire to know is not simply a desire to have knowledge. Even for me, that distinction is quite a contradictory and loathsome thing. But I'm getting carried away, let's return to the topic at hand. For one such as myself, with no choice but to accept the singularity of the outcomes, having but one means of observation, your existence and your authority is a godsend, using the same conditions to conduct a different test, and see a different outcome from what originally should have been Dash, who would not desire such ultimate authority. Seeing it laid before one's eyes, who could go without first trying absolutely everything? Of course, I have no intention of taking it by force. In the end, you will be making full use of return by death for your purposes. I will ensure that you reach your desired future to the absolute best of my ability. And, in the process, if possible, I would like to sate my curiosity to the fullest possible extent. Surely, you won't fault me for such a measly request? You will get your answers. I will sate my curiosity. Our interests are entirely aligned. Since I don't know the answers myself, I certainly won't misguide you on purpose towards the most wretched endings possible. When first encountering a problem, I'll be just as ignorant as you are to what the optimal solution may be. So together, we will ponder, agonize and find the answers as comrades. I can say this without the slightest embarrassment. I am immensely fond of you, that is, for your capacity to increase my means of inquiry, and I swear I will never do anything to impede you. Of course, when initially without answers, I cannot guarantee a smooth resolution to every problem even with my help. While I can aid you with the strength of my knowledge, I can never directly interfere with reality. Should the obstacle before you require physical, material strength, I cannot help you. Time after time, perhaps in the hundreds and thousands, your mind and body may be shattered and torn. But if and when it is, I will faithfully tend to your heart. I must admit that not wanting to lose something as useful as you has a part to do with it. But, my fondness for you, and my intention to lend you my strength is genuine. I hope you won't think badly of me. Though I've said this over and over, I am confident that I will prove valuable to achieving your purposes. Indeed, just as I will be, in a sense, using you to satisfy the greed of my curiosity, you can also use me to attain your perfect future. It is precisely my wish to become that convenient girl you can always call on. If it means spurring you onward, then I will gladly offer you my very existence. Although, paltry as it is, seeing how I'm already dead, whether you will have me is another question. Alas, I suppose that would be unfair to those girls within your thoughts. The subject of your longing, the silver-haired half-elf, and the blue-haired demon, the girls that your heart has sworn to save and protect. I won't go into what I think about the intense emotions you feel towards them, but I will simply say this, the barricade standing before you is far greater than you could possibly imagine. Just the obstacles you are aware of now already have you struggling at your wit's end. While your resolve to overcome them alone is admirable, it would be far too desperate a fight. 
There is not the slightest falsehood in my desire to lend you my help. And you have every reason to make use of my willingness. You must use everything you have, use everything you can, and only then can you save the ones you hold dear. Isn't that the oath you have sworn, and the conviction you took onto the painful path you have chosen? That is why I challenge you, repeat with you, and feel for you. The path you have sacrificed your lives to forge, as ironic as it is, has now been validated in the form of the second trial. Perhaps, the trial might offer the illusion that it existed to make you understand the nature of the path you have walked, and as such, was necessary. Yet the truth is it wasn't necessary, and those scenes in fact only served to wear down your heart. However, between a state of ignorance and a state of knowing, no matter how appalling the truth may be, I will always value the latter. You have, and will continue to use your life as the price for returning by death and for inching ever closer to the future. As you do so, you will constantly keep in the back of your mind the possibility that the sacrifices you have made and those worlds themselves might still exist in some form or another. Until one day, you will cease to feel anything about paying with your life, your human emotions will have faded away, the deaths of the people precious to you will no longer strike upon your heart, and so drowning your days in unmovable, emotionless apathy, even if you eventually reach that perfect future, there would be nothing left of you to hold it, therefore, in order to avoid drifting into a future in which only that tediousness remains, this is necessary. Indeed, there is not a single useless thing in this world, every path is necessary, everything is an indispensable piece of the puzzle, it was for you to understand this that the trial existed. If you need to make sense of the reasons why you have now stopped in your tracks, then you can think of it this way. And I will affirm your thoughts. If my words can give you the strength to move forward, then I will endeavor to give them. Be it consolation, incitement, whispers of love, or evocations of contempt, if it can become your strength then I will not hesitate to use it. You might hate it, but you will certainly need me on your path ahead. If you are to proceed along this road of unavoidable pain and solitude, then you will need someone to walk alongside you who will never veer their sight from the path. If you leave this role to me and to no one else, then I am willing to walk this road alongside you without question. I will repeat it, I will restate it, I will convey it as many times as necessary until it reaches you. You need me. And I need you. I need you immensely. My curiosity can no longer be quenched by anything except you. You are the only one in existence who can satisfy me. My insatiable greed would be fulfilled by you alone. Your existence is already indispensable to me in this closed-off world. If you wish to be someone else's hope and use your power to slice open their world, could you not take pity on my miserable selves, so that I may partake in the fallen scraps as well? If you will bequeath me this kindness, then without a moment's hesitation, I will offer up my body, my knowledge and my soul. And so I beg of you. Please trust me. That I haven't told you my true feelings until now was never because I wanted to deceive you. I was merely waiting for the right moment to do so. At this stage, the instant I appealed to you with even a fragment of my true intentions, you surely would have left me. That would have been an unbearable loss to me. And of course, for you as well, as it would certainly be a loss in the sense that you'd be distancing yourself from the future you seek. Although, with the power of return by death, you will inevitably reach your desired future. Nevertheless, it will certainly be preferable to reach that future while paying as little in compensation as possible. With me, with me you can lighten that price. I do not want you to make the mistake of thinking that this means as long as you reach the desired future, the greater good can overrule the lesser and the details can be held in contempt. Indeed, falling into temptation and failing to advise you of the optimal path just so I can see the end of a thread, is not something which I am so confident in my control over my desires that I can guarantee will never happen. This I will admit. But, I will never mislead you. If on the off chance I do betray your trust in this way, I will under no circumstances try to hide it from you. I will certainly disclose it. And then, do everything in my power to repair that damaged trust. No matter what happens, I will deliver you to the perfect future you desire. Absolutely. Absolutely. And now, if you agree that this is necessary, then won't you choose me? All I want from you, all I ask of you is as I have mentioned in the contract. 
After that, it is simply a matter of how much suffering you are willing to endure for your desired, coveted wish. I have told you my resolve. Now I would like to hear yours. Prove it to me, seal this contract with me, enlist my assistance, and muster the will to reach your destined future. Do so, and you may for the first time boast that you have conquered the second trial. From there, proceed to the third trial, and overcoming that, liberate the sanctuary. Then, considering the disaster that will befall the sanctuary, those you love, and those you hold dear, that shall be greatest trial of all. Show me that you have the strength and resolve to surmount it. Once you do, plunder me, use my knowledge, and take hold of the future ahead. What I desire from you, what I request from you, and what I offer you in return is as I have stated, all is as I have sincerely, honestly, willingly confessed it. So now, I want you to tell me, what is your decision? That, in itself, would satisfy a portion of my curiosity. A lovely smile rose onto Ikedona's face. With her white, snow-like hair swaying and her cheeks flushed red from the heat of passion, she turned up her eyes to Subaru, awaiting his answer. Ikedona's eyelashes trembled in trepidation for his reply, as her fingers holding her chest anxiously fidgeted about. Her lips tried several times to speak, but, hesitating, she merely moistened them with her tongue. Subaru looked up into the eyes of the one restraining him, Minerva. For a while, they went on staring at each other, until Minerva spilled a small sigh and finally released Subaru's arm. Freed from her hold, Subaru stood up with a roll of his shoulders. Just as Minerva promised, the aching in his shoulders was gone. In fact, he could feel that his somewhat tensed waist and other parts of his body have been purged of their fatigue as well. Such was the terrifying healing of the authority of the Witch of Wrath. Subaru, dash dash. Rolling out various parts of his body, Subaru checked the sensations in his limbs as he reorganized his thoughts, about what he had heard just now, of Ikidona's unreserved, truest of true intentions. Subaru, Ikidona. Ikidona, yes? Subaru, you're going to use me? To use and be used. That was what Ikidona had repeatedly proclaimed in her speech. Hearing it, Ikidona nodded without hesitation. Ikidona, I am. Just as you may use me. The contract is merely a safeguard should either of us stray from that agreement. If you wish to chastise me for wanting to do everything in my power to hold on to you, then I can only resignedly accept it. Subaru, it's not that I haven't thought about it. Ultimately, that's what mutual interest is, I understand this too. As much as I hoped that you were only helping me out of the kindness of your heart. I was at least prepared to accept the reality that you weren't, but... In front of Akidona, Subaru covered his face with his hand and leaned back his head. Subaru, it's just, not there anymore. Akidona, what? Isn't? Subaru, everything you have done up to this point. Looks faded to me now. Every warmth you have shown me, everything that made me want to trust you, to start believing that perhaps you weren't a bad person after all. All of it, has faded. Everything from their first meeting to this moment suddenly collapsed with a thud. Their first tea party, the scene after the trial, and those countless times, impeded by reality, he had imposed on her wisdom, when he had thought that he could not regret sealing a contract with her. All of it was now mercilessly jeering at Natsuki Subaru's foolishness. Subaru, was this your intention from the start? Ikidona, I don't see what you have a problem with. If it means reaching the optimal future, then you won't hesitate to take whatever path to get there, isn't that the resolve you have made? You yourself have affirmed it, and I was merely agreeing and giving you a push on the back. Subaru, when I decided that. When I hadn't yet, and you tried to guide me down that path, was that all a part of your plan? Is that what you're telling me? Ikidona, I wouldn't want you to misunderstand. That conclusion was entirely your own. All I've done was give you a little nudge. To blame your own conclusions on someone else is something I cannot agree with. I cannot agree with it, and I am not so meek that I just sit down and take it. Pouting up her lips, Ikidona's face helped in protest. 
That display of emotion was so childish and out of place that it only intensified Subaru's sense of incongruity. Somehow, there was just something off about the degree of her affectations. There was nothing wrong with where Ikidona expressed her emotions. She would be indignant when doubted, smile when there was something to be happy about, and let slip glimpses of grief when there was reason to be sad. All of these were on point, and without error. Yet this sense of incongruity, and the distrust it inspired, was because. Subaru, all your emotions are synthetic. And superficial. Echidona, dash dash. Subaru, whether you're happy, or mad, your emotions are equally childish and shallow. Just now, when you were riled, all you did was pout. It had nothing to do with magnanimity. Your reactions. All your reactions have been strange. Before. I had thought. You were just an easy-going, open-minded person, but. Echidona, dash dash. Subaru, the truth is something else. You're, you're someone who can't understand other people's emotions at all. Recalling all of Echidona's behavior up to now, it was as if everything had been toned in sepia. What he had previously imagined to be her good nature had in fact merely been owing to the shallowness of her emotions. The moment he saw through this, all their interactions abruptly faded of color. And, even when showered by these unsparing words, Echidona's face remained unchanged from the sulking expression from before, as if she didn't know any way to express any greater discomfort. Subaru, this is where you're supposed to be angry, you know. Echidona, is that so? So here is where I should raise my voice, and shower you with insults? I see, now I learn something, I'll make sure I do so the next time I get the opportunity. With the fall of Subaru's words, Echidona's expression vanished. Expressionless, it was something Subaru had never seen from the Echidona he knew, but the true face of the Witch of Greed. In front of Subaru, who had fallen into silence, Echidona snapped her fingers. In an instant, the destroyed hillock was restored to its original shape, and the shattered table and scattered chairs were formed anew. Echidona sat down in one of the chairs, and pointed to the one opposite her. Echidona, would you like to sit? I'd like us to iron out the details of the contract. Subaru, with things as they are, do you still think I'll readily consider a contract with you? Echidona, unless, you are really going to reject me over such a small disagreement. What would be the point of that? Driven by the impulse of a moment to abandon the correct choice can't be considered wise. I suggest you take a good look at reality, and select the most rational course of action. Faced with Echidona's words that were frozen of emotion, Subaru closed his eyes and held his breath. Echidona was right. Subaru was the one who was losing himself to impulse, there was no way around it. Her argument was sound. Nor was she lying. All Echidona did was hide her true intentions from Subaru. She had merely kept silent about how she benefited from observing Subaru on his path. If he sealed this contract, chances were, he would finally reach the correct solutions. And that he would obtain Echidona's unreserved cooperation was also an indisputable fact. Subaru, there is one thing. I've been meaning to ask you the moment I got to see you again. Echidona, hum. And what is that? Subaru, once I hear the answer, I think I'll be ready to choose. Echidona awaited Subaru's question. Subaru would put forth this question as his touchstone, the question he hadn't been able to find even a fragment of an answer to since embarking on the loop starting in the sanctuary. A question which she could not possibly have nothing to do with. Subaru, you know about Beatrice, don't you, Echidona? Echidona, yes. I do. I was rather deeply involved in her creation, in fact. Did something happen with her? Echidona returned this innocent reply, seemingly bearing no hidden meaning, yet rife with questions all the same. Subaru closed his eyes once more, and saw the girl with drill curls in his mind. In her last moments, with her back pierced through, just before she vanished. At the end of her long, long solitude, the shadow she had cast within him remained heavy in his heart. Knocking Subaru aside, shielding him from that murderous blade, that final expression she showed him, even now, was seared into the back of his eyes, refusing to fade. 
And so, Subaru, because of her contract, Beatrice has been waiting for that person to come. Are you the one who forged this contract with her? Are you the one who bound her to the mansion? Ikidona, I don't remember specifying a location. But I was the one who received her promise to guard the forbidden library and to wait for someone to come. Subaru, then. Who is that person? What'll I have to do to free her? Through four hundred years of solitude, Beatrice had been waiting for someone, yet not even Beatrice herself knew who that someone was. Nor did Subaru have the slightest clue. But if he asked Ikidona herself, the one who had arranged this promise in the first place. Ikidona, now who would it be, I wonder? Subaru H, ah? Uh? Ikidona, no no, I wasn't joking, I really am wondering. Who do you think Beatrice's awaited person would be? Ikidona asked, as if she had been presented with a question she did not know the answer to. Stunned by this reply, Subaru shook his head. Subaru, even you. Don't know who Beatrice is waiting for? Ikidona, no, I don't. I have no idea who Beatrice's awaited person would be. Subaru, but... How? Weren't you the one who told her to wait in the Forbidden Library? If you don't know, then. Unless. The one who instructed Beatrice to wait in the Forbidden Library was a Kidona, but it could have been someone else who set the condition for her to wait for that person to come. If so, then the one who would know the answer would again be someone else. Ikidona, no, you're mistaken. Subaru, dash dash. Ikidona, I was the one who instructed Beatrice to wait for that person. You weren't wrong about that. What you got wrong was something more fundamental. Subaru, funda, mental? Ikidona, just why in the world did I seal this contract with Beatrice? That is where you were misunderstanding. I made Beatrice guard the forbidden library so that she could give its contents to that person, is that what you thought? He couldn't understand what Ikidona was saying. It was just a natural assumption. When instructing someone to give something to someone else, naturally, the intention was for that thing to end up in the right person's hands. But, in front of Subaru's instinctive interpretation, Ikidona shook her head, and said. Ikidona, that wasn't the point of my instruction to Beatrice. I sealed the contract with her, having her wait for that person, but I was also waiting to see who she would choose that person to be. Subaru, dash dash. What? Ikidona, you see, that child was created for a specific purpose, but necessity arose for her to live in a way that differed from her original purpose. For that, she had to go far away from here, and there, she needed to be given a new purpose. For that child, who now had nothing, it was necessary to give her a reason to live. It was for that, that I sealed this contract with her. Subaru, Tha, Tease. Ikidona, watching over the forbidden library, and eventually handing it over in its entirety to that person who was destined to come. I place no limitations, since, in the first place, there is no correct answer. She stays alive just as planned, and I have another result to look forward to. It's quite logical, don't you think? Subaru, dash dash. Ikidona, of course, going four hundred years without choosing anyone is a result in itself. So was the fact that she did not simply choose one of the people she had met in her days to be that person. And potentially, her deliberations over whether to break the contract, desiring for her own death, is also a result in itself. Subaru, and how? Do you feel about that? Ikidona, dash? It's quite marvelous, I think. As if she had just been asked something incredibly obvious, Ikidona innocently tilted her head. That reply, that attitude, and the expression of the girl he saw in his mind, all led him to the answer. It's decided. Understood. Clearly understood. His misconception about who this person was that he was dealing with, has been rectified. Subaru, Ikidona. You really, are a witch. Ikidona, dash dash. Subaru, an inexplicable, unfathomable, monster. Ikidona, dash dash. He told her. The answer that was in his heart. He withdrew the hand he had almost given her, 
and as for who it would now reach out to, he has already decided. Subaru, I. I can't take your hand. I've already decided whose hand I'll be taking. Echidona, dash dash. Subaru, with those callous, binding words, without the slightest malice, you stole four hundred years from that girl. I've already decided. I'll be taking that girl's hand. Not yours. That was their farewell. With it, he shook away the hand of the one he once thought would walk alongside him. He lifted his face, and looked forward. Beneath his eyelids, he saw that girl's final expression. Disappearing, dying, afraid, twisted as if about to cry, but nonetheless relieved that she had protected Subaru. He would take the hand of the girl who mourned his death, that much was decided. Echidona, dash dash. Echidona's eyes narrowed. Flickers of thought flashed through her irises as if pondering on what words to say to Subaru. Yet before she could, the change had arrived. Minerva, dash is here. Camilla, oh, no, I. I don't want, anything, to do with. This, any more. Sekhmet, at a troublesome time, a troublesome person, has come to cause more trouble, ha. The three onlooking witches all gave their respective reactions. He felt an overwhelming pressure on his back. While in front, staring at what was behind him, Echidona's eyes slightly widened. Following her astonished gaze, Subaru turned around, and saw it. Question mark dash dash. With everything above her neck shrouded in pitch darkness, there stood the Witch of Envy. ARC 4 The Everlasting Covenant Chapter 76 does not equal Satella. This would be the first time Subaru had ever met face to face with the witch herself like this. The Witch of Envy, it was a name which he had heard countless times before, and a witch whose threat he had experienced firsthand during their showdown in that loop inside the sanctuary. Defying the rules she had one-sidedly imposed upon him, it wasn't once or twice that he had tasted the pain of his heart being crushed within her grasp, nor was it easy for him to have any positive impressions of the witch who possessed Emilia's body while unleashing destruction upon the sanctuary. It was especially so now, after his last conversation with Echidona had spawned within him an aversion to the word witch itself. But. Subaru, right. This one. Is on a whole different level from the other witches. Facing the pressure emanating from the witch standing before him, Subaru squeezed out this hoarse mutter. It was a slender woman, standing languishingly with her arms dangling at her sides, she seemed to be staring at Subaru. Shrouding over her body was a pitch-black dress, literally woven from the shadows rising from her feet, pulsing, as if in rhythm with her heartbeat. Though her sleeves were long, he could eerily see her hands from the tips of her pale fingers up to her wrists. Chances were, like the other witches, the Witch of Envy must be exceedingly beautiful but the most vital piece required to confirm this was missing. Subaru, seen it quite a few times now. But what's with this? An impenetrable shadow covered everything above the witch's neck, making visual confirmation impossible. Unlike the darkness of her dress, the shadow drifted about like a mist, hiding the face of the Witch of Envy from Subaru. The witch gave no reaction to the dumbstruck Subaru's question. Driven by the surging apprehension scorching inside his heart, sweat emerged on Subaru's forehead as he looked to the ones around him, at the other four witches, watching in absolute silence, Subaru, dash dash. But when he saw the change in their expressions, Subaru was taken aback. As far as he knew, the relationship between the Witch of Envy and the other witches was that between a murderer and her victims. To meet their own killer, Subaru was at least aware of how much mental distress that should bring. But the expressions on the witches' faces were nothing like what Subaru had imagined. One was a gentle smile, one was a gaze of saddened sympathy, one was of innocent indifference, and lastly. Echidona, so you have broken my boundary to get in here. Brazenly trespassing into my dream citadel. Always the egotist, aren't you? Only one, Echidona glared at the Witch of Envy with eyes of pure hostility. Seeing that hatred, or something like it, from none other than a Kidona astonished Subaru. Just now, 
he had voiced his final farewell thinking that she was incapable of such feelings, yet this blatant outpour of emotion made him wonder if he had been mistaken. Although, realistically speaking, the time for such thoughts had already passed. Right now, the problem was how to deal with this motionless which before his eyes. Subaru, but why is she here in the furs? Minerva, because you made her mad by blabbing about stuff you shouldn't have? I don't know what to do with men like you who can't keep their mouths shut. I can kinda get why she'd be furious. Subaru, what, I don't get it. I mean, are you actually taking her side? I thought you and the witches were her enemies. Minerva, enemies, what kind of stupid question is that? I'll show you now and we'll see if you're right or wrong. Narrowing her eyes at Subaru, Minerva swayed her blonde hair as she jolted into action. Cutting in front of the Witch of Envy's line of sight that was fixed on Subaru, she pushed out her busty chest as she magnificently faced down the witch. And then... Minerva, can you hear me? It's me, Minerva. Witch of Wrath Minerva. If you remember me and hear me, say something. Subaru, dash. No, W wait. As far as I know, talking won't work with her. If you do anything weird to provoke her. Sekhmet, just keep quiet and watch, ha. In Subaru's eyes, what Minerva was doing could only be called reckless, but just as he tried to stop her, he was interrupted by the hairball sprawling on the ground, Sekhmet. Subaru turned around, while the magenta-colored hairball that was Sekhmet slightly shifted in size. Sekhmet, the time we spent together with that thing, who? Is many times longer than what your short interactions have been, ha. It's only natural that you'd be worried, who? But you can leave it to Minerva, ha. She does things without thinking sometimes, who? But, that's probably not the case this time, ha. Minerva, I can hear you, Sekhmet. If you don't want me to mess up the conversation and get all of us swallowed, then don't say things that'll make me mad. I'm all ready to blow here. Sekhmet, when you can get mad at people, who? Just for breathing in front of you, ha. Huh? What am I supposed to do, who? Even while getting hit with that unflattering critique, Minerva did not take her eyes off of the threat in front of her. The Witch of Envy also made no reaction to this little back and forth, but only stood there, unmoving, staring through the Witch of Wrath at Subaru. Indeed, this was definitely a departure from the direct, instinctive reactions the witch had exhibited up to now. But all that meant was that she hadn't taken any hostile actions so far, and whether or not a conversation could be established between them was still a different matter. All the while, as Sekhmet left the conversation entirely to Minerva, the other two witches. Camilla, well I I. Think, if, Minerva Chan, T.R. tries her, best. I it'll, turn out, all right. You know? But if, she. Who hurts, Minerva Chan, I I'll kill, her. Echidona, I don't doubt it, but as I've told you before, your affinity is terrible with that thing. The only one here who can resist it is Sekhmet. Do you understand? Echidona kept her voice as calm as she could as she pacified the stuttering but belligerent Camilla. Meanwhile, noticing the white-haired witch's gaze, the bundle of hair shuddered as if even replying was too much of a nuisance. Sekhmet, even I can't keep its movement sealed for long, ha. Huh? You know that my abilities aren't suited for that, who? Echidona, of course I know. That's why you just have to crush its limbs and snap its neck. Once you disable its movements and stop its breathing, I can abolish it from this space with my own hands. There was enough hostility in Echidona's words to make Camilla's statement seem cute. Though she said it with a casual air, the unconcealable disgust seeping into her voice made it clear that she wasn't joking. In front of the Witch of Envy alone, Echidona left no shred of doubt about the certainty of her contempt. While this perilous conversation was going on behind her, Minerva continued her standoff against the Witch of Envy. In fact, as if trying to keep the Witch of Envy from overhearing the other witches, she took a step closer. Subaru, dash dash. Subaru gulped down his breath as he watched Minerva's advance. While Minerva's actions simply seemed insane to Subaru, 
it made even less sense why the Witch of Envy appeared here in the first place. If this was like the previous times, the Witch of Envy would have shown up because Subaru had violated the taboo. But the witch's method so far had been materializing her arm to clench at his heart and physically appearing in reality to swallow everything into shadow. Never mind friendly interactions, the Witch of Envy had never even explained what her intentions were. Her goals were just as mysterious now, as they were from the very beginning. And so, just how the witch would react to Minerva's actions was still completely unknown to Subaru. If Minerva got swallowed by the shadow, the other three behind her would move instantly. If Echidona's expectations for Sekhmet were justified, the Witch of Sloth should be able to crush the Witch of Envy with her authority, and Echidona would be able to expel the weakened Witch of Envy from this place. But, if that was the case, Subaru just couldn't understand why they weren't doing it now. Subaru, dash dash. Speaking of strange, the fact that Minerva was tasked with making contact with the Witch of Envy in the first place was very strange. Camilla only swore to retaliate if something happened, Sekhmet did not seem to want any active hostility, and even Echidona, overflowing with contempt, did not defy Minerva's wishes by ordering a preemptive strike. Just what on earth were they thinking? Echidona, you look like you're getting spun around trying to understand us witches just now. Subaru. Echidona, although, if our. I mean, if our thoughts could be seen through so easily, we wouldn't be called witches. I'd feel troubled if you took us so lightly, Donia started using Boku to refer to herself again. Subaru, cut it out with the fake Bokoko already. I just thought if you really wanted to expel the Witch of Envy, now would be the best chance to do it while she's defenseless. Ikidona, I see. Is that how you perceive this situation? Oh my. Mn, is that right? Personally, I'm all for what you are proposing. After all, nothing would make me happier than to bash that thing with every authority I can muster and annihilate it until not even a speck of dust remains, but... Cutting off her words there, Ikidona narrowed her eyes. That attitude wasn't like her at all, it wasn't like he really knew her even now, but Subaru nevertheless sensed a certain reluctance that was entirely unlike her as he waited for her next words. After a short silence, Ikidona continued. Ikidona, doing everything in my power to eradicate the thing and having the other witches turn on me would be putting the cart before the horse. Never mind Minerva, but it'd be a rather terrible bet to make enemies of Sekhmet and Typhon. Subaru, I don't get it. Why would expelling the Witch of Envy make them turn on you? She's your enemy, the same should go for all of you. Camilla, it's not like, that, though? Camilla, who had kept silent up to now, suddenly interrupted Subaru's question. Without looking at the startled Subaru, Camilla went on watching Minerva's standoff against the Witch of Envy, and quietly stuttered. Camilla, Envy is, everyone's, enemy, that's. Right, but, that thing. And, her, are, different, you know? Subaru, what's that supposed to mean? What are you guys? Sekhmet, as long as we don't know. Which one that thing over there is, who? It's not just that we don't want to. It'd also be unreasonable. Ha! Subaru, which? One? Sekhmet followed up with her explanation, but hearing it only threw Subaru into even further disarray. What on earth were they talking about? Yet, the answer came from a different direction. Taking a step forward, Minerva moved closer to the Witch of Envy. She spread out her arms, assuming a posture of non-resistance, and asked the Witch of Envy. Minerva, are you the Witch of Envy? Or are you Satella? Witch? He felt like he had just heard something that would turn everything he knew on its head. Minerva's question ran completely contrary to what Subaru thought he understood. But the silence of the other witches who had personally lived through that era only confirmed that Minerva was neither confused nor joking. Hearing Minerva's call, for the first time, the Witch of Envy's shoulders trembled. The black mist concealing her head writhed, as she apparently turned towards Minerva. It was only now that the witch seemed to have noticed Minerva's existence. Subaru, dash dash. What did she mean when she said that? 
There was no time for Subaru to ask, even as the sense of apprehension tightening in his throat rapidly exacerbated his restlessness. The witch's affirmation only further confounded Subaru's thoughts. Since, Minerva's words would mean that. The one called the Witch of Envy, Satella, might in fact be a different person. No. That would be over-interpreting from the little information he was given. How many times had he gone through painful experiences because he fell into such stubborn assumptions with only superficial clues to go on? Although he must always consider the possibilities, he mustn't get stuck with any particular idea. More importantly, he couldn't afford to divert his attention from the scene before him for even a second. Minerva, since you didn't attack me at the very first question, there's still a chance. Saying this, Minerva closed the distance. Between the Witch of Wrath and the Witch, there were now only five steps remaining. Minerva, though, if you were the Witch of Envy, I'd be surprised if you didn't attack out of jealousy the moment I came between you two. So I'm not that worried. Four steps, Minerva, then again, you could have said something right from the start. I mean, I know we don't get many chances to meet face to face in our relationship. And your last expression, when you swallowed me back then isn't something I can forget. Three steps. Minerva, rather than the other five, I thought it'd be better if it was me. Besides Typhon, out of the other witches, I was your closest friend, I thought. Two steps. She lowered her head. Minerva, yeah, that's what I thought. And because I thought this. Stooping down, with only two steps between them, Minerva leaned forward, pouring her strength into her back leg. And. Minerva, do you realize what it feels like to be ignored, when it's been so long? The ground exploded, instantly annihilating the distance between them. Minerva charged forward leaving a cloud of dust in her wake as she twisted her body to punch with all her might. Piercing the air, breaking through the sound barrier with a thunderous clap, the strike continued towards the witch's head, into the shadow obscuring her visage, and... Minerva, there, I knew it. Minerva's fist miraculously stopped mere inches from the witch's face, it wasn't because the witch's shadow reached out to tangle her arm. But instead, Minerva had intentionally stopped just before the strike would reach her. With her fists still extended, Minerva leaned back, swaying her golden hair. Minerva, look, see? She knew there was no need to dodge my punches, it's Satella, not the Witch of Envy. Echidona, you were worrying too much. Echidona, I wonder. While I honestly admire your spirit for using your own body to test it out, those aren't the same things. It could just be that it perceived your threat to be so negligible, that it naturally didn't react. So, Sekhmet. Sekhmet, you'll find any reason you can to get me to move. Who? And you're just as bad at knowing when to give up, Ikidona. Ha! Admit it, that's Satella, who? Sekhmet let out a sigh at the silenced Ikidona. Still existing as a ball of hair, the witch's final weapon showed no intention of moving. Then, standing within reach of the witch, Satella, Minerva turned back to Subaru, seeing himself reflected within her pale blue eyes, still unable to take in the fact that she was standing right beside that enormous threat, Subaru only stood there, dumbstruck. Seeing this, Minerva snorted, and pouted with a dissatisfied expression. Minerva, what are you standing there for? Come on, get over here. Subaru, get. Over. Well, even if you say that. Minerva, what, you're not a man at all. I'm all the way over here and proved that it's fine, didn't I? So you can just scuttle over already. Right? Or is all this table setting still not enough? If you won't cross the stone bridge even when someone's tapped it out for you, how are you ever gonna get across? Subaru, don't just get excited all of a sudden. It's not like I won't come over because I'm freaking out. I'm not going over there because I don't know why I should. Shouting back at Minerva in the same indignant tone, Subaru objected to being left in the dark. Pointing at Satella, who had apparently been deemed no immediate threat, Subaru looked around at the other witches, who were unraveling from their combat stances. Subaru, first of all, 
What do you mean the Witch of Envy is different from Sotella? You keep talking about it like it's obvious, but that's not the case from where I'm standing. Ikidona, it's not too complicated, when you forcibly inject witch genes into someone with no affinity for it, these afflictions are bound to arise. The witch personality emerging from the influence of the genes would then conflict with the original self. Or that's one way to explain it. But as far as I'm concerned, they are one and the same, so I don't see the point of differentiating the two like the others do. Subaru, a split. Personality? Then, what's? You mean the one who swallowed you guys and carved those atrocities into history was the alternate personality, even though the original personality didn't mean to? Ikidona, no, that's not it either. Just as Subaru tried to make sense of the information he had been given, Ikidona stopped him. She shook her head, and, as if to correct Subaru's theory. Ikidona, consuming half the world, and devouring us six witches of sin, were entirely Satella's doing, not the witch of envies. Subaru, W.H. No, but that doesn't make any sense. If the one who swallowed you was Satella, and that's Satella standing over there, then... Sekhmet, actually, it does make sense, ha. While we cannot forgive the witch of envy. Who? We hold no grudge against Satella, ha. That's all there is to it, who? Camilla, I I don't. Like, Satella Chan A. Eh? Either, but. At, least she's, better, than, the witch. I, guess. Sekhmet and Camilla's agreement only put more questions into Subaru's head. The witches seemed to have some sort of consensus, but Subaru couldn't understand it at all. They would forgive the personality that destroyed them, but not the alternate personality that didn't, what was that supposed to mean? Echidona, I've always been asserting that such distinction is pointless. But it's a futile effort. So I can't just ignore their feelings and eradicate that thing. My frail spirit body won't hold up for long if I do it, only to have them turn their banners against me. Even I can't come back from having my only soul scattered into the wind. Subaru, B, Ut. Isn't that extremely risky for the other five as well? You're the one keeping their souls intact. If you disappear, the other witches would. Ikidona, they have already come to terms with their own deaths. So they have no special attachment to prolonging their existence as souls. They would rather choose destruction than live on betraying their ideals. It's because they think this way that they are witches. Neither Sekhmet nor Camilla objected to Echidona's words. High-minded might be too flattering of a description, but Subaru had no words for the uncompromising way the witches chose to live. If only I could be like this, I wish I could be like this, anyone would have had such thoughts at one point or another. But to stay true to their ideals even after death isn't something anyone could do. Subaru, and Minerva is probably the same. Before anyone else, she was probably the first to be destroyed by the Witch of Envy. But she still trusted her enough to approach within arm's reach, and the result proved that that trust wasn't misplaced. Subaru didn't know what kind of relationship these girls had had. But if there was this bond of trust between them, what drove the Witch of Envy to destroy the other six? And how was it, that they could then forgive her? Echidona's thoughts on it were at least understandable. But, even so. Subaru, I can see this is how you guys are. It's a bit. Hard to take in, but I think I got it. But, I still haven't heard anyone explain to me why she's here. Dash dash. Subaru, she isn't going to attack no questions asked. I get that, but, that doesn't mean she's safe. If the one I've been dealing with was the Witch of Envy, then what does Satella want from me? The Witch of Envy has been a serious pain in the ass. So even if you suddenly tell me that this one's different, it's not like I'd just understand. Besides, according to the witches themselves, Satella was definitely the one who devoured them. So even if the one who swallowed the sanctuary was the Witch of Envy, it would seem that Satella was no less dangerous. So who could blame him for feeling threatened and wary, and wanting to stay away? Subaru, what does she want? Why is she here? As long as no one tells me. Minerva, if you want to find out, then you should come over here. 
Minerva stopped him just as he was raising his voice. Placing her hands on her hips, Minerva couldn't hide the annoyance on her adorable face as she stared at Subaru. Minerva, that's enough of your long-winded excuses and drawn-up defenses. I'm here standing right next to her, and nothing's happened. And also, she came here to see you. So if you're gonna keep acting like a loser and won't come closer, that can only mean we've misjudged you. Subaru, what was there to misjudge? Don't just go one-sidedly imagining things about me. And stop pushing that crap on me. What would you know about me, anyway? Being slapped with some arbitrary image of himself, it wasn't like he'd just start acting in accordance with it. But, once, when Subaru had shouted that exact same thing, there came a voice that answered him. He could still remember what it said. And that those words had become his strength. If he didn't want to betray that past self that was saved by those words, then... Subaru, arg, damn it. What was I thinking? Idiot. Being irrational, making decisions based solely on emotions. After so many painful experiences resulting from this, had he learned nothing at all? Instead, he should be paying attention to the details, stifling his emotions so he could act calmly, not out of impulse, but on facts alone, to uphold that never-wavering heart of steel. That was what he had always wanted himself to be. Minerva, you're taking too long. Subaru, what it's like to be up close to someone you've tangled to the death with. Crap, actually you do know, don't you? It's kinda hard. Minerva, it's not like we don't have any thoughts on it. Sekhmet and Camilla are just more mature, unlike me. But there's a reason I look after her. Watching Subaru clicking his tongue as he walked over, Minerva shrugged, giving him no time to ask her what that reason was, Minerva handed the scene over to Subaru. The Witch of Wrath naturally stepped aside as Subaru drew closer to the witch, until he was face to face with Satella. Subaru, dash dash. Unwittingly gulping in front of the thing before his eyes, Subaru was at a loss for words. Although he had already expected this while watching from afar, as well as while walking up to her, he still couldn't get used to the immense emanated pressure and the visual sense of incongruity. The shadowy dress clinging to her body carved out the curvatures of her figure, while the impenetrable veil above her neck gave rise to a perverse sense of glamour. But all that was instantly swept away by the dissonance of her unrecognizable head. Subaru, dash dash. Seeing her from up close, Subaru realized that it wasn't anything physical obstructing his recognition. What seemed to be a darkness shrouding over her head was not, in fact, what hid her face from view. What made the witch's face invisible, was something more primordial, something on the mental level. No physical obstacle was blocking her face from view. Instead, it was something instinctual, that was not allowing him to see it. Echidona, everyone wants to avert their eyes from their most repulsive delusions. Subaru. Echidona, if you can't see her face, then that's a problem with your own heart. The cautioning voice came from behind him, affirming Subaru's realization. Resisting the urge to fire back at her, Subaru ignored Echidona, or rather, he had no attention to spare as he continued to face against Satella. Meanwhile Satella had yet to take any kind of action. The only thing Satella had done so far was appear here, and it was those around her that had kicked up a fuss, frantically trying to prevent any potential damage from being brought about by her actions. It had been no exaggeration to say that the fear inspired by her presence was a testament to the danger her existence posed, and, just when Subaru was growing impatient with her lack of motion. Subaru, gh. Satella, dash dash. Seeing her hands suddenly reach out to him, Subaru's throat froze. Not distracted for a second or even a blink of an instant, Subaru kept his attention fixed on Satella. What would happen in the next moment? The tension of not knowing was like imperceptible hands toying with his mind. His shock wasn't because he had failed to see the hands move. Subaru clearly saw Satella's hands move towards him. What surprised him was his own consciousness, which had quietly watched their approach to the end. Subaru, what? Are you, really? What? Do you want with me? In fact, 
Subaru hadn't made any useful reaction to those hands reaching towards him. Though subconsciously understanding what her gesture meant, Subaru hastily uttered those words. As if he didn't need to acknowledge that fact, as though he didn't have to face it, he wrenched out the words. Subaru, if you're the one giving me the power to rewind, why are you? He didn't know why Satella was doing this, or why his body, facing Satella at a distance close enough to touch, despite him time and time and again screaming commands from the depths of his consciousness, was refusing to obey him. Was he supposed to feel so inexplicably relieved in front of her? Satella, dash H. Subaru, A. Eh? Still struggling with his disobedient body, Subaru belatedly reacted to the voice striking upon his eardrums. This time, it was no doubt the correct reaction to something so far outside his expectations. Holding his breath, Subaru waited for her to continue. In front of Satella, Staring at him with her still indiscernible expression, Subaru swallowed, as he went on waiting while time slowly passed on, until she spoke. Satella, dash I will. Subaru, dash dash. Satella, I will always. Always. Love only you.